Section Zero of the Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Introduction. In the beginning, a man depended for his subsistence entirely upon his own efforts or upon those of his immediate relations and friends. Life was very simple in those days, luxury being unknown, and necessity the factor which guided man's actions at every turn. With infinite labor he ground a flint, till it assumed the shape of a rough arrowhead, to be attached to a reed and shot into the heart of some wild beast, as soon as he had approached close enough to be certain of his quarry. The meat, thus obtained, he seasoned with such roots and herbs as nature provided, a poor and scanty choice. Presently he discovered that certain grains supported life much better than roots, and he became an agriculturalist. But the grain must be ground, so he invented a simple mill, a small stone worked by hand over a large one, and when this method proved too tedious, he so shaped the stone's surfaces that they touched at all points, and added handles by which the upper stone could be revolved. With the discovery of bronze, and many centuries later of iron, his workshop equipment rapidly improved. He became an expert boat and house builder, and multiplied weapons of offense and defense. Gradually, separate crafts arose. One man no longer depended on his individual efforts, but was content to barter his own work for the products of another man's labor, because it became evident that specialization promoted excellence of manufacture. A second great step in advance was the employment of machinery, which, when once fashioned by hand, saved an enormous amount of time and trouble. The pump, the blowing bellows, the spinning wheel, the loom. But all had to be operated by human effort, sometimes replaced by animal power. With the advent of the steam engine, all industry bounded forward again. First harnessed by what, giant steam has become a commercial and political power. Everywhere, in mill and factory, locomotive, ship, it has increased the products which lend ease and comfort to modern life. It is the great ally of invention and the ultimate agent for transporting men and material from one point on the earth's surface to another. Try as we may, we cannot escape from our environment of mechanism unless we are content to revert to the loincloth and spare of the savage. Society has become so complicated that the utmost efforts of an individual are, after all, confined to a very narrow groove. The days of the jack-of-all-trades are over. Success in life, even bare sustenance, depends on the concentration of one's faculties upon a very limited daily routine. Let the cobbler stick to his last is a maxim which carries an ever-increasing force. The better to realize how dependent we are on the mechanisms controlled by the thousand and one classes of workmen, let us consider the surroundings, possessions, and movements of the average well-to-do businessman. At seven o'clock he wakes, and instinctively feels beneath his pillow for his watch, a most marvelous assemblage of delicate parts shaped by wonderful machinery. Before stepping into his bath, he must turn a tap, itself a triumph of mechanical skill. The razor he shaves with, the mirror which helps him in the operation, the very brush and soap, all are machine-made. With his clothes he adds to the burden of his indebtedness to mechanism. The power loom spans the linen for his shirts, the clothes for his outer garments. Shirts and collars are glossy from the treatment of the steam laundry, where machinery is rampant. His boots, kept shapely by machine-made lasts, 
should remind him that mechanical devices have played a large part in their manufacture. Very possibly the human hand has scarcely had a single duty to perform. He goes downstairs and presses an electric button. Mechanism again. While waiting for his breakfast, his eye roves carelessly over the knives, spoons, forks, table, tablecloth, wallpaper, engravings, carpet, cruet stand, all machine-made in a larger or less degree. The very coals blazing in the grate were worn by machinery. The marble of the mantelpiece was shaped and polished by machinery. Also the fire irons, the chairs, the hissing kettle. Machinery stares at him from the loaf on its machine-made board. Machines prepared the land, sowed, harvested, threshed, ground, and probably otherwise prepared the grain for baking. Machines ground his salt, his coffee. Machinery aided the capture of the tempting soul, helped to cure the rasher of bacon, shaped the dishes, the plates, the coffee pot. Whirr! The motor car is at the door, throbbing with the impulses of its concealed machinery. Our friend, therefore, puts on his machine-made gloves and hat and sallies forth. That wonderful motor, the product of the most up-to-date scientific and mechanical appliances, bears him swiftly over roads paved with machine-crushed stone and flattened out by a steam roller. A book might be reserved to the motor alone, but we must refrain, for a few minutes' travel has brought the horseless carriage to the railway station. Mr. Smith, being the holder of a season ticket, does not trouble the clerk who is stamping pasteboards with a most ingenious contrivance for automatically impressing dates and numbers on them. He strolls out on the platform and buys the morning paper, which, a few hours before, was being battered about by one of the most wonderful machines that ever was devised by the brain of man. Mr. Smith doesn't bother his head with thoughts of the printing press. Its products are all round him, in timetables and advertisements. Nor does he ponder upon the giant machinery, which crushed steel ingots into the gleaming rails that stretch into the far distance nor upon the marvellous interlocking mechanism of the signal box at the platform end, nor upon the electric wires strumming overhead. No, he had seen all these things a thousand times before, and probably feels little of the romance which lies so thickly upon them. A whistle blows. The local is approaching, with its majestic locomotive, a very orgy of mechanism its automatic brakes, its southern parts all shaped by mechanical devices. Steam saws, planes, lathes, drills, hammers, presses. In obedience to a little lever, the huge mass comes quickly to rest. The steam pump on the engine commences to gasp. A minute later another lever moves, and Mr. Smith is fairly on his way to business. Arrived at the metropolis, he presses electricity into his service, either on an electric tram or on a subterranean train. In the latter case, he uses an electric lift, which lowers him into the bowels of the earth to pass him on the current-propelled cars driven by power generated in far-away stations. His office is stamped all over with the seal of mechanism. In the lobby are girls hammering on marvelous typewriters, on his desk rests a telephone, connected through wires, and most elaborately equipped exchanges with all parts of the country. To get at his private and valuable papers, Mr. Smith must have recourse to his bunch of keys, which, with their corresponding locks, represent ingenuity of a high degree. All day long he is in the grasp of mechanism, not even a lunchtime can he escape it, for the food set before him at the restaurant has been cooked by the aid of special kitchen machinery. And when the evening draws on, Mr. Smith touches a switch to turn his darkness into light, wrung through many wonderful processes from the stored illumination of coal. 
Were we to trace the daily round of the clerk, artisan, scientist, engineer, or manufacturer, we should be brought into contact with a thousand other mechanical appliances. Space forbids such a tour of inspection, but in the following pages we may row here and there, through the workshops of the world, gleaning what seems to be of special interest to the general public, and weaving round it, with a machine-made pen, some of the romance, which is apt to be lost sight of, by the most marvellous of all creations, man. End of section zero. Section one of The Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicalia. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter one Delicate Instruments. Watches and Chronometers. The Microtome. The Dividing Engine. Measuring Engines. Owing to the universal use of watches, resulting from their cheapness, the possessor of a pocket timepiece soon ceases to take pride in the delicate mechanism, which at first added an inch or two to his stature. At night it is wound up mechanically and thrust under the pillow, to be safe from imaginary burglars and handy when the morning comes. The awakened sleeper feels small gratitude to his faithful little servant, which all night long has been beating out the seconds, so that its master may know just where he is with regard to the enemy on the morrow. At last a hand is slipped under the feather bag, and the watch is dragged from its snug hiding place. "'Bother it,' says the sleepy owner. "'Half past eight. Ought to have been up an hour ago.' And out he tumbles." Dressing concluded, the watch passes to its day quarters in a darksome waistcoat pocket, to be holed out many times for its opinion to be taken. The real usefulness of a watch is best learnt by being without one for a day or two. There are plenty of clocks about, but not always in sight, and one gradually experiences a mild irritation at having to step around the corner to find out what the hands are doing. A truly wonderful piece of machinery is a watch, even a cheap one. An expensive, high-class article is worthy of our admiration and respect. Here is one that has been in constant use for fifty years. Twice a second its little balance wheel revolves on its jeweled bearings. Allowing a few days for repairs, we find by calculation that the watch has made no less than three thousand million movements in the half-century, and still it goes ticking on, ready to do another fifty years' work. How beautifully tempered must be the springs and the steel faces which are constantly rubbing against jewel or metal! How perfectly cut the teeth which have engaged one another times innumerable without showing appreciable wear. The chief value of a good watch lies in its accuracy as a timekeeper. It is, of course, easy to correct it by standard clocks in the railway stations or public buildings, but one may forget to do this, and in a week or two a loss of a few minutes may lead to one missing a train or being late for an important engagement. Happy, therefore, is the man who, having set his watch to London time, can rely on its not varying from accuracy a minute in the week, a feat achieved by many watches. The old-fashioned watch was a bulky affair, protected by an outer case of ample proportions. From year to year the size has gradually diminished until we can now purchase a reliable article no thicker than a five-shilling piece, which will not offend the most fastidious dandy by disarraying the fit of his clothes. Into the space of a small fraction of an inch is crowded all the usual mechanism, 
reduced to the utmost fineness. Watches have even been constructed small enough to form part of a ring or earring without losing their timekeeping properties. For practical purposes, however, it is advantageous to have a timepiece of as large a size as may be convenient, since the difficulties of adjustment and repair increase with decreasing proportions. The ship's chronometer, therefore, though of watch construction, is a big affair as compared with the pocket timepiece, for above all things it must be accurate. The need for this arises from the fact that nautical reckonings made by the observation of the heavenly bodies include an element of time. We will suppose a vessel to be at sea, out of sight of land. The captain, by referring to the dial of the mechanical log, towed astern, can reckon pretty accurately how far the vessel has traveled since it left port, but owing to winds and currents, he is not certain of the position on the globe's surface at which his ship has arrived. To locate this exactly, he must learn a. his longitude, i.e. distance east or west of Greenwich, b. his latitude, i.e. distance north or south of the equator. Therefore, when noon approaches, his chronometers and sextant are got out, and at the moment when the sun crosses the meridian, the time is taken. If this moment happens to coincide with four o'clock on the chronometers, he is as far west of Greenwich as is represented by four twenty-fourths of the 360 degree into which the Earth's circumference is divided. That is, he is in longitude 60 degrees west. If this moment happens to coincide with four o'clock on the chronometers, he is as far west of Greenwich as is represented by four twenty-fourths of the 360 degrees into which the Earth's circumference is divided. That is, he is in longitude 60 degrees west. The sextant gives him the angle made by a line drawn to the sun with another drawn to the horizon, and from that he calculates his latitude. Then he adjourns to the chart room, where, by finding the point at which the lines of longitude and latitude intersect, he establishes his exact position also. When the ship leaves England, the chronometer is set by Greenwich time and is never touched afterwards except to be wound once a day. In order that any error may be reduced to a minimum, a merchant ship carries at least two chronometers a man of war at least three, and a surveying vessel as many as a dozen. The average reading of the chronometers is taken to work by. Taking the case of a single chronometer, it has often to be relied on for months at a time, and during that period has probably to encounter many changes of temperature. If it gains or loses from day to day, and that consistently, it may still be accounted reliable as the amount of error will be allowed for in all calculations. But should it gain one day and lose another, the accumulated errors would, on a voyage of several months, become so considerable as to imperil seriously the safety of the vessel if navigating dangerous waters. As long ago as 1714, the English government recognized the importance of a really reliable chronometer, and in that year passed an act offering rewards of £10,000, £15,000, and £20,000 to anyone who should produce a chronometer that would fix longitude within 60, 40, and 30 miles respectively of accuracy. John Harrison, the son of a Yorkshire carpenter, who had already invented the ingenious gridiron pendulum for compensating clocks, took up the challenge. By 1761, he had made a chronometer of so perfect a nature that during a voyage to Jamaica that year and back the next, it lost only one minute, 54 and one half second. As this would enable a captain to find his longitude within 18 miles in the latitude of Greenwich, Harrison claimed and ultimately received the maximum reward. It was not till nearly a century later that Thomas Earnshaw produced the compensation balance, now generally used on chronometers and high-class watches. 
In cheap watches, the balance is usually a three-spoked wheel, which at every tick revolves part of a turn and then flies back again. This will not suffice for very accurate work because the moment of inertia varies at different temperatures. To explain this term, let us suppose that a man has a pound of metal to make into a wheel. If the wheel be of small diameter, you would be able to turn it first one way and then the other on its axle quite easily. But should it be melted down and remade into a wheel of four times the diameter with the same amount of metal as before in the rim, the difficulty of suddenly reversing its motion will be much increased. The weight is the same, but the speed of the rim, and consequently its momentum, is greater. It is evident from this that, if a wheel of certain size be driven by a spring of constant strength, its oscillations will be equal in time. But if a rise of temperature should lengthen the spokes, the speed would fall, because the spring would have more work to do. And conversely, with the fall of temperature, the speed would rise. Earnshaw's problem was to construct a balance wheel that should be able to keep its moment of inertia constant under all circumstances. He therefore used only two spokes to his wheel, and to the outer extremity of each attached an almost complete semicircle of rim, one end being attached to the spoke, the other all but meeting the other spoke. The rim pieces were built up of an outer strip of brass and an inner strip of steel welded together. Brass expands more rapidly than steel, with the result that a bar compounded of these two metals would, when heated, bend towards the hollow side. To the rim pieces were attached sliding weights, adjustable to the position found by experiment to give best results. We can now follow the action of the balance wheel. It runs perfectly correctly at, say, a temperature of 60 degrees. Hold it over a candle. The spokes lengthen and carry the rim pieces outwards at their fixed ends. But as the pieces themselves bend inwards at their free ends, the balance is restored. If the balance were placed in a refrigerating machine, the spokes would shorten, but the rim pieces would bend outwards. As a matter of fact, the moment of inertia cannot be kept quite constant by this method because the variation of expansion is more rapid in cold than in heat, so that although a balance might be quite reliable between 60 degrees and 100 degrees, it would fail between 30 degrees and 60 degrees. So the makers fit their balances with what is called a secondary compensation, the effect of which is to act more quickly in high than in low temperatures. This could not well be explained without diagrams, so a mere mention must suffice. Another detail of chronometer making, which requires very careful treatment, is the method of transmitting power from the main spring to the works. As the spring uncoils, its power must decrease, and this loss must be counterbalanced somehow. This is managed by using the drum and fusee action, which may be seen in some clocks and in many old watches. The drum is cylindrical and contains the spring. The fusee is a tapering shaft in which the spiral groove has been cut from end to end. A very fine chain connects the two parts. The key is applied to the fusee, and the chain is wound off the drum onto the larger end of the fusee first. By the time that the spring has been fully wound, the chain has reached the fusee's smaller extremity. If the fusee has been turned to the correct taper, the driving power of the spring will remain constant as it unwinds, for it gets least leverage over the fusee when it is strongest, and most when it is weakest, the intermediate stages being properly proportioned. To test this, a weighted lever is attached to the key spindle, with the weight so adjusted that the fully wound spring has just sufficient power to lift it over the topmost point of a revolution. It is then allowed a second turn, 
But if the weight now proves excessive, something must be wrong, and the fusee needs its diameter reducing at that point. So the test goes on from turn to turn, and alterations are made until every revolution is managed with exactly the same ease. The complete chronometer is sent to Greenwich Observatory to be tested against the standard clock, which, at 10 a.m., flashes the hour to other clocks all over Great Britain. In a special room set apart for the purpose are hundreds of instruments, some hanging up, others lying flat. Assistants make their rounds, noting the errors on each. The temperature test is then applied in special ovens, and finally the article goes back to the maker with a certificate, setting forth its performances under different conditions. If the error has been consistent, the instrument is sold, the buyer being informed exactly what to allow for each day's error. At the end of the voyage, he brings his chronometer to be tested again, and, if necessary, put right. Here are the actual variations of a chronometer during a 19-day test, before being used. An average gain of just over one quarter of a second per dm. Quite extraordinary feats of timekeeping have been recorded of chronometers on long voyages. Thus, a chronometer which had been to Australia, via the Cape, and back via the Red Sea, was only 15 seconds out. And the Encyclopedia Britannica quotes the performance of the three instruments of S.S. Orellana, which between them accumulated an error of but two to three seconds during a 63-day trip. An instrument which will cut a blood corpuscle into several parts, that's the microtome, the small cutter, as the name implies. For the examination of animal tissues, it is necessary that they should be sliced very fine before they are subjected to the microscope. Perhaps a tiny muscle is being investigated and cross-sections of it are needed. Well, one cannot pick up the muscle and cut slices off of it as you would off a German sausage. To begin with, it is difficult even to pick the object up. And even if pieces one hundredth of an inch long were detached, they would still be far too large for examination. So, as is usually the case when our unaided powers prove unequal to a task, we have recourse to a machine. There are several types of microtomes, each preferable for certain purposes. But as in ordinary laboratory work, the Cambridge rocking microtome is used, let us give our special attention to this particular instrument. It is mounted on a strong cast iron bed, a foot or so in length and four to five inches wide. Toward one end rise a couple of supports terminating in knife edges, which carry a crossbar, itself provided with knife edges top and bottom, those on the top supporting a second transverse bar. Both bars have a long leg at right angles, giving them the appearance of two large T's superimposed one on the other. But the top T is converted into a cross by a fourth member, a sliding tube which projects forward towards a frame in which is clamped a razor edge upwards. The tail of the lower T terminates in a circular disc pierced with a hole to accommodate the end of a vertical screw, which has a large circular head with milled edges. The upper T is rocked up and down by a cord and spring, the handle actuating the cord also shifting on the milled screw head a very small distance every time it is rocked backwards and forwards. As the screw turns, it gradually raises the tail of the lower member, and by giving its crossbar a tilt, brings the tube of the upper member appreciably nearer the razor. The amount of twist given to the screw at each stroke can be easily regulated by a small catch. When the microscopist wishes to cut sections, he first mounts his object in a lump of hard paraffin wax, coated with softer wax. The hole is stuck onto the face of the tube, so as to be just clear of the razor. The operator then seizes the handle and works it rapidly until the first slice is detached by the razor. Successive slices are stuck together by their soft edges so as to form a continuous ribbon of wax, 
which can be picked up easily and laid on a glass slide. The slide is then warmed to melt the paraffin, which is dissolved away by alcohol, leaving the atoms of tissue untouched. These, after being stained with some suitable medium, are ready for the microscope. The skillful user can, under favorable conditions, cut slices one twenty-five thousandth of an inch thick. To gather some idea of what this means, we will imagine that a cucumber one foot long and one and a half inches in diameter is passed through this wonderful guillotine. It would require no less than seven hundred dinner plates nine inches across to spread the pieces on. If the slices were one-eighth of an inch thick, the cucumber, to keep a proportionate total size, would be 260 feet long. After considering these figures, we shall lose some of the respect we hitherto felt for the man who cut the ham to put inside luncheon bar sandwiches. In the preceding pages, frequent reference has been made to index screws, exactly graduated to a convenient number of divisions. When such screws have to be manufactured in quantities, it would be far too expensive a matter to measure each one separately. Therefore, machinery, itself very carefully graduated, is used to enable a workman to transfer measurements to a disk of metal. If the index circle of an astronomical telescope, to take an instance, has to be divided, it is centered on a large horizontal disk the circumference of which has been indented with a large number of teeth. A worm screw engages these teeth tangentially, i.e. at right angles to a line drawn from the center of the plate to the point of engagement. On the shaft of the screw is a ratchet pinion, in principle the same as the bicycle freewheel, which, when turned one way, also twists the screw, but has no effect on it when turned the other way. Stops are put on the screw so that it shall rotate the large disc only the distance required between any two graduations. The divisions are scribed on the index circle by a knife attached to a carriage over and parallel to the disc. The dividing engine used for the graduation of certain astronomical instruments probably constitutes the most perfect machine ever made. In an address to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, the president, Mr. William Henry Ma, used the following words. The most recently constructed machine of the kind of which I am aware, namely one by Messrs. Warner and Swasey of Cleveland, USA, is capable of automatically cutting the graduations of a circle with an error in position not exceeding one second of arc. A second of arc is approximately the angle subtended by a halfpenny at a distance of three miles. This means that on a 20-inch circle, the error in position of any one graduation shall not exceed one two-thousandth of an inch. Now, the finest line which would be of any service for reading purposes on such a circle would probably have a width equal to quite ten seconds of arc, and it follows that the minute V-shaped cut forming this line must be so absolutely symmetrical with its center line throughout its length that the position of this center may be determined within the limit of error just stated by observations of its edges, made by aid of the reading micrometer and microscope. I must say that after the machine just mentioned had been made, it took over a year's hard work to reduce the maximum error in its graduations from one and a half to one second of arc. The same address contains a reference to the great Yerkes Telescope, which, though irrelevant to our present chapter, affords so interesting an example of modern mechanical perfection that it deserves parenthetic mention. The diameter of a star of the seventh magnitude, as it appears in the focus of this huge telescope, is one two thousand five hundredths of an inch. The spider's webs stretched across the object glass are about one six thousandth of an inch in diameter. The problem thus is, says Mr. Ma, to move this 22-ton mass, the telescope, with such steadiness in opposition to the motion of the Earth that a star disk one two thousand five hundredths of an inch in diameter can be kept threaded, as it were, upon a spider's web, 
one six thousandth of an inch in diameter, carried at a radius of 32 feet from the center of motion. I think that you will agree that this is a problem in mechanical engineering demanding no slight skill to solve, but it has been solved and with the most satisfactory results. The motions are controlled electrically, and respecting them, Professor Bernard, one of the chief observers with this telescope, some time ago wrote as follows. It is astonishing to see with what perfect instantaneousness the clock takes up the tube. The electric slow motions are controlled from the eye end. So exact are they that a star can be brought from the edge of the field and stopped instantaneously behind the micrometer wire. And stopped instantaneously behind the micrometer wire. Dividing engines are used for ruling parallel lines on glass and metal to aid in the measurements of microscopical objects or the wavelengths of light. A diffraction grating, used for measuring the latter, has the lines so close together that they would be visible only under a powerful microscope. Glass being too brittle, a special alloy of so-called speculum metal is fashioned into a highly polished plate, and this is placed in the machine. A delicate screw arrangement gradually feeds the plate forward under the diamond point, which is automatically drawn across the plate between every two movements. Professor H. A. Rowlands has constructed a parallel dividing engine which has ruled as many as 120,000 lines to the inch. To get a conception of these figures, we must once again resort to comparison. Let us therefore take a furrow as a line and imagine a plowman going up and down a field 120,000 times. If each furrow be eight inches wide, the field would require a breadth of nearly 14 miles to accumulate all the furrows. Again, supposing that a plate six inches square were being ruled, the lines placed end to end would extend for 70 miles. Professor Rowland's machine does the finest work of this kind. Another very perfect instrument has been built by Lord Blythswood, and as some particulars of it have been kindly supplied, they may fitly be appended. If a first-class draftsman were asked how many parallel straight lines he would rule within the space of one inch, it is doubtful whether he would undertake more than 150 to 200 lines. Lord Blythswood's machine can rule 14 parallel lines on a space equivalent to the edge of the finest tissue paper. So delicate are the movements of the machine that it must be protected from variations of temperature, which would contract or expand its parts. So the room in which it stands is kept at an even heat by automatic apparatus. And to make things doubly sure, the engine is further sheltered in a large case, having double walls interpacked with cotton wool. In constructing the machine, it was found impossible, with the most scientific tools, to cut a toothed wheel sufficiently accurate to drive the mechanism. But the errors discovered by microscopes were made good by the invention of a small electroplating brush, which added the thinnest imaginable layer of metal to any tooth found deficient. During the process of ruling a grating of only a few square inches area, the machine must be left severely alone in its closed case. The slightest jar would cause unparallelism of a few lines and the ruin of the whole grating. So for several days, the diamond point has its own way, moving backwards and forwards unceasingly over the hard metal, in which it chases tiny grooves. At the end, the plate has the appearance of mother of pearl, which is, in fact, one of nature's diffraction gratings, breaking up white light into the colors of the spectrum. You will be able to understand that these mechanical gratings are expensive articles. Sometimes the diamond point breaks halfway through the ruling, and a week's work is spoilt. Also, the creation of a reliable machine is a very tedious business. Ten pounds per square inch of grating is a low price to pay. The greatest difficulty met with in the manufacture of the dividing engine is that of obtaining a mathematically correct screw. Turning on a lathe produces a very rough spiral, judged scientifically. Some threads will be deeper than others and differently spaced. The screw must, therefore, be ground with emery, 
and oil introduced between it and a long nut which is made in four segments and provided with collars for tightening it up against the screw. Perhaps a fortnight may be expended over the grinding. Then the screw must undergo rigid tests. A nut must be made for it, and it has to be mounted in proper bearings. The explanation of the method of eliminating errors being very technical, it is omitted, but an idea of the care required may be gleaned from Professor Rowlands's statement that an uncorrected error of one three hundred thousandth of an inch is quite sufficient to ruin a grating. In the Houses of Parliament, there is kept, at an even temperature, a bronze rod, thirty-eight inches long and an inch square in section. Near the ends are two wells, rather more than half an inch deep, and at the bottom of the wells are gold studs, each engraved with a delicate cross on their polished surfaces. The distance between the lines is the imperial yard of 36 inches. The bar was made in 1844 to replace the standard destroyed in 1834 when both houses of parliament were burned. The original standard was the work of Byrd, who produced it in 1760. In June 1824, an act had been passed legalizing this standard. It says, the same straight line or distance between the centers of the said two points in the said gold studs in the said brass rod, the brass being at the temperature of 62 degrees by Fahrenheit's thermometer, shall be and is hereby denominated the Imperial Standard Yard. To provide for accidents to the bar, the act continues, and whereas it is expedient that the said standard yard, if lost, destroyed, defaced, or otherwise injured, should be restored to the same length by reference to some invariable natural standard. And whereas it has been ascertained by the commissioners appointed by His Majesty to inquire into the subject of weights and measures, that the yard hereby declared to be the imperial standard yard, when compared with a pendulum vibrating seconds of mean time in the latitude of London in a vacuum at the level of the sea, is in the proportion of 36 inches to 39 inches and 1,393 ten thousandth parts of an inch. The new bar was made, however, not by this method, but by comparing several copies of the original and striking their average length. Four accurate duplicates of the new standard were secured, one of which is kept in the Mint, one in the charge of the Royal Society, one at Westminster Palace, and the fourth at the Royal Observatory, Greenwich. In addition, 40 copies were distributed among the various foreign governments, all of the same metal as the original. The French meter has also been standardized, being equal to one ten millionth part of a quadrant of the Earth's meridian, i.e. of the distance from the equator to either of the poles, that is, to 39.370788 inches. Professor A. A. Michelson has shown that any standard of length may be restored by reference to the measurement of wavelengths of light, with an error not exceeding one ten millionth part of the whole. It might be asked, why should standards of such great accuracy be required? In rough work, such as carpentry, it does not, indeed, matter if measurements are the hundredth of an inch or so out. But when we have to deal with scientific instruments, telescopes, measuring machines, engines for dividing distances on a scale, or even with metal turning, the utmost accuracy becomes needful. And a number of instruments will be much more alike in all dimensions if compared individually with a common standard than if they were only compared with one another. Supposing, for instance, a bar of exact diameter is copied, the copy itself copied, and so on a dozen times, the last will probably vary considerably from the correct measurements. Hence, it became necessary to standardize the foot and the inch by accurate subdivisions of the yard. This was accomplished by Sir Joseph Whitworth, who in 1834 obtained two standard yards in the form of measure bars, and by the aid of microscopes transferred the distance between the engraved lines to a rectangular end measure bar, 
i.e., one of which the end faces are exactly a yard apart. He next constructed his famous machine, which is capable of detecting length differences of one millionth of an inch. Two bars are advanced toward each other by screw gearing, one by a screw having 20 threads to the inch and carrying a graduated hand wheel with 250 divisions on its rim, the other by a similar screw, itself driven by a worm screw, working on the rim, which carries 200 teeth. The worm screw has a hand wheel with a micrometer graduation into 250 divisions on its circumference, so that if this be turned one division, the second screw is turned only one over 250 times one over 200 of a division, and the bar it drives advances only one over 20 times one over 200 times one over 250 equals one over one millionths of an inch. The screw at the other end of the machine, which in appearance somewhat resembles a metal lathe, is used for rapid adjustment only. He, Sir J. Whitworth, obtained the division of the yard by making three foot pieces as nearly alike as was possible and working these foot pieces down until each was equal to the others and placing them end to end in this millionth measuring machine. The total length of the three foot pieces was then compared with a standard end measure yard. These three foot pieces were ground until they were exactly equal to each other and the three added together are equal to the standard yard. The subdivision of the foot into the inch pieces was made in the same way. G. M. Bond, in a lecture delivered before the Franklin Institute, February 29, 1884. A doubt may have arisen in the reader's mind as to the possibility of determining whether the measuring machine is screwed up to the exact tightness. Would the measuring bars not compress a body a little before it appeared tight? Workmen, when measuring a bar with calipers, often judge by the sense of touch whether the jaws of the calipers pass the bar with the proper amount of resistance. But when one has to deal with millionths of an inch, such a method would not suffice. So, Sir Joseph Whitworth introduced a feeling piece, or gravity piece. Mr. T. M. Goodeve thus describes it in The Elements of Mechanism. The gravity piece consists of a small plate of steel with parallel plane sides, and having slender arms, one for its partial support and the other for resting on the finger of the observer. One arm of the piece rests on a part of the bed of the machine, and the other arm is tilted up by the forefinger of the operator. The plane surfaces are then brought together, one on each side of the feeling piece, until the pressure of contact is sufficient to hold it supported just as it remained when one end rested on the finger. This degree of tightness is perfectly definite and depends on the weight of the gravity piece, but not on the estimation of the observer. In this way, the expansion due to heat when a 36-inch bar has been touched for an instant with the fingernail may be detected. One of the most beautiful measuring machines commercially used comes from the factories of the Pratt Whitney Company. Hartford, Connecticut, the well-known makers of machine tools and gauges of all kinds. It is made in different sizes, the largest admitting an 80-inch bar. Variations of one one-hundredths of an inch are readily determined by the use of this machine. It therefore serves for originating gauge sizes or for duplicating existing standards. The adjusting screw has 50 threads to the inch and its index wheel is graduated to 400 divisions, giving an advance of 1 20 thousandths of an inch for each division. While by estimation this may be further subdivided to indicate one half or even one quarter of this small amount. Delicacy of contact between the measuring faces is obtained by the use of auxiliary jaws holding a small cylindrical gauge by the pressure of a light helical spring which operates the sliding spindle to which one of these auxiliary jaws is attached. On one side of the head of the machine is a vertical microscope directed downwards to a bar on the bed plate, in which are a number of polished steel plugs graved with very fine central cross lines, 
each exactly an inch distant from either of its neighbors. A cross wire in the microscope tells when it is accurately abreast of the line below it. Supposing, then, that a standard bar, three inches in diameter, has to be tested. The head is slid along until the microscope is exactly over the zero plug line, and the dividing index wheel is turned until the two jaws press each other with the minimum force that will hold up the feeling piece. Then the head is moved back and centered on the three inch line, and the bar to be tested is passed between the jaws. If the feeling piece drops out, it is too large and the wheel is turned back until the jaws have been opened enough to let the bar through without making the feeling piece fall. An examination of the index wheel shows in hundred thousandths of an inch what the excess diameter is. On the other hand, if the bar were too small, the jaws would need to be closed a trifle, this amount being similarly reckoned. We have now got into a region of very practical politics, namely the subject of gauges. All large engineering works which turn out machinery with interchangeable parts, for example, screws and nuts, must keep their dimensions very constant if purchasers are not to be disgusted and disappointed. The small motor machinery so much in evidence today demands that errors should be kept within the ten thousandth of an inch. An engineer, therefore, possesses a set of standard gauges to test the diameter and pitch of his screw threads and nuts, the size of tubes, wires, the circumference of wheels, etc. Great inconvenience having been experienced by American railroad car builders on account of the varying sizes of the screws and bolts which were used on the different tracks, though all were supposed to be of standard dimensions, the masters determined to put things right. And accordingly, Professors Roger and Bond and the Pratt Whitney Company were engaged to work in collaboration in connection with the manufacture of tools for minute measurements, viz. to one five hundredths of an inch. To give an idea of what is implied by this, let it be supposed that a person should take a pair of dividing compasses and lay off fifty thousand prick marks, one eighth of an inch apart, in a straight line. To do this, the line would require to be over 520 feet, or nearly a tenth of a mile long. Imagine that many prick marks compressed into the space of an inch, and you have an imperfect idea of the minuteness of the measurements which can now be made by the Pratt and Whitney Company. The standard taps and dies were supplied to toolmakers and engineers, who could thus determine whether articles supplied to them were of proper dimensions. Nothing more was then heard of nuts being a trifle small or bolts a little large. And so beautifully tempered were the dies made from the standards that one manufacturer claimed to have cut 18,800 cold-pressed nuts without any difference being perceptible in their sizes. To appreciate what the difference of a thousandth of an inch makes in a true fit, you should handle a set of plug and ring gauges, the ring a true half-inch internally, the plugs half-inch, half an inch less one ten-thousandth of an inch, and half an inch less one-thousandth in diameter. The true half-inch plug needs to be forcibly driven into the ring on account of the friction between the surfaces. The next, if oiled, will slide in quite easily, but if left stationary a moment will seize and have to be driven out. The third will wobble very perceptibly and would be at once discarded by a good workman as a bad fit. For extremely accurate measurements of rods, caliper gauges, shaped somewhat like the letter Y, are used, the horns terminating in polished parallel jaws. Such a gauge will detect the difference of one twenty thousandths of an inch quite easily. So accurately can plug gauges be made by reference to a measuring machine that a gold leaf, one thirty thousandths of an inch thick, would be three times too thick to insert between the gauge and the jaws of the machine. You must remember that in high-class workmanship, these gauges are constantly being used. As time goes on, the limit of error allowed in many cases of machine parts is gradually lessened, 
which shows the simultaneous improvement of all machinery used in the handling of metal. James Watt was terribly hampered when developing his steam engine by the difficulty of procuring a true cylinder for his pistons to work in with any approach to steam tightness. His first cylinder was made by a smith of hammered iron soldered together. The next was cast and bored, but stuffing it with paper, cork, putty, pasteboard, and old hat proved useless to stem the leakage of steam. No wonder, considering that the finished cylinder was one-eighth of an inch larger in diameter at one end than at the other. Watt was in advance of his time. Neither machinery nor workmanship had progressed sufficiently to meet the requirements of the steam engine. Today, an engineer would confidently undertake to bore a cylinder five feet in diameter with a variation from truth of not more than one five hundredth of an inch. Before passing from the subject of measuring machines, which play so important a part in modern mechanism, we may just glance at the electrical method of Dr. P. E. Shaw. He discovered recently that two clean metal surfaces can, by means of an electric current, feel one another on touching with a delicacy that far transcends that of the purely mechanical machine. The mechanism he employs is thus devised. A finely cut vertical screw, having 50 threads to the inch, has a disc graduated into 500 parts. The screw can be turned by means of a pulley string from a distance, and it is thus possible to give the top end of the screw a movement of 1 25 thousandths of an inch when a movement corresponding to one graduation is made. This small movement is reduced by a train of six levers, the long arm of each bearing on the short arm of the one before it. The movement of the last lever of the train is thus reduced to one four thousandths of that of the screw point. So a movement of one over four thousand times one over twenty-five thousand equals one over one hundred millionths of an inch is obtained. How can such a movement be judged? A telephone and voltaic cell are joined to the last lever of the train and to the object whose movement is under examination. If they touch, the telephone sounds. An observer listens in the telephone. And if the object moves for any reason, he can find out how much it moves by turning the screw until contact is made again. Out of the many applications of this apparatus, three may be given. 1. A short bar of iron, when magnetized, elongates about one one millionth of its length. If further magnetized, it contracts. These changes can readily be measured with the instrument. 2. The smallest sound audible in the telephone is due to a movement of the diaphragm of the telephone by about one fifty millionths of an inch. This has been actually measured by Dr. Shaw and is by far the smallest distance ever directly recorded. It is about twice the diameter of the molecules of matter. 3. Dispensing with levers, the screw alone is used for rougher work. Dr. Shaw has shown that one hundred thousandth of an inch is the smallest dimension visible under a microscope. By fitting an electric measuring apparatus to the microscope carriage, it becomes quite easy to measure minute distances. The microscope contains a cross wire which, when the object has been laid on the microscope stage, is centered on one side of the object. The electric contact screw is then advanced till it makes contact with the stage and a sound arises in the telephone. A reading of the screw disc having been taken, the screw is drawn in and the microscope stage is traversed sufficiently to bring the wire in line with the other side of the object. Once more, the operator makes electrical contact and gets a second reading, the difference between the two being the diameter of the object. In this manner, the bacillus of tuberculosis has been proved to have an average diameter of 31 over 250 thousandths of an inch. The same method is employed to gauge the distance between the lines on a diffraction grating. End of section one. Section two of the Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Mechanism 
by Archibald Williams. Chapter 2. Calculating Machines. The simplest form of calculating machine was the abacus, on which the schoolboys of ancient Greece did their sums. It consisted of a smooth board with a narrow rim, on which were arranged rows of pebbles, bits of bone or ivory, or silver coins. By replacing these little counters by sand, strewn evenly all over its surface, the abacus was transformed into a slate for writing or geometrical lessons. The Romans took the abacus, along with many other spoils of conquest from the Greeks, and improved it, dividing it by means of cross lines, and assigning a multiple value to each line with regard to its neighbours. From their method of using the calculi, or pebbles, we derive our English verb, to calculate. During the Middle Ages, the abacus still flourished, and it has left a further mark on our language by giving its name to the Court of Exchequer, in which was a table divided into chequered squares like this simple school appliance. Step by step, further improvements were made, most important among them being those of Napier of Murchiston, whose logarithms vex the heads of our youth and save many an hour's calculation to people who understand how to handle them. Sir Samuel Morland, Gunter and Lamb invented other contrivances suitable for trigonometrical problems. Gersten and Pascal harnessed trains of wheels to their ready reckoners, somewhat similar to the well-known cyclometer. All these devices faded into insignificance when Mr. Charles Babbage came on the scene with his famous calculator, which is probably the most ingenious piece of mechanism ever devised by the human brain. To describe the difference engine, as it is called, would be impossible, so complicated is its character. Dr. Lardner, who had a wonderful command of language and could explain details in a manner so lucid that his words could almost always be understood in the absence of diagrams, occupied 25 pages of the Edinburgh Review in the endeavour to describe its working, but gave several features up as a bad job. Another clever writer, Dr. Samuel Smiles, frankly shuns the task and satisfies himself with the following brief description. Some parts of the apparatus and modes of action are indeed extraordinary, and perhaps none more so than that for ensuring accuracy in the calculated results. The machine actually correcting itself and rubbing itself back into accuracy by the friction of the adjacent machinery. When an error is made, the wheels become locked and refuse to proceed. Thus, the machine must go rightly or not at all, an arrangement as nearly resembling volition as anything that brass and steel are likely to accomplish. Mr. Babbage, in 1822, entered upon the task of superintending the construction of a machine for calculating and printing mathematical and astronomical tables. He began by building a model, which produced 44 figures per minute. The next year, the Royal Society reported upon the invention, which appeared so promising that the Lords of the Treasury voted Mr. Babbage £1,500 to help him perfect his apparatus. He looked about for a first-rate mechanician of high intelligence as well as of extreme manual skill. The man he wanted appeared in Mr. Joseph Clement, who had already made his name as the inventor of a drawing instrument, a self-acting lathe 
a self-centering chuck, and fluted taps and dies. Mr. Clement soon produced special tools for shaping the various parts of the machine. So elaborate was the latter that, according to Dr. Smiles, the drawings for the calculating machinery alone, not to mention the printing machinery, which was almost equally elaborate, covered not less than 400 square feet of surface. You will easily imagine, especially if you have ever had a special piece of apparatus made for you by a mechanic, that the bills mounted up at an alarming rate, so fast, indeed, that the government began to ask why this great expense and so little visible result. After seven years' work, the engineer's account had reached £7,200, and Mr. Babbage had disbursed an additional £7,000 out of his own pocket. Mr. Clement quarrelled with his employer, possibly because he harboured suspicions that they were both off on a wild goose chase, and withdrew, taking all his valuable tools with him. The government soon followed his example, and poor Babbage was left with his half-finished invention, a beautiful fragment of a great work. It had been designed to calculate as far as twenty figures, but was completed only sufficiently to go to five figures. In 1862, it occupied a prominent place among the mechanical exhibits at the Great Exhibition. We learn with some satisfaction that all this effort was not fated to be fruitless. Two scientists of Stockholm, Schuitz by name, were so impressed by Dr. Lardner's account of this calculating machine that they carried Babbage's scheme through and after twenty years of hard work completed a machine which seemed to be almost capable of thinking. The English government spent £1,200 on a copy, which at Somerset House entered upon the routine duty of working out annuity and other tables for the Registrar-General. From Babbage's wonderfully and fearfully made machine, we pass to a calculator which today may be seen at work in hundreds of thousands of shops and offices. It is the most modern substitute for the open till, and, by the aid of marvellous interior works, acts as an account keeper and general detective to the money transactions of the establishment in which it is employed. There are very many types of cash register, and as it would be impossible to enumerate them all, we will pass at once to the most perfect type of all, known to the makers and vendors as number 95. The register has at the top an oblong window. Dotted about the surface confronting the operator are, in the particular machine under notice, 57 keys, six bearing the letters A, B, D, E, H, K, three the words paid out, charge, received on account, and the others money values ranging from nine pounds to a farthing, which is a quarter of a penny. These are arranged in vertical rows. At the left end of the instrument is a printing apparatus, kept locked by the proprietor. At the right end, a handle and small lever. Below the register are six drawers, each labelled with an initial. A customer enters the shop and buys goods to the value of six shillings and elevenpence. An assistant, to whom belongs the letter H, receives a sovereign in payment. He goes to the register, and after making sure that his drawer is pushed in till it is locked, first presses down the key H, 
and then the keys labelled six shillings and eleven pence suddenly like two jacks in the box up flied into the window two tablets with six shillings and eleven pence on both their faces so that the customer and assistant can see the figures simultaneously a bell of a certain tone rings draw h flies open so that he may place the money in it and give change if necessary and a rotating arm in the window shows the word cash the assistant now revolves the handle and presses the little lever from a slot on the left side out flies a ticket on the front of which is printed the date a consecutive number the assistant's letter and the amount of the sale the back has also been covered with an advertisement of some kind the ticket and change are handed over to the customer the drawer is shut and the transaction is at an end except for an entry in the shop's books of the article sold a carrier next comes in with a parcel on which fivepence must be paid for transport mr a receives the goods goes to the register presses his letter the key with the words paid out on it and the key carrying fivepence takes out the amount wanted and gives it to the carrier again a gentleman enters and asks for change for half a sovereign mr b obliges him pressing down his letter but no figures fourthly a debtor to the shop pays five shillings to meet an account that has been against him for some time mr k receives the money and plays with the keys k received on account and five shillings giving a ticket receipt lastly a customer buys a pair of boots on credit mr d attends to him and though no cash is handled uses the register pressing the letter charge and say sixteen shillings and sixpence now what has been going on inside the machine all this time let us lift up the cover take off the case of the printing apparatus and see a strip of paper fed through the printing mechanism has on it five rows of figures letters etc thus a space the letter h six shillings and eleven pence paid the letter a no shillings and five pence a space the letter b no shillings and no pence received the letter k five shillings and no pence charge the letter d sixteen shillings and sixpence the proprietor is therefore enabled to see at a glance one who served or attended to a customer two what kind of business he did with him three the monetary value of the transaction at the end of the day each assistant sends in his separate account which should tally exactly with the record of the machine simultaneously with the strip printing special counting apparatus has been a adding up the total of all money taken for goods and b recording the number of times the drawer has been opened for each purpose here again is a check upon the records this ingenious machine not only protects the proprietor against carelessness or dishonesty on the part of his employees but also protects the latter against one another if only one drawer and letter were used in common it would be impossible to trace an error to the guilty party the lettering system also serves to show which assistant does the most business where a cash register of this type is employed every transaction must pass through its hands or rather mechanism 
it would be risky for an assistant not to use the machine as eyes may be watching him he cannot open his drawers without making a record nor can he make a record without first closing the drawers so that he must give a reason for each use of the register if he used somebody else's letter the ear of the rightful owner would at once be attracted by the note of his particular gong when going away for lunch or on business a letter can be locked by means of a special key which fits none of the other five locks the printing mechanism is particularly ingenious every morning the date is set by means of index screws and a consecutive numbering train is put back to zero a third division accommodates a circular electro block for printing the advertisements and a fourth division the figure wheels the turn given to the handle passes a length of the ticket strip through a slot prints the date the number of the ticket an advertisement on the back the assistant's letter the nature of the business done and feeds the paper on to the figures which give the finishing touch a knife cuts off the ticket and a special lever shoots it out of the slot the national cash register company for prudential reasons do not wish the details of the internal machinery to be described nor would it be an easy task even were the permission granted so we must imagine the extreme intricacy of the levers and wheels which perform all the tasks enumerated and turn aside to consider the origin and manufacture of the register which are both of interest the origin of the cash register is rather nebulous because twenty-five years ago several men were working on the same idea it first appeared as a practical machine in the offices of john and james ritty who owned stores and coal mines at dayton ohio james ritty helped and largely paid for the first experiments he needed a mechanical cashier for his own business and says that while on an ocean steamer en route to london the revolving machinery gave him the suggestion worked out on his return to dayton in the first style machine this gave way to the key machine with its display tablet or indicator held up by a supporting bar moved back by knuckles on the vertical tablet rod the cut figure one shows the right side of this key register the action of which is thus described by the national cash register company the key a when pressed with the finger at its ordinary position marked one went down to the point marked two being a lever and pivoted to its centre pressing down a key elevated its extreme point b this pushed up the tablet rod c having on its upper part the knuckle d this knuckle d pushed up took the position at e that is the knuckle pushed back the supporting bar f and was pushed past it and held above it if the same operation were performed on another key the knuckle on its vertical rod going up would again push the supporting bar back which would release the first knuckled rod and leave the last one in its place this knuckled rod had on its upper end the display tablet or indicator g james and john ritty claimed and proved that they invented this but the attorney for the dayton company formed by them in the supreme court was compelled to admit that this mechanism was old yet if machines built like this were exhibited elsewhere they were at most only experimental models 
and none of them had ever gone into practical or commercial use in fact at this time nothing had been really contributed which was useful to the public or used by the public the trouble was that the knuckles being necessarily oiled held dust and dirt which interfered with their free movement and again a five cent or ten cent key would be used more than the others and hence would become more worn as a practical result the tablets did not drop when wanted and the whole operation was thrown into confusion when one tablet went up the other tablet stayed up leaving a false indication the most valuable modification now made by these dayton inventors was to cease to rely on the knuckle to move back the supporting bar and to supply the place of this function by what became known as connecting mechanism especially designed for this purpose this was placed at the other or say the left side of the machine as you faced it cut number two shows this new connecting mechanism the keys when pressed perform the functions as before on the right side of the machine that is to say to ring an alarm bell etc but on the other or left side the key when pressed operated the connecting mechanism marked m n o p and q the key pressed down by its leverage pushed back a little lever q the further end of which pressed back the supporting bar f and released the previously exposed indicator g without relying on the knuckle to perform this function the supreme court of the united states said that the suggestion or idea to correct the old trouble and to accomplish this by dividing the force used and applying a portion of it to the new connecting mechanism on the left side of the machine was fine invention and that the results are so important and the ingenuity displayed to bring them about is such that we are not disposed to deny the patentees the merit of invention the combination described in the first claim was clearly new to revert for a moment to the origin of the invention mr john ritty gives an account differing from that of his brother but the two can probably be reconciled by supposing that the first ideas occurred simultaneously and were worked out in common late one summer night before dispersing home a group of men were in his store one of them said to the proprietor if you had a machine there to register the cash received you would get more of it and to the statement both owner and his clerks assented this raised a laugh but ritty who in spite of a large business which ranged over everything from a needle to a haystack did not make much profit by his sales took the suggestion seriously and put on his thinking cap with the result that the first machine was patented and profits became very greatly increased before his machine had been perfected a rival was in the field mr thomas carney a man who had seen much life as a lumber merchant captain during the civil war explorer and railroad promoter settled down in eighteen eighty four at chicago to the manufacture of coin changers when in various businesses he says we used gold and silver only and it seemed to be a sheer necessity to have something of a money changer to assist us in handling it and making change the custom then was to throw the different coins into a special receptacle marked for each i invented and in my own shop 
built this coin changer the keys of which when touched would through the tube drop the coin into the hand as wanted at chicago we made five or six hundred of these coin changers but by mistake placed the price too low and after some conference i became assured that there was not enough money in it a rich chicago manufacturer had become familiar with the urgent need of a cash register and the losses which followed in business without one the national at dayton had then been invented but had not then been perfected as it has been since parties at chicago agreed to put up the money if i would invent what would answer the purpose of a cash register and make a marketable machine i went home and gave the matter some hard thinking and talking with my son about the matter one night i looked up at the clock and said why harry there is the right thing sixty minutes make an hour one hundred cents make a dollar all i have got to do is to change the wheels a little put some keys into it and there will be a thing which will register cents dimes and dollars just as that clock will register time in minutes and hours in clocks the minute wheel when it has revolved to its sixty point throws its added result of sixty minutes over on to another wheel which takes up the story with one hour in place of the old sixty minutes the first wheel then begins again and goes its round a second complete revolution of the minute wheel throws another sixty minutes on to the hour and gives one more hour registered making two hours and so on i took some wheels and with pasteboard made hands and a machine it was very rough but i took it to my friends and explained it to them we went on but encountering difficulties and obstacles we merged our whole enterprise in the national i followed it and have since invented worked and helped along in the national cash register service i developed the number thirty five machine which the company began on and uses yet it is now in use in every civilized country for it can be made to register english money and any decimal currency in eighteen eighty three dayton contained five families the following year colonel robert patterson bought a large property in the neighbourhood and helped to develop a small town which has since grown into a thriving manufacturing centre his two sons john h patterson and frank j patterson bought out all the original proprietors of the national cash register greatly improved the machine's mechanism and built the huge factory which employs about four thousand men women and girls and is one of the best equipped establishments in the world to promote both an economical output and the comfort of the employees the company's buildings at dayton cover eight hundred and ninety two thousand one hundred and forty four square feet of floor space and utilize one hundred and forty acres of ground in convenience and attractiveness and for light heat and ventilation and all sanitary things these structures are designed to be models of any used for factory purposes a machine is made and sold every two and a half minutes in the dayton berlin and toronto factories collectively according to its destination it records dollars shillings marks cronen corona francs krona guildens pesetas pesos mill race rupees or roubles registers are also made to meet the needs of the celestials and the japanese so necessary is it for these machines to be ever improving that the company 
with a wisdom that prevails more largely perhaps in the united states than elsewhere offer substantial rewards to the employee who records in a book kept specially for the purpose any suggestion which the committee after due examination consider likely to improve some detail of mechanism or manufacture five departments are entirely devoted to experiments carried out by a corps of inventors working with a special body of skilled mechanics new patents accrue so fast as a result of this organized research that the national company now owns five hundred and thirty seven letters patent in the united states and three hundred and ninety four in foreign countries many ideas come from outside if they appear profitable they are bought and turned over to the patents department which hands them on to the experimenters these build an experimental model which differs in many respects from the types hitherto manufactured a cash register must be above all things strong so that it can bear a heavy blow without getting out of order and must retain its accuracy under all conditions the model finished it goes before the inspectors who thump it hammer it almost turn it inside out and send it back to the factory committee with reports on any defects that may have come to light if the inspectors can only knock the machine out of time they consider that they have done their duty for they argue that if weaknesses thus developed are put right no purchaser will ever be able to dislocate the machinery if he stops short of an actual brutal assault with violence next comes the building of the commercial type which will be sold by the thousand the machine goes down to the tool makers a select board of seventy five members who list all the parts and say how many drill jigs mills fixtures gauges etc are necessary to make every part then they draw out an approximate estimate of the cost of producing the tools and after they have listed the parts they turn them over to the various departments such as the drafting room blacksmith's shop pattern shop foundry etc after which the various parts are machined up then the tool maker assembles together the various tools and makes a number of the parts that each tool is designed for so that when all the tools have done their preliminary work the makers possess about fifty machines in bits these are assembled to prove whether the tools do their business efficiently if any part shows an inclination to jam or otherwise misbehave itself the tool responsible is altered till its products are satisfactory then and only then a period of perhaps two years may have elapsed since the model was first put in hand the company begins to entertain a prospect of getting back some of the money any sum up to fifty thousand pounds spent in preparations but they know that if people will only buy they won't have much fault to find with their purchase preparations bring success is the motto of the ncr so the company spares no money and is content to have twenty five thousand pounds locked up in its automatic screw making machines alone human as well as inanimate machinery is well tended under the roof of the ncr the committee believe that a healthy comfortable employee means good and therefore profitable work and that to work well employees must eat and play well they therefore provide their boys with gardens 
ten feet wide by one hundred and seventy feet in length and pay an experienced gardener to direct their efforts to encourage a start bulbs seeds slips etc are supplied free while prizes of considerable value help to stimulate competition one day ten years or more ago mr patterson saw a factory girl trying to warm her tin bucket of cold coffee at the steam heater in the workshop he is a humane man and acting on the unintentional hint he built a lunchroom which contains besides accommodation for four hundred and fifty five people a piano and sewing machine which the women can use during their noon recess of eighty minutes a cooking school dancing classes and literary club are all available to members the company encourages its workers to own the houses they inhabit and to make them as beautiful as their leisure will permit mr mosley who took over to america an industrial commission of experts in 1902 and an educational commission in the following year paid visits on both occasions to the national cash register works in a speech to the committee he said i do not know of any institution in the world which offers so beautiful an illustration of the proper working conditions as the national cash register company your president has asked me to criticize i cannot find anything to criticize in this factory i have never seen such conditions in any other factory in the world nor have i ever seen so many bright and intelligent faces as we have seen at luncheon in both the men's and women's dining rooms i believe this factory is as nearly perfect as social conditions will permit note the author desires to express his thanks to the national cash register company for the kind help given him in the shape of materials for writing and illustrating this chapter end of section two Section 3 of The Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Edwards. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 3 Workshop Machinery, Part 1. The lathe, planing machines, the steam hammer, Hydraulic Tools, Electrical Tools in the Shipyard When I first entered this city, said Mr. William Fairbairn, in an inaugural address to the British Association at Manchester in 1861, the whole of the machinery was executed by hand. There were neither planing, slotting, nor shaping machines, and with the exception of very imperfect lathes and a few drills, the preparatory operations of construction were effected entirely by the hands of the workmen. Now everything is done by machine tools, with a degree of accuracy which the unaided hand could never accomplish. The automaton, or self-acting, machine tool has within itself an almost creative power. In fact, so great are its powers of adaptation that there is no operation of the human hand that it does not imitate. If such things could be said with justice 45 years ago, what would Mr. Fairbairn think could he see the wonderful machinery with which the present-day workshop is equipped, machinery as relatively superior to the devices he speaks of as they were superior to the unaided efforts of the human hand? Invention never stands still. The wonder of one year is on the scrap heap of abandoned machines almost before another 12 months have passed. Some important detail has been improved to secure ease or economy in working, and a more efficient successor steps into its place. In his curious and original Erewhon, Mr. Samuel Butler depicts a community which, 
from the fear that machinery should become too ingenious and eventually drain away man's capacity for muscular and mental action, has risen in revolt against the automaton, broken up all machines which had been in use for less than 270 years, with the exception of specimens reserved for the national museums, and reverted to hand labor. His treatment of the dangers attending the increased employment of lifeless mechanisms as a substitute for physical effort does not, however, show sympathy with the Erewhonians, since their abandonment of invention has obviously placed them at the mercy of any other race retaining the devices so laboriously perfected during the ages. And we, on our part, should be extremely sorry to part with the inanimate helpers which in every path of life render the act of living more comfortable and less toilsome. So dependent are we on machinery that we owe a double debt to the machines which create machines. A big factory houses the parents which send out their children to careers of usefulness throughout the world. We often forget in our admiration of the offspring the source from which they originated. Our bicycles, so admirably adapted to easy locomotion, owe their existence to a hundred delicate machines. The express engine, hurrying forward over the iron way, is but an assemblage of parts which have been beaten, cut, twisted, planed, and otherwise handled by mighty machines, each as wonderful as the locomotive itself. But then, we don't see these. This and following chapters will therefore be devoted to a few peeps at the great tools employed in the world's workshops. If you consider a moment, you will soon build up a formidable list of objects in which circularity is a necessary or desirable feature. Wheels, shafts, plates, legs of tables, walking sticks, pillars, parts of instruments, wire, and so on. The Hindu turner, whose assistant revolves with a string a wooden block centered between two short spiked posts let into the ground while he himself applies the tool, is at one end of the scale of lathe users. At the other, we have the workman who tends the giant machine slowly shaping the exterior of a 12-inch gun, a propeller shaft, or a marble column. All aim at the same object perfect rotundity of surface. The artisans of the Middle Ages have left us, in beautiful balusters and cathedral screens, ample proofs that they were skilled workmen with the turning lathe. At the time of the Huguenot persecutions, large numbers of French artificiers crossed the channel to England, bringing with them lathes which could cut intricate figures by means of wheels, eccentrics, and other devices of a comparatively complicated kind. The French had undoubtedly got far ahead of the English in this branch of the mechanical arts, owing no doubt to the fact that the French noblesse had condescended to include ternary among their aristocratic hobbies. With the larger employment of metal in all industries, the need for handling it easily is increased. Much greater accuracy generally distinguishes metal as compared to woodwork. In turning a piece of work on the old-fashioned lathe, the workman applied and guided his tool by means of muscular strength. The work was made to revolve, and the turner, holding the cutting tool firmly upon the long, straight guiding edge of the rest, along which he carried it, and pressing its point firmly against the article to be turned, was thus enabled to reduce its surface to the required size and shape. Some dexterous turners were able, with practice and carefulness, to execute very clever pieces of work by this simple means. But when the article to be turned was of considerable size, and especially when it was of metal, the expenditure of muscular strength was so great that the workmen soon became exhausted. The slightest variation in the pressure of the tool led to an irregularity of surface, and with the utmost care on the workman's part, he could not avoid occasionally cutting a little too deep, in consequence of which he must necessarily go over the surface again to reduce the hole to the level of that accidentally cut too deep, and thus possibly the job would be altogether spoiled by the diameter of the article under operation being made too small for its intended purpose. 
Any modern worker is spared this labor and worry by the device known as the slide rest. Its name implies that it at once affords a rigid support for the tool and also the means of traversing the tool in a straight line parallel to the metal face on which the work is being done. The introduction of the slide rest is due to the ingenuity of Mr. Henry Maudsley, who, at the commencement of the 19th century, was a foreman in the workshop of Mr. Joseph Brahma, inventor of the famous hydraulic press and locks which bear his name. His rest could be moved along the bed of the lathe by a screw and clamped to any position desired. Fellow workmen at first spoke derisively of Maudsley's go-kart, but men competent to judge its real value had more kindly words to say concerning it, when it had been adapted to machines of various types for planing as well as turning. Mr. James Naismith went so far as to state that its influence in improving and extending the use of machinery has been as great as that produced by the improvement of the steam engine in respect to perfecting manufacturers and extending commerce, Inasmuch as without the aid of the vast accession to our power of producing perfect mechanism, which it at once supplied, we could never have worked out, into practical and profitable forms, the conceptions of those masterminds who, during the last half century, have so successfully pioneered the way for mankind. The steam engine itself, which supplies us with such unbounded power, owes its present perfection to this most admirable means of giving to metallic objects the most precise and perfect geometrical forms. How could we, for instance, have good steam engines if we had not the means of boring out a true cylinder, or turning a true piston rod, or planing a valve face? It is this alone which has furnished us with the means of carrying into practice the accumulated results of scientific investigations on mechanical subjects. The screw cutting lathe is so arranged that the slide rest is moved along with its tool at a uniform speed by gear wheels actuated by the mechanism rotating the object to be turned. By changing the wheels, the rate of feed may be varied so that at every revolution the tool travels from 1 64th of an inch upwards along the surface of its work. This regularity of action adds greatly to the value of the slide rest, and the screw device also enables the workman to chase a thread of absolutely constant pitch on a metal bar, so that a screw cutting lathe is not only a shaping machine, but also the equivalent of a whole armory of stocks and dies. Some lathes have rests which carry several tools held at different distances from its axis, the cuts following one another deeper and deeper into the metal in a manner exactly similar to the harvesting of a field of corn by a succession of reaping machines. The recent improvements in tool steel render it possible to get a much deeper cut than formerly without fear of injury to the tool from overheating. This results in a huge saving of time. For the boring of large cylinders, an upright lathe is generally used, as the weight of the metal might cause a dangerous sag were the cylinder attached horizontally by one end to a facing plate. Huge wheels can also be turned in this type of machine up to 20 feet or more in diameter, and where the crossbar carrying the tools is fitted with several toolboxes, two or more operations may be conducted simultaneously such as the turning of the flange, the boring of the axle hole, and the facing of the rim sides. Perhaps the most imposing of all lathes are those which handle large cannon and propeller shafts, such as may be seen in the works of Sir W. G. Armstrong, Whitworth and Company, of Messrs. Victor's, Sons and Maxim, and of other armament and shipbuilding firms. The Midvale Steel Company have in their shops at Hamilton, Ohio, a monster boring lathe which will take in a shaft 60 feet long, 30 inches in diameter, and bore a hole from one end to the other 14 inches in diameter. To do this, the lathe must attack the shaft at both ends simultaneously, as a single boring bar of 60 feet would not be stiff enough to keep the hole cylindrical. The shaft is placed in a revolving chuck in the central portion of the lathe, which has a total length of over 170 feet, 
and supported further by two revolving ring rests on each side towards the extremities. With work so heavy, the feeding up of the tool to its surface cannot be done conveniently by hand control, and the boring bars are therefore advanced by hydraulic pressure, a very ingenious arrangement ensuring that the pressure shall never become excessive. Perhaps the type of lathe most interesting to the layman is the turret lathe, generally used for the manufacture of articles turned out in great numbers. The headstock, i.e., the revolving part which grips the object to be turned, is hollow so that a rod may be passed right through it into the vicinity of the tools, which are held in a hexagon turret, one tool projecting from each of its sides. When one tool has been finished with, the workman does not have the trouble of taking it out of the rest and putting another in its place. He merely turns the turret around and brings another instrument opposite the work. If the object, say a watercock, requires five operations performing on it in the lathe, the corresponding tools are arranged in their proper order round the turret. Stops are arranged so that as soon as any tool has advanced as far as is necessary, a trip action checks the motion of the turret, which is pulled back and given a turn to make it ready for the next attack. One of the advantages of the turret lathe, particularly of the automatic form which shifts round the toolbox without human intervention, is its power of relieving the operator of the purely mechanical part of the work. Those who are familiar with the inside of some of our large workshops will have noticed men and boys who make the same thing all day and every day and are themselves not far removed from machines. The articles they make are generally small and very rapidly produced, and the endless repetition of the same movements on the part of the operator is very tedious to watch and must be infinitely more so to perform. Such an occupation is not elevating, and those engaged in it cannot take much interest in their work or become fitted for a better position. When this work is done by an automatic lathe, the machine performs the necessary operations, and the man supplies the intelligence, and by exercising his thinking powers, becomes more valuable to his employers and himself. The introduction of new machines and methods generally has a stimulating effect on the whole shop, whatever the Erewhonians might say. The hubs and spindles of bicycles are cut from the solid bar by these automata. The tender has merely to feed them with metal, and they go on smoothing, shaping, and cutting off until the material is all used up. The existence of such lathes largely accounts for the low price of our useful metal steeds at the present time. A great amount of shaping is now done by milling cutters in preference to firmly fixed edge tools. The cutter is a rod or disc which has its sides, end, or circumference serrated with deep teeth, shaped to the section of the cut needed. Revolving at a tremendous speed, it quickly bites its way into anything it meets just so far as a stop allows it to go. One of the most ingenious machines to which the milling tool has been fitted is the well-known Blanchard lathe, which copies, generally in wood, repetitive work, such as the stocks for guns and rifles. The lathe has two sets of centers, one for the copy, the other for the model, parallel on the same bed, and turned at equal speeds and in the same direction by a train of gear wheels. The milling cutter is attached to a frame from which a disc projects and is pressed by a spring against the model. As the latter revolves, its irregular shape causes the disc, frame, and cutter to move towards or away from its center, and therefore towards or away from the center of the copy, which has all superfluities whisked off by the cutter. The frame is gradually moved along the model, reproducing in the rough block a section similar to the part of the model which it has reached. The self-centering chuck is an accessory which has proved invaluable for saving time. It may most easily be described as a circular plate which screws on to the inner end of the mandrel, the spindle imparting motion to the object being machined, and has in its face three slots radiating from the center at angles of 120 degrees. In each slot slides a stepped jaw, 
the underside of which is scored with concentric grooves engaging with a helical scroll turned by a key and worm gear acting on its circumference. The jaws approach or recede from the center symmetrically so that if a circular object is gripped, its center will be in line with the axis of the lathe. Whether for gripping a tiny drill or a large wheel, the self-centering chuck is indispensable. Planing Machines Not less important in engineering than the truly curved surface is the true plane in which, as Euclid would say, any two points being taken, the straight line between them lies wholly in that superficies. The lathe depends for its efficiency on the perfect flatness of all areas which should be flat. The guides, the surface plates, the bottom and sides of the headstock, and above all, of the slide rest. For making plain metal superficies, a machine must first be constructed which itself is above suspicion. But when once built, it creates machines like itself, capable of reproducing others ad infinitum. Many amateur carpenters pride themselves on the beautiful smoothness of the boards over which they have run their jack planes. Yet as compared with the bed of a lathe, their best work will appear very inaccurate. The engineer's planing machine in no way resembles its wooden relative. In the place of a blade projecting just a little way through a surface which prevents it from cutting too deep into the substance over which it is moving, we have a steel chisel very similar to the cutting tools of a lathe, attached to a frame passing up and down over a bed to which the member holding the chisel is perfectly parallel. The article to be planed is rigidly attached to the bed and travels with it. Between every two strokes, the tool is automatically moved sideways so that no two cuts shall be in the same line. After the whole surface has been roughed, a finishing cutter is brought in action and the process is repeated with the business edge of the tool rather nearer to the bed. Joseph Clement, a contemporary of Babbage, Maudslay, and Naismith, is usually regarded as the inventor of the planing machine. By 1825, he had finished a planer in which the tool was stationary and the work moving under it on a rolling bed. Two cutters were attached to the overhead cross rail so that travel in either direction might be utilized. The bed of the machine on which the work was laid passed under the cutters on perfectly true rollers or wheels, lodged and held in their bearings as accurately as the best mandrel could be, and having set screws acting against their ends, totally preventing all end motion. The machine was bedded on a massive and solid foundation of masonry and heavy blocks, the support at all points being so complete as effectually to destroy all tendency to vibration, with the object of securing full, round, and quiet cuts. The rollers on which the planing machine traveled were so true that Clement himself used to say of them, if you were to put a paper shaving under one of the rollers, it would at once stop the rest. Nor was this an exaggeration. The entire mechanism, notwithstanding its great size, being as true and accurate as a watch. Mr. Clement next made a revolving attachment for the bed, in which bodies could be revolved under the cutter on an axis parallel to the direction of travel. According to the wish of the operator, the object was converted into a cylinder, cone, or prism by its movements under the planing tool. So efficient was the machine that it earned its maker upwards of 10 pounds a day at the rate of about 18 shillings a square foot until rivals appeared in the field and finally reduced the cost of planing to a few pence for the same area. There are two main patterns of planes now in general use. The first follows the original design of Clement. The second has a fixed bed but a moving tool. Where the work is very heavy, as in the case of armor plates for battleships, the power required to suddenly reverse the motion of a vast mass of metal is enormous, many times greater than the energy expended on the actual planing. For this reason, the moving bed machines have had to be greatly improved, and in some cases, replaced by fixed bed planers. 
It is an impressive sight to watch one of these huge mechanisms reducing a rough plate, weighing 20 tons or more, to a smoothness which would shame the best billiard table. The machine, which towers 30 feet into the air and completely dwarfs the attendant, who has it as thoroughly under control as if it were a small file, bites great shining strips 40 feet long, maybe, off the surface of the passive metal and leaves a series of grooves as truly parallel as the art of man can make them. There is no fuss, no sticking, no stop, no noise. The force of electricity or steam transmitted through wonderfully cut and arranged gear wheels is irresistible. The tool, so hard that a journey through many miles of steel has no appreciable effect on its edge, shears its way remorselessly over the surface which presently may be tempered to a toughness resembling its own. If you want to resharpen the tool, it will be no good to attack it with any known metal. But somewhere in the works there is a machine whose buzzing emery wheels are more than a match for it and rapidly grind the blunted edge into its former shape so that it is ready to flay another plate one skin at a time. Planing machines are of many shapes. Some have an upright on each side of the bed limiting the width of the work they can take. Others are open-sided, one support of extra strength replacing the two enabling the introduction of a plate twice as broad as the bed. Others, again, are built on the verge of a pit so that they may cut the edges of an upended plate and make it fit against its fellows so truly that you could not slip a sheet of paper edgeways between them. Thus has man, so frail and delicate in himself, shaped metal till it can torture its kind to suit his will which he makes known to it by opening this valve or pulling on that lever. Not only does he flay it, but pierces it through and through, twists it into all manner of shapes, hacks masses off as easily as he would cut slices from a loaf, squeezes it in terrible presses to a fraction of its original thickness, and otherwise so treats it that we are glad that our scientific observations have as yet discovered no sentience in the substances reduced to our service. End of section 3 Section 4 of The Romance of Modern Mechanism This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Edwards the Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams Chapter 3 Workshop Machinery Part 2 The Steam Hammer The Scandinavian god Thor was a marvelous blacksmith. Thursday should remind us weekly of Odin's son, from whose hammer flashed the lightning, and through him a Vulcan, toiling at his smithy in the crater of Vesuvius. In spite of the pictures drawn for us by pagan mythologists of their godsmiths, we are left with a doubt whether these beings, if materialized, might not themselves be somewhat alarmed by the steam hammer which mere mortals wield so easily. The forge is without dispute the show place of a big factory where huge blocks of metal feel the heavy hand of steam. As children, we watched the blacksmith at his anvil attracted and yet half terrified by the spark showers flying from a white-hot horseshoe. And even the adult, long used to startling sights, might well be fascinated and dismayed by the terrific blows dealt on glowing ingots by the mechanical sledge. James Naismith, the inventor of this useful machine, was the son of a landscape painter who from his earliest youth had taken great interest in scientific and mechanical subjects of all kinds, at 15, he made a steam engine to grind his father's paints, and five years later a steam carriage that ran many a mile with eight persons on it. After keeping it in action two months, he says in an account of his early life, to the satisfaction of all who were interested in it, my friends allowed me to dispose of it, and I sold it, a great bargain, after which the engine was used in driving a small factory. I may mention that in that engine I employed the waste steam to cause an increased draft by its discharge up the chimney. 
This important use of waste steam had been introduced by George Stevenson some years before, though entirely unknown to me. This interesting peep at the infancy of the motor carriage reveals mechanical capabilities of no mean order in young James. He soon entered the service of Mr. Joshua Field, Henry Maudsley's partner, and in 1834 set up a business on his own account at Manchester. At this date, the nearest approach to the modern steam hammer was the tilt hammer, operated by horse, water, or steam power. It resembled an ordinary hand hammer on a very large scale, but as it could be raised only a small distance above its anvil, it became less effective as the size of the work increased, owing to the fall being gagged. In 1837, Mr. Naismith interviewed the directors of the Great Western Steamship Company with regard to the manufacture of some unusually powerful tools which they needed for forging the paddle shaft of the Great Britain. As the invention of the steam engine had demanded the improvement of churning methods, so now the increase in the size of steamboats showed the insufficiency of forging machinery. Mr. Naismith put on his thinking cap. Evidently, the thing needed was a method for raising a very heavy mass of metal easily to a good height, so that its great weight might fall with crushing force on the object between it and the anvil. How to raise it? Brilliant idea. Steam. In a moment, Naismith had mentally pictured an inverted steam cylinder rested on a solid upright, overhanging the anvil, and a block of iron attached to its piston rod. All that would be necessary was to admit steam to the underside of the piston until the block had risen to its full height and to suddenly open a valve which would cut off the steam supply and allow the vapor already in the cylinder to escape. By the next post he sent a sketch to the company who approved his design heartily but were unable to use it since the need for the paddle shaft had already been nullified by the substitution of a screw as the motive power of their ship. Poor Naismith knew that he had discovered a good thing, but British forge masters, with a want of originality that amounted to sheer blind stupidity, refused to look at the innovation. We have not orders enough to keep in work the forge hammers we have, they wrote, and we don't want any new ones, however improved they may be. His invention, therefore, appeared doomed to failure. Help, however, came from France in the person of Mr. Schneider, founder of the famous Crusoe Iron Works, notorious afterwards as the birthplace of the Boer Long Toms. Mr. Naismith happened to be away when Mr. Schneider and a friend called at the Manchester Works, but his partner, Mr. Gaskell, showed the French visitors round the works and also told them of the proposed steam hammer. The designs were brought out so that its details might be clearly explained. Years afterwards, Naismith returned the visit and saw in the Crusoe works a crankshaft so large that he asked how it had been forged. By means of your steam hammer, came the reply. You can imagine Naismith's surprise on finding the very machine at work in France which his own countrymen had so despised and his delight over its obvious success. On returning home, he at once raised money enough to secure a patent, protected his invention, and began to manufacture what has been described as one of the most perfect of artificial machines and noblest triumphs of mind over matter that modern English engineers have developed. A few weeks saw the first, a 30 hundredweight hammer at work. People flocked to watch its precision, its beauty of action, and the completeness of control which could arrest it at any point of its descent so instantaneously as to crack without smashing a nut laid on the anvil. Its advantages were so obvious that its adoption soon became general, and in the course of a few years Naismith steam hammers were to be found in every well-appointed workshop, both at home and abroad. Naismith's invention was improved upon in 1853 by Mr. Robert Wilson, his partner and successor. He added an automatic arrangement which raised the top or head automatically from the metal it struck so that time was saved and loss of heat to the ingot was also avoided. The beauty of the balance valve, as it was called, will be more clearly understood if we remember that the travel of the hammer is constantly increasing 
as the piece on the anvil becomes thinner under successive blows. Under the influence of this very ingenious valve, every variety of blow could be dealt. By simply altering the position of a tappet lever by means of two screws, a blow of the exact force required could be repeated an indefinite number of times. It became a favorite amusement to place a wine glass containing an egg upon the anvil and let the block descend upon it with its quick motion, and so nice was its adjustment and so delicate its mechanism that the great block, weighing perhaps several tons, could be heard playing tap, tap upon the egg without even cracking the shell when, at a signal given to the man in charge, down would come the great mass and the egg and glass would be apparently, as Walter Savage Landor has it, blasted into space. Later on, Mr. Wilson added an equally important feature in the shape of a double action hand gear which caused the steam to act on the top as well as on the bottom of the piston, thus more than doubling the effect of the hammer. The largest hammer ever made was that erected by the Bethlehem Iron Company of Pennsylvania. The tup weighed 125 tons. After being in use for three years, the owners consigned it to the scrap heap as inferior to the hydraulic press for the manufacture of armor plate, though it had cost them 50,000 pounds. They then erected in its stead, for an equal sum of money, a 14,000 ton pressure hydraulic press, which fitly succeeds it as the most powerful of its kind in the world. The change was made for three reasons. First, that the impact of so huge a block of metal necessitates the anvil being many times as heavy, and even then the shock to surrounding machinery may be very severe. Secondly, the larger the forging to be hammered, the less is the reaction of the anvil, so that all the force of the blow tends to be absorbed by the side facing the hammer, whereas, with a small bar, the anvil's inertia would have almost as much effect as the actual blow. Thirdly, the blow of the hammer is so instantaneous that the metal has not time to flow properly, and this leads to imperfect forgings, the surface of which may have been cracked. For very large work, therefore, the hammer is going out of fashion and the press coming in, though for lighter jobs it is still widely used. Before leaving the subject, we may glance at the double-headed horizontal hammer, such as is to be found in the forge shop of the Horwich Railway Works. Two hammers, carried on rails and rollers, advance in unison from each side and pound work laid on a support between them. Each acts as an anvil to the other, while doing its full share of the work. So that not only is a great deal of weight saved, but shocks are almost entirely absorbed. While the fact that each hammer need make a blow of only half the length of what would be required from a single hammer enables twice as many blows to be delivered in a given time. Hydraulic Tools Before discussing these in detail, we shall do well to trace the history of the Brahma Press, which may be said to be their parent, since the principle employed in most hydraulic devices for the workshop, as also the idea of using water as a means of transmitting power under pressure, are justly attributed to Joseph Brahma. If you take a dive into the sea and fall flat on the surface instead of entering at the graceful angle you intended, you will feel for some time afterwards as if an enemy had slapped you violently on the chest and stomach. You have learned by sad experience that water, which seems to offer so little resistance to a body drawn slowly through it, is remarkably hard if struck violently. In fact, if enclosed, it becomes more incompressible than steel without in any way losing its fluidity. We possess in water, therefore, a very useful agent for transmitting energy from one point to another. Shove one end of a column of water, and it gives a push to anything at its other end, but then it must be enclosed in a tube to guide its operation. By a natural law, all fluids press evenly on every unit of a surface that confines them. You may put sand into a bucket with a bottom of cardboard and beat hard upon the surface of the sand without knocking out the bottom. The friction between the sand particles and the bucket's sides entirely absorbs the blow. But if water were substituted for sand and struck with an object that just fitted the bucket so as to prevent the escape of liquid, the bottom and sides too would be ripped open. 
The writer of this book once fired a candle out of a gun at a hermetically sealed tin of water to see what the effect would be. Another candle had already been fired through an iron plate one quarter of an inch thick. The impact slightly compressed the water in the tin, which gave back all the energy in a recoil, which split the sheet metal open and flung portions of it many feet in the air. But the candle never got through the side. This affords a very good idea of the almost absolute incompressibility of a liquid. We may now return to history. Joseph Brahma was born in 1748 at Barnsley in Yorkshire. As the son of a farm laborer, his lot in life would probably have been to follow the plow had not an accident to his right ankle compelled him to earn his living in some other way. He therefore turned carpenter and developed such an aptitude for mechanics that we find him, when 40 years old, manufacturing the locks with which his name is associated, and six years later experimenting with the hydraulic press. This may be described simply as a large cylinder in which works a solid piston of a diameter almost equal to that of the bore connected to a force pump. Every stroke of the pump drives a little water into the cylinder, and as the water pressure is the same throughout, the total stress on the piston end is equal to that on the pump plunger multiplied by the number of times that one exceeds the other in area. Suppose, then, that the plunger is one inch in diameter and the piston one foot, and that a man drives down the plunger with a force of 1,000 pounds, then the total pressure on the piston end will be 144 times 1,000 pounds. But for every inch that the plunger has traveled, the piston moves only 1 44th of an inch, thus illustrating the law that what is gained in time is lost in power and vice versa. The great difficulty encountered by Brahma was the prevention of leakage between the piston and the cylinder walls. If he packed it so tightly that no water could pass, then the piston jammed. If the packing was eased, then the leak recommenced. Brahma tried all matter of expedience without success. At last his foreman, Henry Maudslay, already mentioned in connection with the lathe slide rest, conceived an idea which showed real genius by reason of its very simplicity. Why not, he said, let the water itself give sufficient tightness to the packing, which must be a collar of stout leather with an inverted U-shaped section. This suggestion saved the situation. A recess was turned in the neck of the cylinder at the point formerly occupied by the stuffing box, and into this the collar was set, the edges pointing downwards. When water entered under pressure, it forced the edges in different directions, one against the piston, the other against the wall of the recess, with a degree of tightness proportioned to the pressure. As soon as the pressure was removed, the collar collapsed and allowed the piston to pass back into the cylinder without friction. A similar device, to turn to smaller things for a moment, is employed in a cycle tire inflator, a cup-shaped leather being attached to the rear end of the piston to seal it during the pressure stroke, though acting as an inlet valve for the suction stroke. What we owe to Joseph Brahma and Henry Maudslay for their joint invention, the honor must be divided like that of designing a steam hammer between Naismith and Wilson. It would indeed be hard to estimate. Wherever steady but enormous effort is required for lifting huge girders, houses, ships, for forcing wheels off their axles, for elevators, for advancing the boring shield of a tunnel, for compressing hay, wool, cotton, wood, even metal, for riveting, bending, drilling steel plates, there you will find some modification of the hydraulic press useful, if not indispensable. However, as we are now prepared for a consideration of details, we may return to our workshop and see what water is doing there. Outside stands a cylindrical object many feet broad and high, which can move up and down in vertical guides. If you peep underneath, you'll notice the shining steel shaft, which supports the entire weight of this tank or coffer filled with heavy articles, stones, scrap iron, etc. The shaft is the piston plunger of a very long cylinder connected by pipes to pumping engines and hydraulic machines. It and the mass it bears up serves as a reservoir of energy. 
If the pumping engines were coupled up directly to the hydraulic tools, whenever a workman desired to use a press, drill, or stamp, as the case may be, he would have to send a signal to the engine man to start the pumps, and another signal to tell him when to stop. This would lead to great waste of time and a danger of injuring the tackle from overdriving. But with an accumulator, there is always a supply of water under pressure at command, for as soon as the ram is nearly down, the engines are automatically started to pump it up again. In short, the accumulator is to hydraulic machinery what their bag is to bagpipes, or the air reservoir to an organ. In large towns, high pressure water is distributed through special mains by companies who make a business of supplying factories, engineering works, and other places where there is need for it, though not sufficient need to justify the occupiers in laying down special pumping plant. London can boast five central distributing stations where engines of 6,500 HP are engaged in keeping nine large accumulators full to feed 120 miles of pipes, varying in diameter from 7 inches downwards. The pressure is 700 pounds to the square inch. Liverpool has 23 miles of pipes under 850 pounds pressure. Manchester, 17 miles under 1,100 pounds. To these may be added Glasgow, Hull, Birmingham, Geneva, Paris, Berlin, Antwerp, and many other large cities in both Europe and the United States. For very special purposes, such as making metal forgings, pressures up to 12 tons to the square inch may be required. To produce this, intensifiers are used, i.e. presses worked from the ordinary hydraulic mains which pump water into a cylinder of larger diameter connected with the forging press. The largest English forging press is to be found in the Openshaw works of Sir W. G. Armstrong, Whitworth and Company. Its duty is to consolidate armor plate ingots by squeezing, preparatory to their passing through the rolling mills. It has one huge ram 78 inches in diameter into the cylinders of which water is pumped by engines of 4,000 HP under a pressure of 6,720 pounds to the square inch, which gives a total ram force of 12,000 tons. It has a total height of 33 feet, is 22 feet wide, and 175 feet long, and weighs 1,280 tons. On each side of the anvil is a trench fitted with platforms and machinery for moving the ingot across the ingot block. Two 100-ton electric cranes with hydraulic lifting cylinders serve the press. The Bethlehem Works squeezer has two rams, each of much smaller diameter than the Armstrong Whitworth, but operated by 10.5 tons pressure to the square inch. It handles ingots of over 120 tons weight for armor plating. In 1895, Mr. William Corey of Pittsburgh took out a patent for toughening nickel steel plates by subjecting them, while heated to a temperature of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, to great compression, which elongates them only slightly, though reducing their thickness considerably. The heating of a large plate takes from 10 to 20 hours. It is then ready to be placed between the jaws of the big press, which are about a foot wide. The plate is moved forward between the jaws after each stroke until the entire surface has been treated. At one stroke, a 17-inch plate is reduced to 16 inches, and subsequent squeezings give it a final thickness of 14 inches. Its length has meanwhile increased from 16 to 18 and a half feet, or in that proportion, while its breadth has remained practically unaltered. A simple sum shows that metal which originally occupied 32 and two-thirds cubic inches has now been compressed into 31 cubic inches. This alteration being affected without any injury to the surface, a plate very tough inside and very hard outside is made. The plate is next reheated to 1,350 degrees Fahrenheit and allowed to cool very gradually to a low temperature to anneal it. Then, once again, the furnaces are started to bring it back to 1,350 degrees, when cold water is squirted all over the surface to give it a proper temper. If it bends and warps at all during this process, 
A slight reheating and a second treatment in the press restores its shape. The hydraulic press is also used for bending or stamping plates in all manners of forms. You may see 8-inch steel slabs being quietly squeezed in a pair of huge dies until they have attained a semicircular shape to fit them for the protection of a man-of-war's big gun turret, or thinner stuff having its ends turned over to make a flange, or still slenderer metal stamped into the shape of a complete steel boat as easily as the tinsmith stamps tartlet molds. In another workshop, a pair of massive jaws worked by water power are breaking up iron pigs into pieces suitable for the melting furnace. The manufacture of munitions of war also calls for the aid of this powerful ally. Take the field gun and its ammunition. The gun itself is a steel barrel, hydraulically forged, and afterwards wire wound. The carriage is built up of steel plates, flanged and shaped in hydraulic presses. The wheels have their naves composed of hydraulically flanged and corrugated steel discs, and even the tires are forced on cold by hydraulic tire setters, the rams of which are powerful enough to reduce the diameter of the welded tire until the latter tightly nips the wheel. The shells for the gun are punched and drawn by powerful hydraulic presses, and the copper driving bands are fixed on the projectiles in special hydraulic presses. Quick firing cartridge cases are capped, drawn, and headed by a hydraulic press, whose huge mass always impresses the uninitiated as absurdly out of proportion to the small size of the finished case. And finally, the cordite firing charge is dependent on hydraulic presses for its density and shape. The press for placing the driving band on a shell is particularly interesting. After the shell has been shaped and its exterior turned smooth and true, a groove is cut round it near the rear end. Into this groove, a band of copper is forced to prevent the leakage of gas from the firing charge past the shell, and also to bite the rifling which imparts a rotary motion to the shell. The press for performing the operation has six cylinders and rams arranged spokewise inside a massive steel ring. The rams carrying concave heads which, when the full stroke is made, meet at the center so as to form a complete circle. Pressure is admitted, says Mr. Petch, to the cylinders by copper pipes connected up to a circular distributing pipe. The press takes water from the 700 pounds main for the first three-eighths of an inch of the stroke, and for the last one-eighth of an inch, water pressure at three tons per square inch is used. The total pressure on all the rams to band a six-inch shell is only 600 tons, but for a 12-inch shell, no less than 2,800 tons is necessary. Electric Tools in a Shipyard Of late years, electricity has taken a very prominent part in workshop equipment on account of the ease with which it can be applied to a machine, the freedom from belting and overhead gear which it gives, and its greater economy. In a lathe shop, where only half the lathes may be in motion at a time, the shafting and the belts for the total number is constantly whirling, absorbing uselessly a lot of power. If, however, a separate motor be fitted to each lathe, the workman can switch it on and off at his pleasure. The New York Shipbuilding Company, a very modern enterprise, depends mainly on electrical power for driving its machinery, in preference to belting, compressed air, or water. Let us stroll through the various shops and note the uses to which the current has been harnessed. Before entering, our attention is arrested by a huge gantry crane borne by two columns which travel on rails. From the cross girder or bridge, 88 feet long, hang two lifting magnets worked by 25 HP motors which raise the load at the rate of 20 feet per minute. Motors of equal power move the whole gantry along its rails over the great piles of steel plates and girders from which it selects victims to feed the maw of the shops. The main building is of enormous size, covering with its single roof no less than 18 acres. Just imagine four acres of skylights and two acres of windows, and you may be able to calculate the little glazier's bill that might result from a bad hailstorm. In this immense chamber are included the machine, boiler, blacksmith, plate, frame, pipe, and mold shops, 
the general storerooms, the building ways, and outfitting slips. The material which enters the plate and storage rooms at one end does not leave the building until it goes out as a part of the completed ship for which it was intended when the vessel is ready to enter service. There are installed in one main building and under one roof all the material and machinery necessary for the construction of the largest ship known to commerce and eight sets of shipways built upon masonry foundations covered by roofs of steel and glass and spanned by cranes up to 100 tons lifting capacity are practically as much a part of the immense main building as the boiler shop or machine shop. A huge 100 ton crane of 121 foot span dominates the machine shop and shipways at a height of 120 feet. It toys with a big engine or boiler, picking it up when the riveters, caulkers, and fitters have done their work and dropping it gently into the bowels of a partly finished vessel. A number of smaller cranes run about with their loads. Those which handle plates are, like the big gantry already referred to, equipped with powerful electromagnets which fix like leeches on the metal and will not let go their hold until the current is broken by the pressing of a button somewhere on the bridge. Sometimes several plates are picked up at once, and then it is pretty to see how the man in charge drops them in succession, one here, another there, by merely opening and closing the switch very quickly, so that the plate furthest from the magnets falls before the magnetism has passed out of the nearer plates. Another interesting type is the extension arm crane, which shoots out an arm between two pillars, grips something, and pulls it back into the main aisle, down which it travels without impediment. On every side are fresh wonders. Here is an immense rolling machine fed with plates 27 feet wide, which bends the one and one eighth inch thick metal as if it were so much pastry, or turns over the edges neatly at the command of a 50 HP motor. There we have an electric plate planer scraping the surface of a sheet half the length of a cricket pitch. As soon as the stroke is finished, the bed reverses automatically while the tool turns over to offer its edge to the metal approaching from the other side, all so quietly yet irresistibly done. Now mark these punches as they bite one and a quarter inch holes through steel plates over an inch thick, one every two seconds. A man cutting wads out of cardboard could hardly perform his work so quickly and well. Almost as horribly resistless is the circular saw which eats its way quite unconcernedly through bars six inches square or snips lengths off steel beams. What is that strange looking machine over there? It has three columns which move on circular rails round a table in the center. Up and down each column passes a stage carrying with it a workman and an electric drill working four spindles. Look, here comes a crane with a boiler shell, the plates of which have been bolted in position. The crane lets down its load and up onto the table and trots off while the three workmen move their columns round till the twelve drills are opposite their work. Then, whirr, a dozen twisted steel points ranged in three sets of four, one drill above the other, bite into the boiler plates opening out holes at mathematically correct intervals all down the overlapping steam plates. This job done, the columns move round the boiler and their drills pierce it first near the lower edge, then near the upper. The crane returns, grips the cylinder, and bears it off to the riveters, who are waiting with their hydraulic presses to squeeze the rivets into the holes just made and shape their heads into neat hemispheres. As it swings through the air, the size of the boiler is dwarfed by its surroundings, but if you had put a rule to it on the table, you would have found that it measured 20 feet in diameter and as many in length. A few months hence, furnaces will rage in its stomach and cause it to force tons of steam into the mighty cylinders driving some majestic vessel across the Atlantic. We pass giant lathes busy on the propeller shafts, huge boring mills which slowly smooth the interior of a cylinder, planers which face the valve slides, and we arrive, I weary, at the launching ways where an ocean liner is being given her finishing touches. Then we begin to moralize. That 600-foot floating palace is a concretion of parts, shaped, punched, cut, 
planed, bored, fixed by electricity. Where does man come in? Well, he harnessed the current. He guided it. He said, do this, and it did it. Does not that seem to be his fair share of the work? End of section 4. Section 5 of The Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Seidel. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 4 Portable Tools. If the mountain won't come to Muhammad, says the proverb, Muhammad must go to the mountain. This is as true in the workshop as outside, Muhammad being the tool, the mountain, the work on which it must be used. With the increase in size of machinery and engineering material, methods half a century old do not, in many cases, suffice, especially at a time when commercial competition has greatly reduced the margin of profits formerly expected by the manufacturer. Take the case of a large shaft, which must have a slot cut along it on one side to accommodate the key wedge, which holds an eccentric for moving a steam valves of a cylinder or a screw propeller so that it cannot slip. The mass weighs perhaps 20 tons. One way of doing the job is to transport the shaft under a drill that will cut a hole at each end of the slot area, and then to turn it over to the planer for the intermediate metal to be scraped out. This is a very toilsome and expensive business, entailing the use of costly machinery which might be doing more useful work and the sacrifice of much valuable time. Inventors have therefore produced portable tools which can perform work on big bodies just as efficiently as if it had been done by larger machinery in a fraction of the time and at greatly reduced cost. To quote an example, the cutting of a keyway of the kind just described by big machines would consume perhaps a whole day, whereas the light, portable, easily attached miller, now generally used, bites it out in 90 minutes. Pneumatic Tools The best known of these is the pneumatic hammer. It consists of a cylinder, inside of which moves a solid piston, having a stroke of from half an inch to six inches. Air is supplied through flexible tubing from a compressing pump worked by steam. The piston beats on a loose block of metal carried in the end of the tool which does the actual striking. The piston suddenly decreases in diameter at about the center of its length, leaving a shoulder on which the air can work to effect the withdrawal stroke. By a very simple arrangement of air ports, the piston is made to act as its own valve. As the plane side of the piston has a greater area than that into which the piston rod fits, the striking movement is much more violent than the return. Under a pressure of several hundred pounds to the square inch, the pneumatic hammer delivers upwards of 7,000 blows per minute, the quick succession of comparatively gentle taps having the effect of a much smaller number of heavier blows. For the flat hammer head can be substituted a curved die for riveting, or a chipping chisel, or a caulking iron to close the seams of boilers. The riveter is particularly useful for ship and bridge building work, where it is impossible to apply an hydraulic tool. A skilled workman will close the rivet heads as fast as his assistant can place them in their holes, certainly in less than half the time needed for swing hammer closing. Even more effective, proportionately, is the pneumatic chipper. The writer has seen one cut a strip off the edge of a half-inch steel plate at the rate of several inches a minute. To the uninitiated beholder, it would seem impossible that a tool weighing less than two stone could thus force its way through solid metal. The speed of the piston is so high that, though it scales but a few pounds, its momentum is great enough to advance the chisel a fraction of an inch, and the individual advances, following one another with inconceivable rapidity, soon totaled up into a big cut. Automatic chisels are very popular with ornamental masons, 
as they lend themselves to the sculpturing of elaborate designs in stone and marble. Their principle, modified to suit work of another character, is seen in percussive rock drills, such as the Ingersoll sergeant. In this case, the piston and the tool are solid, and the air is let into the cylinder by means of slide valves operated by tappets, which the piston strikes during its movements. Some types of the rock drill are controllable as to the length of their stroke, so that it can be shortened while the entry of the hole is being made, and gradually increased as the hole deepens. For perpendicular boring, the drill is mounted on a heavily weighted tripod, the inertia of which effectively damps all recoil from the shock of striking. For horizontal work, and sometimes for vertical, the support is a pillar wedged between the walls of the tunnel or shaft. An ingenious detail is the rifled bar which causes the drill to rotate slightly on its axis between every two strokes so that it may not jam. The drills are light enough to be easily erected and dismantled and compact, so that they can be used in restricted and out-of-the-way places, while their simplicity entails little special training on the part of the workman. With pneumatic and other power drills, the cost of piercing holes for explosive charges is reduced to less than one-quarter that of jumping with a crowbar and sledgehammers. With a hand method, two men are required, usually more. One man to hold, guide, and turn the drill, and the other or others to strike the blows with hammers. The machine, striking a blow far more rapidly than can be done by hand, reduces the number of operators to one man and perhaps his helper. So durable is the metal of these wonderful little mechanisms that the delivery of 360,000 blows daily for months, even though each is given with a force of perhaps half a ton, fails to wear them out or at most only necessitates the renewal of some minor and cheap part. The debt that civilization owes to the substitution of mechanical for hand labor will be fully understood by anyone who is conversant with the history of tunnel driving and mining. Another application of pneumatics is seen in the device for cutting off the ends of stay bolts of locomotive boilers. It consists of a cylinder about 15 inches in diameter, the piston of which operates a pair of large nippers capable of shearing half-inch bars. The whole apparatus weighs but three-quarters of a hundredweight, yet its power is such that it can trim bolts forty times as fast as a man working with a hammer and coal chisel, and more thoroughly. Then there is the machine for breaking the short bolts which hold together the outer and inner shells of the water jacket round the locomotive furnace. A threaded bar, along which travels a nut, has a hook on its end to catch the bolt. The nut is screwed up to make the proper adjustment, and a pneumatic cylinder pulls on the hook with a force of many tons, easily shearing through the bolt. We must not forget the pneumatic borer for cutting holes in wood or metal, or enlarging holes already existing. The head of the borer contains three little cylinders set at an angle of 120 degrees to rotate the drill, the valves opening automatically to admit air at very high pressures behind the pistons. Any carpenter can imagine the advantage of a drill which has merely to be forced against its work, the movement of a small lever by the thumb doing the rest. Next on the list comes the pneumatic painter, which acts on much the same principle as the scent spray. Mechanical painting first came to the fore in 1893 when the huge Chicago Exposition provided many acres of surfaces which had to be protected from the weather or hidden from sight. The following description of one of the machines used to replace handwork is given in Cassier's magazine. Quote, the paint is atomized and sprayed onto the work by a stream of compressed air. From a small air compressor, the air is led through flexible hose to a paint tank, which is provided with an airtight cover and clamping screws. The paint is contained in a pot, which can be readily removed and replaced by another when a different color is required. The arrangement of interchangeable tins is also important as facilitating easy cleaning. The container is furnished with a semi-rotary stirrer, the spindle passing through a stuffing box in the cover, and ending in a handle by which the whole thing complete may be carried about. The compressor is necessarily fixed or stationary, 
but the paint tank, connected to it by the single air hose, can be moved close to the work, while the length of the hose from the tank to the nozzle gives the freedom of movement necessary. Air pressure is admitted to the tank by a bottom valve and forces the paint up an internal pipe and along a hose from the tank to the spraying nozzle, to which air pressure is also led by a second hose. The nozzle is practically an injector of special form. The flow of paint at the nozzle is controlled by a small plug valve and spring lever on which the operator keeps his thumb while working and which, on release, closes automatically. When it is required to change from one color to another, or to use a different material such as varnish, the can previously in use is removed and air, or if necessary, paraffin oil, is blown through the length of hose which supplies the paint until it is completely clean. End quote. The writer then mentions as an instance of the machine's efficiency that it has covered a 30 feet by 8 feet boiler in less than an hour and that at one large bridge yard, a 70 feet by 6 feet girder with all its projecting parts was coated with boiled oil in two hours, a job which would have occupied a man with a brush the whole day to execute. Apart from saving time, the machine produces a surface quite free from brush marks, and easily reaches surfaces and in intricate moldings which are difficult to get at with a brush. The pneumatic sand jet is used for a variety of purposes, for cleaning off old paint or the weathered surface of stonework, for polishing up castings and forgings after they have been brazed. At the cycle factory, you will find the sand jet hard at work on the joints of cycle frames, which must be cleared of all roughness before they are fit for the enameler. The writer, a few days before penning these lines, watched a jet removing London grime from the face of a large hotel. Down a side street stood a steam engine busily compressing air, which was led by long pipes to the jet situated on some lofty scaffolding. The rapidity with which the flying grains scoured off smoke deposits attracted the notice of a large crowd, which gazed with upturned heads at the whitened stones. A peculiarity about the jet is that it proves much more effective on hard material than on soft, as the latter, by offering an elastic surface, robs the sand of its cutting power. After merely mentioning the pneumatic rammer for forcing sand into foundry molds, we pass to the pneumatic sandpapering machine, which may be described briefly as a revolving disc carrying a circle of sandpaper on its face revolved between guards which keep it flat to the work. The disc flies around many hundreds of times per minute, rapidly wearing down the fibrous surface of the wood it touches. When the coarse paper has done its work, a finely grained cloth is substituted to produce the finish needful for painting. End of section number five. Section six of the Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuel Zornberg. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 5 The Pedrail. Have you ever watched carefully a steamroller's action on the road when it is working on newly laid stones? If you have, you noticed that the stones, gravel, etc., in front of the roller moved with a wave-like motion, so that the engine was practically climbing a never-ending hill. No wonder, then, that the mechanism of such a machine needs to be very strong, and its power multiplied by means of suitable gearing. Again, suppose that an iron-tired vehicle, traveling at a rapid pace, meets a large stone. What happens? Either the stone is forced into the ground, or the wheel must rise over it. In either case, there will be a jar to the vehicle, and a loss of propulsive power. Do not all cyclists know the fatigue of riding over a bumpy road? 
fatigue to both muscles and nerves? As regards motors and cycles, the vibration trouble has been largely reduced by the employment of pneumatic tires, which lap over small objects, and when they strike large ones, minimize the shock by their buffer-like nature. Yet there is still a great loss of power, and if pneumatic tired vehicles suffer, what must happen to the solid, snorting, inelastic traction engine? On hard roads, it rattles and bumps along, pulverizing stones, crushing the surface. When soft ground is encountered, in sink the wheels because their bearing surface must be increased until it is sufficient to carry the engine's weight. But by the time that they are six inches below the surface, there will be a continuous vertical belt of earth six inches deep to be crushed down incessantly by their advance. How much more favorably situated is the railway locomotive or truck? Their wheels touch metal at a point but a fraction of an inch in length. Consequently, there is nothing to hamper their progression. So great is the difference between the rail and the road that experiment has shown that, whereas a pull of from 8 to 10 pounds will move a ton on rails, an equal weight requires a tractive force of 50 to 100 pounds on the ordinary turnpike. In order to obviate this great wastage of power, various attempts have been made to provide a road locomotive with means for laying its own track as it proceeds. About 40 years ago, Mr. Boydell constructed a wheel which took its own rail with it, the rails being arranged about the wheel like a hexagon round a circle, so that as the wheel moved it always rested on one of the hexagon's sides, itself flat on the ground. This device had two serious drawbacks. In the first place, the plates made a rattling noise which has been compared to the reports of a Maxim gun. Secondly, though the contrivance acted fairly well on level ground, it failed when uneven surfaces were encountered. Thus, if a brick lay across the path, one end of a plate rested on the brick, the other on the ground behind, and the unsupported center had to carry a sudden, severe strain. Furthermore, the plates, being connected at the angles of a hexagon, could not tilt sideways, with the result that breakages were frequent. Of late years, Another inventor, Mr. J. B. Diplock, has come forward with an invention which bids fair to revolutionize heavy road traffic. At present, though it has reached a practical stage and undergone many tests satisfactorily, it has not been made absolutely perfect, for the simple reason that no great invention jumps to finality all at once. Are not engineers still improving the locomotive? The pedrail, as it has been named, signifies a rail moving on feet. Mr. Diplock, observing that a horse has for its weight a tractive force much in excess of the traction engine, took a hint from nature and conceived the idea of copying the horse's foot action. The reader must not imagine that here is a return to the abortive and rather ludicrous attempts at a walking locomotive made many years ago, when some engineers considered it proper that a railway engine should be propelled by legs. Mr. Diplock's device not merely propels, but also steps, i.e., selects the spot on the ground which shall be the momentary point at which propulsive force shall be exerted. To make this clearer, Consider the action of a wheel. First, we will suppose that the spokes, any number you please, are connected at the outer ends by flat plates. As each angle is passed, the wheel falls flop onto the next plate. The greater the number of the spokes, the less will be each successive jar or step, and consequently, the perfect wheel is theoretically one in which the sides have been so much multiplied as to be infinitely short. A horse has practically two wheels, its front legs one, 
its back legs the other. The shoulder and hip joints form the axles, and the legs the spokes. As the animal pulls, the leg on the ground advances at the shoulder past the vertical position, and the horse would fall forwards were it not for the other leg which has been advanced simultaneously. Each step corresponds to our many-sided wheel falling onto a flat side, and the hammer, hammer, hammer on the hard high road is the horsey counterpart of the metallic rattle. On rough ground, a horse has a great advantage over a wheeled tractor because it can put its feet down on the top of objects of different elevations and still pull. A wheel cannot do this, and, as we have seen, a loss of power results. Our inventor, therefore, created in his pedrail a compromise between the railway smoothness and ease of running and the selective and accommodating powers of a quadruped. We must now plunge into the mechanical details of the pedrail, which is, strictly speaking, a term confined to the wheel alone. Our illustration will aid the reader to follow the working of the various parts. In a railway, we have A. Sleepers on the ground B. Rails attached to the sleepers C. Wheels rolling over the rails In the ped rail, the order, reckoning upwards, is altered. On the ground is the ped, or movable sleeper carrying wheels, over which a rail attached to the moving vehicle glides continuously. The principle is used by anyone who puts wooden rollers down to help him move heavy furniture about. Of course, the peds cannot be put on the ground and left behind. They must accompany their rollers and rails. We will endeavor to explain, in simple words, how this is effected. To the axles of the locomotive is attached firmly a flat, vertical plate, parallel to the sides of the firebox. Pivoted to it, top and bottom, at their centers, are two horizontal rocking arms, and these have their extremities connected by two bow-shaped bars, or cams, their convex edges pointing outwards, away from the axle. Powerful springs also join the rocking arms, and tend to keep them in a horizontal position. Thus, we have a powerful frame, which can oscillate up and down at either end. The bottom arm is the rail on which the whole weight of the axle rests. The rotating and moving parts consist of a large, flat, circular case, the sides of which are a few inches apart. Its circumference is pierced by 14 openings, provided with guides to accommodate as many short siding spokes, which are in no way attached to the main axle. Each spoke is shaped somewhat like a tuning fork. In the V is a roller wheel, and at the tip is a ped, or foot. As the case revolves, the tuning fork spokes pass, as it were, with a leg on each side of the framework referred to above, the wheel of each spoke being the only part which comes into contact with the frame. Strong springs hold the spokes and rollers normally at an equal distance from the wheel's center. It must now be stated that the object of the framework is to thrust the rollers outwards as they approach the ground and slide them below the rail. The side pieces of the frame are, as will be noticed, see figure 3, eccentric, i.e. points on their surfaces are at different distances from the axle center. This is to meet the fact that the distance from the axle to the ground is greater in an oblique direction than it is vertically, and therefore, for three spokes to be carrying the weight at once, two of them must be more extended than the third. So then, a spoke is moved outward by the frame till its roller gets under the rail, and as it passes off it, it gradually slides inwards again. 
It will be obvious to the reader that, if the peds were attached inflexibly to the ends of their spokes, they would strike the ground at an angle and, of course, be badly strained. Now, Mr. Diplock meant his peds to be as like feet as possible and come down flat. He therefore furnished them with ankles, that is, ball and socket joints, so that they could move loosely on their spokes in all directions. And as such a contrivance must be protected from dust and dirt, the inventor produced what has been called a crustacean joint, on account of the resemblance it bears to the overlapping armor plates of a lobster's tail. The plates, which suggest very thin quoits, are made of copper and can be renewed at small cost when badly worn. An elastic spring collar at the top takes up all wear automatically and renders the plates noiseless. This detail cost its inventor much work. The first joint made represented an expenditure of six pounds. But now, thanks to automatic machinery, any number can be turned out at 3S, 6D each. A word about the feet. A wheel has 14 of these. They are 11 inches in diameter at the tread, and sold with rubber in eight segments, with strips of wood between the segments to prevent suction in clay soil. The segments are held together by a malleable cast iron ring around the periphery of the feet and a tightening core at the center. These wearing parts, being separate from the rest of the foot, are easily and cheaply renewed, and repairs can be quickly effected, if necessary, when on the road. The surface in contact with the ground being composed of the three substances, metal, wood, and rubber, which all take a bearing, provides a combination of materials adapted to the best adhesion and wear on any class of road, or even on no road at all. Motive power is transmitted by the machinery to the wheel axle, from that to the casing, from the casing to the sliding spokes. As there are alternately two and three feet simultaneously in contact with the ground, the power of adhesion is very great, much greater than that of an ordinary traction engine. This is what Professor Heel Shaw says in a report on a pedrail tractor. Quote, the weight of the engine is spread over no less than 12 feet, each one of which presses upon the ground with an area immensely greater, probably as much as 10 times greater, than that of all the wheels of an ordinary traction engine taken together on a hard road. Upon a soft road, all comparison between wheels and the action of these feet ceases, the contact of each of the feet of the pedrail is absolutely free from all slipping action and attains the absolute ideal of working, being merely placed in position without sliding to take up the load, and then lifted up again without any sliding to be carried to a new position on the road. End quote. It is necessary that the feet should come down flat on the ground. If they struck it at all edgeways, they would sprain their ankles, otherwise probably break off at the ball joint. Mechanism was, therefore, introduced by which the feet would be turned over as they approached the ground, and be held at the proper angle ready for the step. Without the aid of a special diagram, it would be difficult to explain in detail how this is managed. And it must suffice to say that the chief feature is a friction clutch worked by the roller of the foot's spoke. To the onlooker, the manner in which the pedrail crawls over obstacles is almost weird. The writer was shown a small working model of a pedrail propelled along a board covered with bits of cork, wood, etc. The axle of the wheel scarcely moved upwards at all. And had he not actually seen the obstacles, he would have been inclined to doubt their existence. 
an ordinary wheel of equal diameter took the obstructions with a series of bumps and bounds that made the contrast very striking. An extreme instance of the pedrail's capacity would be afforded by the ascent of a flight of steps, see figure 4. In such a case, the three peds carrying the weight of an axle would not be on the same level. That makes no difference because the frame merely tilts on its top and bottom pivots. The front of the rail rising to a higher level than the back end, and the back spokes being projected by the rail much further than those in front, so that the engine is simply levered over its rollers up an inclined plane. Similarly, in descending, the front spokes are thrust out the furthest, and the reverse action takes place. With so many moving parts, everything must be well lubricated, or the wear would soon become serious. The feet are kept properly greased by being filled with a mixture of black lead and grease of suitable quality, which requires renewal at long intervals only. The sliding spokes, rollers, and friction clutches are all lubricated from one central oil chamber through a beautiful system of oil tubes which provides a circulation of the oil throughout all the moving parts. The central oil chamber is filled from one orifice and holds a sufficient supply of oil for a long journey. We may now turn for a moment from the pedrail itself to the vehicles to which it is attached. Here, again, we are met by novelties, for in his engines, Mr. Diplock has so arranged matters that not only can both front and back pairs of wheels be used as drivers, but both also take part in the steering. As may be imagined, many difficulties had to be surmounted before this innovation was complete. But that it was worthwhile is evident from the small space in which a double steering tractor can turn, thanks to both its axles being movable, and from the increased power. Another important feature must also be noticed, viz. The axles can both tip vertically, so that when the front left wheel is higher than its fellow, the left back wheel may be lower than the right back wheel. In short, flexibility and power are the ideals which Mr. Diplock has striven to reach. How far he has been successful may be gathered from the reports of experts. Professor Heel Shaw, FRS, says, quote, The pedrail constitutes, in my belief, the successful solution of a walking machine which, whilst obviating the chief objections to the ordinary wheel running upon the road, can be made to travel anywhere where an ordinary wheel can go, and in many places where it cannot. At the same time, it has the mechanical advantages which have made the railway system such a phenomenal success. It constitutes, in my belief, the solution of one of the most difficult mechanical problems, and deserves to be considered as an invention quite apart from any particular means by which it is actuated, whether it is placed upon a self-propelled carriage or a vehicle drawn by any agency, mechanical or otherwise. The way in which all four wheels are driven simultaneously so as to give the maximum pulling effect by means of elastic connection is in itself sufficient to mark the engine as a most valuable departure from common practice. Hitherto, this driving of four wheels has never been successfully achieved, partly because of the difficulty of turning the steering wheels, and partly because, until the present invention of Mr. Diplock, the front and hind wheels would act against each other, a defect at first experienced and overcome by the inventor in his first engine. End quote. On January 8, 1902, Mr. Diplock tried an engine fitted with two ordinary wheels behind and two ped rails in front. The authority quoted above was present at the trials and his opinion will therefore be interesting. Quote, the points which struck me immediately were, one, 
the marvelous ease with which it started into action. 2. The little noise with which it worked. Another thing which I noticed was the difference in the behavior of the feet and wheels. The feet did not in any way seem to affect the surface of the road, throwing down large stones the size of the fist into their path the feet simply set themselves to an angle in passing over the stones and did not crush them whereas the wheel coming after invariably crushed the stones and moreover distorted the road surface coming to the top of the hill i made the pedrail walk first over three inch planks then six inch and finally over a nine inch bulk one could scarcely believe on witnessing these experiments that the whole structure was not permanently distorted and strained whereas it was evidently within the limits of play allowed by the mechanism as a proof of this the diplock engine walked down to the works and i then witnessed its ascent of a lane beside the engineering works which had ruts eight or ten inches deep and was a steep slope this lane was composed in places of the softest mud and whereas the wheels squeezed out the ground in all directions the feet of the pedrails set themselves at the angles of the rut where it was hard or walked through the soft and yielding mud without making the slightest disturbance of the surrounding ground i came away from that trial with the firm conviction that I had seen what I believed to be the dawn of a new era in mechanical transport. End quote. Mr. Diplock does not regard the pedrail as an end in itself so much as a means to an end, viz. the development of road-borne traffic. For very long distances, which must be covered in a minimum of time, the railway will hold its own. But there is a growing feeling that unless the railways can be fed by subsidiary methods of transport more effectively than at present, and unless remote county districts, whither it would not pay to carry even a light railway, are brought into closer touch with the busier parts, our communications cannot be considered satisfactory. And we are not getting the best value out of our roads. For many classes of goods, cheapness of transportation is of more importance than speed witness the fact that coal is so often sent by canal rather than by rail here then is the chance for the pedrail tractor and its long train of vehicles fitted with pedrail wheels which will tend to improve the road surfaces they travel over mr diplock sets out in his interesting book a new system of heavy goods transport on common roads, a scheme for collecting goods from branch routes onto main routes, where a number of cars will be coupled up and towed by powerful tractors. With ordinary four-wheeled trucks, it is difficult to take a number round a sharp corner, since each truck describes a more sudden circle than its predecessor the last often endeavoring to climb the pavement. Four-wheeled would therefore be replaced by two-wheeled trucks, provided with special couplings to prevent the cars tilting while allowing them to turn. Cars so connected would follow the same track round a curve. The body of the car would be removable and of a standard size. It could be attached to a simple horse frame for transport into the fields. There, the farmer would load his produce, and when the body was full, it would be returned to the road, picked up by a crane attached to the tractor, swung onto its carriage and wheels, and taken away to join the other cars. By making the bodies of such dimensions as to fit three into an ordinary railway truck, they could be entrained easily. On reaching their destination, another tractor would lift them out, fit them to wheels, and trundle them off to the consumer. By this method, there would be no breaking bulk of goods required from the time it was first loaded 
till it was exposed in the market for sale. These things are, of course, in the future. Of more present importance is the fact that the War Office has from the first taken great interest in the new invention, which promises to be of value for military transport over ground either rough or boggy. Trials have been made by the authorities with encouraging results. That daring writer, Mr. H. G. Wells, has in his Land Ironclads pictured the Pedrail taking an offensive part in warfare. Huge steel-plated forts mounted on Pedrails and full of heavy artillery and machine guns sweep slowly across the country towards where the enemy has entrenched himself. The forts are impervious, alike to shell and bullet. But as they cross ditch or hillock, in their gigantic stride, their artillery works havoc among their opponents, who are finally forced to an unconditional surrender. Even if the pedrail is not made to carry weapons of destruction, we can, after our experiences with horse flesh in the Boer War, understand how important it may become for commissariat purposes. The feats which it has already performed mark it as just the locomotive to tackle the rough country in which baggage trains often find themselves. To conclude with a more peaceful use for it, when fresh country is opened up, years must often pass before a proper high road can be made. Yet there is great need of an organized system of transport. Whether ordinary traction engines, or carts, even horses, could scarcely penetrate, the pedrail tractor, thanks to its big, flat feet, which give it, as someone has remarked, the appearance of, quote, a cross between a traction engine and an elephant, end quote, will be able to push its way at the forefront of advancing civilization. At home, we shall have good reason to welcome the pedrail if it frees us from those terrible corrugated tracks so dreaded by the cyclist, and to bless it if it actually beats our roads down into a greater smoothness than they now can boast. End of section 6section 7 of the romance of modern mechanism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tina ding the romance of modern mechanism by archbald williams chapter 6 Internal Combustion Engines Oil Engines Engines Worked with Producer Gas Blast Furnace Gas Engines If carbon and oxygen be made to combine chemically, the process is accompanied by the phenomenon called heat. If heat be applied to a liquid or gas, in a confined space, it causes a violent separation of its molecules, and power is developed. In the case of a steam engine, the fuel is coal, carbon in a more or less pure form, the fluid, water. By burning the fuel under a boiler, a gas is formed, which, if confined, rapidly increases the pressure on the walls of the confining vessel. If allowed to pass into a cylinder, the molecules of steam, struggling to get as far as possible from one another, will do useful work on a piston connected by rods to a revolving crank. We here see the combustion of fuel external to the cylinder that is under the boiler, and the fuel and fluid kept apart out of actual contact. In the gas or oil vapor engine, the fuel is brought into contact with the fluid, which does the work mixed with it and burnt inside the cylinder. 
Therefore, these engines are termed internal combustion engines. Supposing that a little gunpowder were placed in a cylinder, of which the piston had been pushed almost as far in as it would go, and that the powder were fired by electricity, the charcoal would unite with the oxygen contained in the saltpeter and form a large volume of gas. This gas, being heated by the ignition, would instantaneously expand and drive out the piston violently. A very similar thing happens at each explosion of an internal combustion engine. Into the cylinder is drawn a charge of gas containing carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, and also a proportion of air. This charge is squeezed by the inward movement of the piston, its temperature is raised by the compression, and at the proper moment it is ignited. The oxygen and carbon seize on one another and burn or combine, the heat being increased by the combustion of the hydrogen. The air atoms are expanded by the heat, and the work is done on the piston. But the explosion is much gentler than in the case of gunpowder. During recent years, the internal combustion engine has been making rapid progress, ousting steam power from many positions in which it once reigned supreme. We see it propelling vehicles along roads and rails, driving boats through the water, and doing duty in generating stations and smelting works to turn dynamos or drive air pumps not to mention the thousand other forms of usefulness, which, were they enumerated here, would fill several pages. A decade ago, an internal combustion engine of 100 horsepower was a wonder. Today, single engines are built to develop 3,000 horsepower, and in a few years, even this enormous capacity will doubtless be increased. It is interesting to note that the rival systems, gas and steam, were being experimented with at the same time by Robert Street and James Watt, respectively. While Watt applied his genius to the useful development of the power latent in boiling water, Street, in 1794, took out letters patent for an engine to be worked by the explosions caused by vaporizing spirits of turpentine on a hot metal surface, mixing the vapor with air in a cylinder, exploding the mixture, and using the explosion to move a piston. In his and subsequent designs, the mixture was pumped in from a separate cylinder under slight pressure. Lenoir, in 1860, conceived the idea of making the piston suck in the charge, so abolishing the need of a separate pump, and many engines built under his patents were long in use, though, if judged by modern standards, they were very wasteful of fuel. Two years later, Alphonse Baudy Rochus proposed the further improvement of utilizing the cylinder not only as a suction pump, but also as a compressor, since he saw that a compressed mixture would ignite very much more readily than one not under pressure. Rochus held the secret of success in his grasp, but failed to turn it to practical account. The Otto cycle, invented by Dr. Otto in 1876, is really only Rochus's suggestion materialized. The large majority of internal combustion engines employ this cycle of operations, so we may state its exact meaning. One, a mixture of explosive gas and air is drawn into the cylinder by the piston as it passes outwards, that is, in the direction of the crank, through the inlet valve. Two, 
The valve closes and the returning piston compresses the mixture. 3. The mixture is fired as the piston commences its second journey outwards and gives the power stroke. 4. The piston, returning again, ejects the exploded mixture through the outlet or exhaust valve, which began to open towards the end of the third stroke. Briefly stated, the cycle is suction, compression, explosion, expulsion, one impulse being given during each cycle, which occupies two complete revolutions of the flywheel. Since the first, second, and third operations all absorb energy, the wheel must be heavy enough to store sufficient momentum during the power stroke to carry the piston through all its three other duties. Year by year, the compression of the mixture has been increased and improvements have been made in the methods of governing the speed of the engine so that it may be suitable for work in which the load is constantly varying. By doubling, trebling, and quadrupling the cylinders, the drive is rendered more and more steady and the elasticity of a steam engine more nearly approached. The internal combustion engine has arrived so late because in the earlier part of last century, conditions were not favorable to its development. Illuminating gas had not come into general use, and such coal gas as was made was expensive. The great oil fields of America and Russia had not been discovered. But while the proper fuels for this type of motor were absent, coal, the food of the steam engine, lay ready to hand, and in forms which, though useless for many purposes, could be advantageously burnt under a boiler. Now the situation has altered. Gas is abundant, and oil of the right sort costs only a few pence a gallon. Inventors and manufacturers have grasped the opportunity. Today, over 3 million horsepower is developed continuously by the internal combustion engine. Steam would not have met so formidable a rival had not that rival had some great advantages to offer. What are these? Well, first enter a factory driven by steam power and carefully note what you see. Then visit a large gas or oil engine plant. You will conclude that the latter scores on many points. There are no stokers required, no boiler threaten possible explosions, the heat is less, the dust and dirt are less, the space occupied by the engines is less, there is no noisome smoke to be led away through tall and expensive chimneys. If work is stopped for an hour or a day, there are no fires to be banked or drawn, involving waste in either case. Above all, the gas engine is more efficient, or, if you like to express the same thing in other words, more economical. If you use only one horsepower for one hour a day, it doesn't much matter whether that horsepower hour costs four pennies or five pennies. But in a factory where a thousand horsepower is required all day long, the extra pence make a big total. If, therefore, the proprietor finds that a shilling's worth of gas or oil does a quarter as much work again, as a shilling's worth of coal, and that either form of fuel is easily obtained, you may be sure that, so far as economy is concerned, he will make up his mind without difficulty as to the class of engine to be employed. A pound of coal burnt under the best type of steam engine gives but 10% of its heating value in useful work. A good oil engine gives 20 to 25 percent, 
And in special types, the figures are set to rise to 35 to 40%. We may notice another point of this that while a steam engine must be kept as hot as possible to be efficient, an internal combustion engine must be cooled. In the former case, no advantage beyond increased efficiency results. But in the latter, the water passed round the cylinders to take up the surplus heat has a value for warming the building or for manufacturing processes. Putting one thing with another, experts agree that the explosion engine is the prime mover of the future. Steam has apparently been developed almost to its limit. Its rival is but half grown, though already a giant. Some internal combustion engines use petroleum as their fuel, converting it into gas before it is mixed with air to form the charge. Others use coal gas drawn from the lighting mains, poor gas made in special plants for power purposes, or natural gas issuing from the ground. Natural gas occurs in very large quantities in the United States, where it is conveyed through pipes under pressure for hundreds of miles and distributed among factories and houses for driving machinery, heating, and cooking. In England and Europe, the petroleum engine and coal gas engine have been most utilized, but of late, the employment of smelting furnace gases, formerly blown into the air and wasted, and of producer gas has come into great favor with manufacturers. The latest development is the suction gas engine, which makes its own gas by drawing steam and air through glowing fuel during the suction stroke. We will consider the various types under separate headings devoted 1. to the oil fuel engine, 2. the producer gas engine and the suction gas engine, 3. Blast furnace gas engines with reference to the installations used in connection with the last two. All explosion engines, excepting the very small types employed on motorcycles, have a water jacket round the cylinders to absorb some of the heat of combustion, which would otherwise render the metal so hot as to make proper lubrication impossible and also would unduly expand the incoming charge of gas and air before compression. The ideal engine would take in a full charge of cold mixture, which would receive no heat from the walls of the cylinder and during the explosion would pass no heat through the walls. In other words, the ideal metal for the cylinders would be one absolutely non-receptive of heat. In the absence of this, engineers are obliged to make a compromise and to keep the cylinder at such a temperature that it can be lubricated fittingly, while not becoming so cold as to absorb too much of the heat of the explosion. Oil engines. These fall into two main classes. A. Those using light, volatile mineral oils such as petrol and benzoline, and alcohol, a vegetable product. B. Those using heavy oils, such as paraffin oil, kerosene, and the denser constituents of rock oil left in the stills after the kerosene has been driven off. American petroleum is rich in burning oil and petrol. Russian in the very heavy residue called astakti, Given the proper apparatus for vaporization, mineral oils of any density can be used in the explosion engine. The first class is so well known as the mover of motor vehicles and boats that we need not linger here on it. It may, however, be remarked that engines using the easily vaporized oils are not of large powers since the fuel is too expensive to make them valuable for installations where large units of power are needed. 
They have been adopted for locomotives on account of their lightness and the ease with which they can be started. Petrol vaporizes at ordinary temperatures, so that air merely passed over the spirit absorbs sufficient vapor to form an explosive mixture. The jet carburetor, now generally employed, makes the mixture more positive by atomizing the spirit as it passes through a very fine nozzle into the mixing chamber under the suction from the cylinder. On account of their small size, spirit engines work at very high speeds as compared with a large oil or gas engine. Thus, while a 2,000 horsepower quartering gas engine develops full power at 85 revolutions a minute. The tiny cycle motor must be driven at 2,000 to 3,000 revolutions. Speaking generally, as the size increases, the speed decreases. Of heavy oil engines, there are some dozens of well-tried types. They differ in their methods of effecting the following operations. One, the feeding of the oil fuel to the engine. Two, the conversion of the oil into vapor. Three, the ignition of the charge. Four, the governing of speed. All these engines have a vaporizer or chamber wherein the oil is converted into gas by the action of heat. When starting up the engine, this chamber must be heated by a specially designed lamp similar in principle to that used by house painters for burning oat paint off wood or metal. Let us now consider the operations enumerated above in some detail. 1. The oil supply. Fuel is transferred from the storage tank to the vaporizer either by the action of gravity through a regulating device to prevent flooding, or by means of a small pump, or by the suction of the piston, which lifts the liquid. In some engines, the air and gas enter the cylinder through a single valve, in others through separate valves. 2. Vaporization As already remarked, the vaporizing chamber must be heated to start the engine. When work has begun, the lamp may be removed if the engine is so designed that the chamber stores up sufficient heat in its walls from each explosion to vaporize the charge for the next power stroke. The Crossley engine has a lamp continuously burning the Hornsby acroid depends upon the storage of heat from explosions in the chamber opening into the cylinder. The best designs are fairly equally divided between the two systems. 3. Ignition of the compressed charge is effected in one of four ways. By bringing the charge at the end of the compression stroke into contact with a closed tube projecting from the cylinder, and heated outside by a continuously burning lamp. By the heat stored in some part of the combustion chamber, that is that portion of the cylinder not swept by the piston. By an electric spark, or by the mere heat of compression. The second and third methods are confined to comparatively few makes and the diesel oil engine, of which more presently, has a monopoly of the fourth. 4. Governing All engines which turn machinery doing intermittent work, such as that of a sawmill or electric generating plant connected with a number of motors, must be very carefully guarded from overrunning. Imagine the effect on an engine which is putting out its whole strength and getting full charges of fuel if the belt suddenly slipped off and it were allowed its head. A burst flywheel would be only one of the results. 
the steam engine is easily controlled by the centrifugal action of a ball governor, which, as the speed increases, gradually spreads its balls and lifts a lever connected with a valve in the steam supply pipe. Owing to its elastic nature, steam will do useful work if admitted in small quantities to the cylinder. But a difficulty arises with the internal combustion engine if the supply of mixture is similarly throttled, because a loss of quantity means loss of compression and bad ignition. Many oil engines are therefore governed by apparatus which, when the speed exceeds a certain limit, cuts off the supply altogether, either by throwing the oil pump temporarily out of action or by lifting the exhaust valve so that the movement of the piston causes no suction, the hit and miss method as it is called. The means adopted depends on the design of the engine, and it must be said that, though all the devices commonly used effect their purpose, none are perfect, this being due rather to the nature of an internal explosion engine than to any lack of ingenuity on the part of inventors. The steadiest running is probably given with the throttle control which diminishes the supply. On motor cars, this method has practically ousted the hit and miss governed exhaust valve. But in stationary engines, we more commonly find the speed controlled by robbing the mixture of the explosive gas in inverse proportion to the amount of the work required from the engine. The diesel oil engine on account of some features peculiar to it, is treated separately. In 1901, an expert wrote of it that the engine has not attained any commercial position. Herr Rudolf Diesel, the inventor, has, however, won a high place for his prime mover among those which consume liquid fuel on account of its extraordinary economy. The makers claim, as the result of many tests, that with the crude rock oil costing in bulk about two pences a gallon, which it uses, a horsepower can be developed for one hour by this engine for one-tenth of a penny. The daily fuel bill for a 100 horsepower engine running 10 hours per day would therefore be eight shillings four pences. To compete with a diesel engine, a steam installation will have to be of the very highest class of triple expansion type of not less than 400 horsepower and using every hour per horsepower only one and three quarter pounds of coal at nine shillings per ton. Very few large steam engines work under conditions so favorable and with small sizes, three to four pounds of coal would be burned for every horsepower hour. The diesel differs from other internal combustion engines in the following respects. One, it works with very much higher compression. Two, the ignition is spontaneous, resulting from the high compression of the charge alone. Three, the fuel is not emitted into the cylinder until the power stroke begins and enters in the form of a fine spray. 4. The combustion of the fuel is much slower and therefore gives a more continuous and elastic push to the piston. The engine works on the ordinary auto cycle. To start it, Air compressed in a separate vessel is injected into the cylinder. The piston flies out and on its return squeezes the air to about 500 pounds to the square inch, thus rendering it incandescent. Just as the piston begins to move out again, a valve in the cylinder head opens and a jet of pulverized oil is squirted in by air compressed to 100 pounds per square inch, more than the pressure in the cylinder. 
the vapor meeting the hot air burns, but comparatively slowly. The pressure in the cylinder during the stroke decreasing much more gradually than in other engines. Governing is effected by regulation of the amount of oil admitted into the cylinder. In spite of its high compression, this engine runs with very little vibration. The writer saw a penny stand unmoved on its edge on the top of a cylinder in which the piston was reciprocating 500 times a minute. Engines worked by producer gas. These engines are worked by a special gas generated in an apparatus called a producer. If air is forced through incandescent carbon in a closed furnace, its oxygen unites with the carbon and forms carbonic acid gas, known chemically as CO2. Because every molecule of the gas contains one atom of carbon and two of oxygen. This gas, being the product of combustion, cannot burn, that is, combine with more oxygen, but as it passes up through the glowing coke, coal, or other fuel, it absorbs another carbon atom into every molecule, and we have C2O2 or 2CO, which we know as carbon monoxide. This gas may be seen burning on the top of an open fire with a very pale blue flame as it once more combines with oxygen to form carbonic acid gas. The carbon monoxide is valuable as a heating agent and, when mixed with air, forms an explosive mixture. If along with the air sent into our furnace, there goes a proportion of steam, further chemical action results. The oxygen of the steam combines with carbon to form carbon monoxide and sets free the hydrogen. The latter gas, when it combines with oxygen in combustion, causes intense heat so that if from the furnace we can draw off carbon monoxide and hydrogen, we shall be able to get a mixture which during combustion will set up great heat in the cylinder of an engine. In 1878, Mr. Emerson Dawson invented an apparatus for manufacturing a gas suitable for power plant the gas being known as producer or poor gas, the last term referring to its poorness in hydrogen as compared with coal and other gases. While the hydrogen is a desirable ingredient in an explosive charge, it must not form a large proportion since under compression it renders the mixture in which it takes part dangerously combustible and liable to spontaneous ignition before the piston has finished the compression stroke. Water gas, very rich in hydrogen, and made by a very similar process, is therefore not suitable for internal combustion engines. There are many types of producers, but they fall under two main heads, that is, the pressure and the suction. The pressure producer contains the following essential parts. The generator, a vertical furnace fed from the top through an airtight trap and shut off below from the outside atmosphere by having its foot immersed in water. Any fuel or ashes which fall through the bars into the water can be abstracted without spoiling the drought. Air and steam are forced into the generator and pass up through the fuel with the chemical results already described. The gases then flow into a cooler enclosed in a water jacket through which water circulates and on into a scrubber where they must find their way upwards through coke kept dripping with water from overhead jets. The water collects impurities of all sorts, and the gas is then ready for storage in the gas holders or for immediate use in the engines. 
A pound of anthracite coal, thus burnt, will yield enough gas to develop one horsepower for one hour. Suction gas plants. With these, gas is not stored in larger quantities than are needed for the immediate work of the engine. In fact, the engine itself, during its suction strokes, draws air and steam through a very small furnace, coolers, and scrubbers. Direct into the cylinder, the furnace is therefore fed with air and water, not by pressure from outside, but by suction from inside. Hence the name suction producer. At the present time, suction gas engines are being built for use on ships, since a pound of fuel thus consumed will drive a vessel further than if burnt under a steam boiler. Very possibly. The big ocean liners of 20 years, hence, may be fitted with such engines in the place of the triple and quadruple expansion steam machinery now doing the work. Blast furnace gas engines. Every iron blast furnace is very similar in construction and action to the generator of a producer gas plant. Into it are fed through a hopper. Situated in the top, layers of ore, coal, or coke, and limestone. At the bottom enters a blast of air heated by passing through a stove of fire brick raised to a high temperature by the carbon monoxide gas coming off from the furnace. When the stove has been well heated, the gas supply is shut off from it. And switched to the engine house to create power for driving the huge blowers. The gas contains practically no hydrogen, as the air sent through the furnace is dry. But since it will stand high compression, it is very suitable for use in large engines. Formerly, all the gas from the furnace was expelled into the open air and absolutely wasted. Then it was utilized to heat the forced draught to the furnace. Next, to burn under boilers, and last of all, at the suggestion of Mr. B. H. Thrate, to operate internal combustion engines for blowing purposes. Thus, in the fitness of things, we now see the biggest gas engines in the world installed where gas is created in the largest quantities. And an interesting cycle of action results: the engine pumps the air, the air blows the furnace and melts the iron out of the ore. The furnace creates the gas, the gas heats the air or works the engines to pump more air. So engines and furnace mutually help each other instead of all the obligation being on the one side. When a few years ago the method was first introduced, engines were damaged by the presence of dust carried with the gas from the furnace. Mr. B. H. Thrait has, however, perfected means for the separation of injurious matter, and blast furnace gas is coming into general use in England and on the continent. Some idea of the power which has been going to waste in ironworks for decades past may be gathered from a report of Professor Hubert after experiments made in 1900. He says that engines of large size do not use more than 100 cubic feet of average blast furnace gas per effective horsepower hour. Which is less than one fourth of the consumption of gas required to develop the same power from boilers and good modern condensing steam engines, so that there is an immense surplus of power to be obtained from a blast furnace if the blowing engines are worked by the gas it generates. A surplus which can be still further increased if the gas is properly cleaned. It is estimated that for every 100 tons of coke used in an ordinary Cleveland blast furnace, after making ample allowance for gas for the stoves and power for the lifts, pumps, etc., and for gas for working the necessary blowing engines, 
there is a surplus of at least 1,500 horsepower so that by economizing gas by cleaning and developing the necessary power by gas engines, every furnace owner would have a very large surplus of power for his steel or other works or for selling in the form of electricity or otherwise. Yet all this gas had been formerly turned loose for the breezes to warm their fingers at. Truly, as an observant writer has recorded, the sight of a special plant being put up near a blast furnace to manufacture gas for the blowing engines suggests the pumping of water uphill in order to get water power. Messrs. Westgarth and Richardson of Middlesbrough, the John Cockerill Company of Saran, Belgium, and the Delevergne Company of New York are among the chief makers of the largest gas engines in the world, ranging up to 3,750 horsepower each. These immense engines, some with flywheels 30 feet in diameter and cylinders spacious enough for a man to stand erect in, work blowers for furnaces or drive dynamos. At the works of the manufacturers mentioned, the engines helped to make the steel and turn the machinery for the creation of brother monsters. This use of a byproduct of industry is remarkable, but it can be paralleled. Furnace slag, once cast away as useless, is now recognized to be a valuable manure or is converted into bricks, tiles, cement, and other building materials. Again, the former waste from the coal gas purifier assumes importance as the origin of aniline dyes, creosote, saccharine, ammonia, and oils. We really appear to be within sight of the happy time when waste will be unknown, and it therefore is curious that we still burn gas as an illuminant when the same, if made to work an engine, would give more lighting power in the shape of electric current supplying incandescent lamps. End of section 7. Section 8 of The Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Seidel. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 7. Motor Cars. The Motor Omnibus. Railway Motor Cars. The development of the motor car has been phenomenal. Early in 1896, the only mechanically moved vehicles to be seen on our roads were the traction engine, preceded by a man bearing a red flag, the steamroller, and, in the towns, a few trams. Today the motor is apparent everywhere, dodging through street traffic, or raising the dust of country roads and lanes, or lumbering along with its load of merchandise at a steady gait. As a purely speed machine, the motor car has practically reached its limit. With a hundred horsepower or more crowded into a vehicle scaling only a ton, the record rate of travel has approached two miles in a minute on specially prepared and peculiarly suitable tracks. Even up steep hills, such a monster will career at nearly 80 miles an hour. Next to the racing car comes the touring car, engined to give 60 miles an hour on the level in the more powerful types, or a much lower speed in the car intended for quieter travel and for people who are not prepared to face a big bill for upkeep. The luxury of the age has invaded the design of automobiles till the gorgeously decorated and comfortably furnished pullman of the railway has found a counterpart in the motor caravan with its accommodation for sleeping and feeding. While the town dweller rolls along an electric landale, screened from wind and weather, the tourist may explore the roads of the world well housed and lolling at ease behind the windows of his 2,000 guinea machine on which the engineer and carriage builder have lavished their utmost skill. 
the taunt of unreliability once leveled and with justice at the motor car is fast losing its force owing to the vast improvements in design and details which manufacturers have been stimulated to make the motor car industry has a great future before it and the prizes therein are such as to tempt both inventor and engineer every week scores of patents are granted for devices which aim at the perfection of some part of a car its tires its wheels or its engines until standard types for all grades of motor vehicles have been established this restless flow of ideas will continue its volume is the most striking proof of the vitality of the industry the uses to which the motor vehicle has been put are legion on railways the motor carriage is catering for local traffic on the roads the motor omnibus is steadily increasing its numbers tradesmen of all sorts and persons concerned with the distribution of commodities find that the petrol or steam moved car or lorry has very decided advantages over horse traction our postal authorities have adopted the motor mail van the war office looks to the motor to solve some of its transportation difficulties in short the motor age has arrived which will relatively to the railway age play much the same part as that epoch did to the horse age at the ultimate effects of the change we can only guess but we see already in the great acceleration of travel wherever the motor is employed that many social institutions are about to be revolutionized but for the determined opposition in the thirties of the last century to the steam omnibus we should doubtless live today in a very different manner our population would be scattered more broadcast over the country instead of being herded in huge towns many railways would have remained unbuilt but our roads would be kept in much better condition special tracks having been built for the rapid travel of the motor we have only to look to a country now in the course of development to see that the road which leads everywhere will in combination with the motor vehicle eventually supplant or at any rate render unnecessary the costly network of railways which must be a network of very fine mesh to meet the needs of a civilized community in the scope of a few pages it is impossible to cover even a tithe of the field occupied by the ubiquitous motor car and we must therefore restrict ourselves to a glance at the manufacture of its mechanism and a few short excursions into those developments which promise most to alter our modes of life we will begin with a trip over one of the largest motor factories in the world selecting that of messrs dion and bouton whose names are inseparable from the history of the modern motor car they may justly claim that to deal with the origin rise and progress of the huge business which they have built up would be to give an account in its general lines of all the phases through which the motor especially the petrol motor has passed from its crudest shape to its present state of comparative perfection the count albert de dion was in his earlier days little concerned with things mechanical he turned rather to the fashionable pursuit of dueling in which he seems to have made a name but he was not a man to waste his life in such inanities and when one day he was walking down the paris boulevards his attention was riveted by a little clockwork carriage exposed for sale among other new year's gifts that moment was fraught with great consequences for an inventive mind had found a proper scope for its energy why thought he could not real cars be made to run by some better form of motive power on inquiring he learnt that the workman named bouton had produced the car the count therefore sought the artisan with whom he worked out the problem which had now become his aim in life hence it is that the names dion bouton are found on thousands of engines all over the world the partners scored their first successes with steam and petrol driven tricycles built in a small workshop in the avenue malakoff in paris the works were then transferred to Puteaux, which has since developed into the great automobile center of the world, and after two more changes found a resting place on the Quai Nationale. Here, close to 3,000 hands are engaged in supplying the world's requirements in motors and cars. Let us enter the huge block of buildings and watch them at work. The drawing office is the brain of the factory. 
Within its walls, new ideas are being put into practical shape by skilled draftsmen. The drawings are sent to the model-making shop, where the parts are first fashioned in wood. The shop contains dozens of big benches, circular saws, and planing machines, one of them in the form of a revolving drum carrying a number of planes, which turns thousands of times a minute and shapes off the rough surface of the blocks of hardwood as if it were so much clay. These blocks are cut, planed, and turned, and then put into the hands of a remarkably skilled class of workmen, who, with rule, caliper, and chisel, shape out cylinders and other parts to the drawings before them with wonderful patience and exactness. After the model has been fashioned, the next step is to make a clay mold from the same, with a hole in the top through which the molten metal is poured. The foundry is most picturesque in a lurid, Rembrandt-esque fashion. It is black everywhere. The floor, walls, and roof are black, and the foundry hands look like unwashed penitents in sackcloth and ashes. At the end of the building there is a raised brickwork, and when the visitor is able to see in the darkness, he distinguishes a number of raised lids along the top, while here and there are strewn about huge iron ladles like buckets. On the foreman giving the word, a man steps up on the brickwork and removes the lid when a column of intense white light strikes upward. It gives one the impression of coming from the bowels of the earth, like a hole opening out in a volcano. The man bestrides the aperture, down which he drops the ladle at the end of a long pole, and then pulling it up again full of straw-colored shining liquid, so close to him that we shudder at the idea of it spilling over his legs and feet. He pours the molten metal into a big ladle, which is seized by two men who pour the liquid into the molds. The work is more difficult than it looks, for it requires a lot of practice to fill the molds in such a way as to avoid blowholes and flaws that prove such a serious item in foundry practice. In the case hardening department, next door, there are six huge ovens with sliding fronts. Therein are set parts which have been forged or machined, and are subjected to a high temperature while covered in charcoal so that the skin of the metal may absorb carbon at high temperatures and become extremely tough. All shafts, gears, and other moving parts of a car are subjected to this treatment, which permits a considerable reduction in the weight of metal used and greatly increases its resistance to wear. After being carbonized, the material is tempered by immersion in water while of a certain heat, judged by the color of the hot metal. We now pass to the turning shop, where the cylinders are bored out by a grinding disc rapidly rotating on an eccentric shaft, which is gradually advanced through the cylinder as it revolves. The utmost accuracy to the one ten thousandth part of an inch is necessary in this operation, since the bore must be perfectly cylindrical and also of standard size, so that any standard piston may exactly fit it. After being bored, or rather ground, the walls of the cylinder are highly polished, and the article is ready for testing. The workman entrusted with this task hermetically closes the ends by inserting the cylinder between the plates of an hydraulic press and pumps in water to a required pressure. If there be the slightest crack, crevice, or hole, the water finds its way through, and the piece is condemned to the rubbish heap. In the motor room are scores of cylinders, crankcases, and gears ready for finishing. Here the outside of bored cylinders is touched up by files to remove any marks and rough projections left by the molds. The crankcases of aluminum are taken in hand by men who chisel the edges where the two halves fit, chipping off the metal with wonderful skill and precision. The edges are then ground smooth, and after the halves have been accurately fitted, the holes for the bolts connecting them are drilled in a special machine which presents a drill to each hole in succession. Having seen the various operations which a cylinder has to go through, we pass into another shop given up to long lines of benches where various motor parts are being completed. Each piece, however small, is treated as of the utmost importance since the failure of even a tiny pin may bring the largest car to a standstill. We see a man testing pump discs against a standard template to prove their absolute accuracy. Close by, another man is finishing a flywheel, 
chipping off specks of metal to make the balance true. We now understand that machine tools cannot utterly displace the human hand and eye. The fitters, with touches of the file, remove matter in such minute quantities that its removal might seem of no consequence, but matter in the wrong place is the cause of many breakdowns. We should naturally expect that engines cast from the same pattern, handled by the same machines, finished by the same men, would give identical results. But as two bicycles of similar make will run differently, so do engines of one type develop peculiarities. The motors are therefore taken into a testing room and bolted to two rows of benches, forty at a time. Here they run under power for long periods, creating a deafening uproar until all parts work sweetly. The power of the engines is tested by harnessing them to dynamos and noting the amount of current developed at a certain speed. We might linger in the departments where accumulators, sparking plugs, and other parts of the electrical apparatus of a car are made, or in the laboratory where chemists pry into the results of a new alloy aided by powerful microscopes and marvelously delicate scales. But we will stop only to note the powerful machine which is stretching and crushing metal to ascertain its toughness. No care in experimenting is spared. The chemist, poring over his test tubes, plays as important a part in the construction of a car as the foundry man or the turner. The machine shop is an object lesson among the tools noted in previous chapters of this book. Here is a huge planing machine traveling to and fro over a copper bar. A crankshaft has been cut out of solid steel by boring holes close together through the thick plate, and the two sides of the plate have been broken off, leaving the rough shaft with its edges composed of a considerable number of semicircles. The shaft is slowly rotated on a lathe, and tiny clouds of smoke arise as the tool nicks off pieces of metal to reduce the shaft to a circular shape. Other machines, with high-speed tool steel, are finishing gear shafts. Flywheels are being turned and worm shafts cut. All these laborious operations are carried out by the machines, each under the control of one man whose mind is intent upon the work, ready to stop the machine or adjust the material as may be required. As a contrast to the heavy machines, we will pass to the light automatic tools which are grouped in a gallery. The eye is bewildered by the moving mass, but the whirling of the pulley shafts and the clicking of the capstan lathes is soothing to the ear, while the mind is greatly impressed by the ingenuity of man in suppressing labor by means of machines, of which half a dozen can be easily looked after by one hand, who has nothing to do but see that they are fed with material. A rod of steel is put into a machine, and the turret, with half a dozen different tools, presents first one and then the other to the end of the rod bathed in thick oil, so that it is rapidly turned, bored, and shaped into caps, nuts, bolts, and scores of other little accessories required in fitting up a motor car. On seeing how all this work is done mechanically and methodically, with scarcely any other expense but the capital required in the upkeep of the machines and in driving them, one wonders how the automobile industry could be carried on without this labor-saving mechanism. In any event, if all these little pieces had to be turned out by hand, it is certain that the cost of the motor car would be considerably more than it is, even if it did not reach to such a figure as to make it prohibitive to all but wealthy buyers. Down one side of the gallery, the machines are engaged in cutting gears with so much precision that, when tested by turning them together on pins on a bench at the end of the gallery, it is very rare indeed that any one of them is found defective. The installation of automatic tools is one of the largest of its kind in the motor car works, if not in any engineering shop, and each one has been carefully selected in view of its efficiency for particular classes of work so that we see machines from America, England, France, and Germany. In the fitting shops, the multitude of parts are assembled to form the chassis, or mechanical carriage of the car, to which, in a separate shop, is added the body for the accommodation of passengers. The whole is painted and carefully varnished after it has been out on the road for trials to discover any weak spots in its anatomy. Then the car is ready for sale. When one considers the racketing that a high-powered car has to stand, and the high speed of its moving parts, 
one can understand why those parts must be made so carefully and precisely, and also how this care must conduce to the expense of the finished article. It has been said that it is easy to make a good watch, but difficult to make a good motor, for though they both require an equal amount of exactitude and skill, the latter has to stand much more wear in proportion. When you look at a first-grade car bearing a great maker's name, you have under your eyes one of the most wonderful pieces of mechanism the world can show. We will not leave the De Dion Bolton works without a further glance at the human element. The company never have a slack time, and consequently can employ the same number of people all the year around. They pride themselves on the fact that the great majority of the men have been in their employ for several years, with the result that they have around them a class of workmen who are steady, reliable, and above all, skillful in the particular work they are engaged upon. There are more than 2,600 men, and about a 100 women, these latter being employed chiefly in the manufacture of sparking plugs and in other departments where there is no night work. They are mostly the wives or widows of old workmen, and in thus finding employment for them, the firm provides for those who would otherwise be left without resource, and at the same time, earns the gratitude of their employees. Note, the author gratefully acknowledges the help given by Messrs. de Dionboton Limited in providing the materials for this account of their work. The Motor Omnibus Prior to the emancipation of the road automobile in 1896, permission had been granted to corporations to run trams driven by mechanical power through towns. The steam tram, its engine protected by a case which hid the machinery from the view of restive horses, panted up and down our streets, drawing one or more vehicles behind it. The electric tram presently came over from America and soon established its superiority to the steamer with respect to speed, freedom from smell and smoke, and noiselessness. The system generally adopted was that invented in 1887 by Frank J. Sprague, in which an overhead cable supported on posts or slung from wires spanning the track carries current to a trolley arm projecting from the vehicle. The return current passes through the rails, which are made electrically continuous by having their individual lengths either welded together or joined by metal strips. In America, where wide streets and rapidly growing cities are the rule, the electric tramway serves very useful ends, the best proof of its utility being the total mileage of the tracks. Statistics for 1902 show that since 1890, the mileage has increased from 1,261 to 21,920 miles, and the number of passengers carried from 2,023,010,202 to 4,813,466,001, or an increase of 137.94%. It is interesting to note that electricity has, in the United States, almost completely ousted steam and animal traction so far as streetcars are concerned. Since the 5,661 miles once served by animal power have dwindled to 259, and steam can claim only 169 miles of track. Next to the United States comes Germany as a user of electricity for tractive purposes. Though she is a very bad second with only about 6,000 miles of track, and England takes third place with about 3,000 miles. That the British Isles, so well provided with railways, should be so poorly equipped with tramways, is comprehensible when we consider the narrowness of the streets of our largest towns, where a good service of public vehicles is most needed. The installation of a tram line necessitates the tearing up of a street, and in many cases the closing of that street to traffic. We can hardly imagine the dislocation of businesses that would result from such a blockage of, say, the Strand and High Holborn. But since it has been calculated that no less than five millions of pounds sterling are lost to our great metropolis yearly by the obstructions of gas, water, telegraph, and telephone operations, which only partially close a thoroughfare, or by the relaying of the road surface, which is not a very lengthy matter if properly conducted, we might reckon the financial loss resulting from the laying of tram mails at many millions. Even were they laid, 
the trouble would not cease, for a tram is confined to its track and cannot make way for other traffic. Thus, inadaptability has been the cause of the great outcry lately raised against the way in which tramline companies have monopolized the main streets and approaches to many of our largest towns. While the electric tram is beneficial to a large class of people as a cheap method of locomotion between home and business, it sadly handicaps all owners of vehicles vexatiously delayed by the tram. At Brentford, to take a notorious example, the double tram line so completely fills the high street that it is at places impossible for a cart or carriage to remain at the curbstone. Another charge leveled, with justice, at the tram line is that the rails in their setting are dangerous to cyclists, motorcycles, and even heavy vehicles, especially in wet weather, when the side-slip demon becomes a real terror. English municipalities are therefore faced by a serious problem. Improved locomotion is necessary. How can it best be provided? By smooth-running, luxurious, well-lighted electric trams, traveling over a track laid at great expense, and a continual nuisance to a large section of the community? Or by vehicles independent of a central source of power and free to move in any direction according to the needs of traffic. Where tramways exist, those responsible for laying them at the rate of several thousand pounds per mile are naturally reluctant to abandon them. But where the fixed track has not yet arrived, an alternative method of transport is open, to wit, the automobile omnibus. Quite recently, we have seen in London and other towns a great increase in the number of motor buses, which often ply far out into the country. From the point of speed, they are very superior to the horsed vehicle, and statistics show that they are also less costly to run in proportion to the fares carried, while passengers will unanimously acknowledge their greater comfort. To change from the ancient, rattling, two-horse conveyance, which jolts us on rough roads and occasionally sends a thrill up the spine when the brakes are applied, to the roomy, steam, or petrol-driven bus, which overtakes and threads its way through the slower traffic, is a pleasant experience. So the motor buses are crowded, while the horse rivals on the same route trundle along half-empty. Since the one class of vehicle can travel at an average pace of ten miles an hour, as against the four miles an hour of the other, no wonder that this should be so. Even if the running costs of a motor bus for a given distance exceed that of an electric tram, we must remember that, whereas a bus runs on already existing roads, an immense amount of capital must be sunk in laying the track for the tram, and the interest on this sum has to be added to the total running costs. The next decade will probably decide whether automobiles or trams are to serve the needs of the community in districts where at present no efficient service of any kind exists. In London, motor buses are being placed on the roads by scores, and the day cannot be far distant when the horse will disappear from the bus as it is already fast vanishing from the front of the tram. Both petrol and steam, and in some cases a combination of petrol and electricity, are used to propel the motor bus. It has not yet been decided which form of power yields the best results. Petrol is probably the cheapest fuel, but steam gives the quieter running, and could electric storage batteries be made sufficiently light and durable, they would have a strong claim to precedence. There has lately appeared a new form of accumulator, the von Rothmann, which promises well, since weight for weight it far exceeds in capacity any other type and is so constructed that it will stand a lot of rough usage. A car fitted with a von Rothmann battery, scaling about 1,500 pounds, has run 200 miles on one charge, and it is anticipated that with improvements in motors, a 1,100-pound battery will readily be run 150 miles, as against the 50 miles in the case of a lead battery of equal weight. There is a large sphere open to the motor bus outside districts where the electric tram would enter into serious competition with it. We have before us a sketch map of the Great Western Railway, one of the most enterprising systems with regard to its use of motors to feed its rails. No less than 30 road services are in operation, 
and their number is being steadily augmented. In fact, it looks as if in the near future the motor service will largely supplant the branch railway blessed with very few trains a day. A motor bus service plying every half hour between town and the nearest important mainline station would be more valuable to the inhabitants than half a dozen trains a day, especially if the passenger vehicles were supplemented by lorries for the carriage of luggage and heavy goods. In this connection, we may notice an invention of M. Renard, a motor train of several vehicles towed by a single engine. We have all seen the traction engine puffing along with its tail of trucks, and been impressed by the weight of the locomotive and also by the manner in which the train occupies a road when passing a corner. The weight is necessary to give sufficient grip to move the whole train, while the spreading of the vehicles across the thoroughfare on a curve arises from the fact that each vehicle does not follow the path of that preceding it, but describes part of a smaller circle. M. Renaud has, in his motor train, evaded the need for a heavy tractor by providing every vehicle with a pair of driving wheels and transmitting the power to those wheels by a special flexible propeller shaft which passes from the powerful motor on the leading vehicle under all the other vehicles engaging in succession with mechanism attached to all the driving axles. In this matter, each car yields its quotum of adhesion for its own propulsion, and the necessity for great weight is obviated. Special couplings ensure that the path taken by the tractor shall be faithfully followed by all its followers. A motor train of this description has traveled from Paris to Berlin and drawn to itself a great deal of attention. Will it, asks a writer in the world's work, ultimately displace the conventional traction engine and its heavy trailing wagons? Every municipality and county council is only too painfully cognizant of the dire effects upon the roads exercised by the cumbrous wheels of these unwieldy locomotives and trains. With a Renard train, however, the trailing coaches can be of light construction, carried on ordinary wheels which do not cut up or otherwise damage the roadway surface. Many other advantages inherent in such a train might be enumerated. The most important, however, are the flexibility of the whole train, its complete control, faster speed without any attendant danger, its remarkable braking arrangements as afforded by the continuous propeller shaft gearing directly with the driving wheels of each carriage, its low cost of maintenance, serviceability, and instant use, and the reduction in the number of men required for the attention of the train while on a journey. Were the system a success, it would find plenty of scope to convey passengers and commodities through districts too sparsely populated to render a railway profitable. People would talk about traveling or sending goods by the 1030 motor train, just as we now speak of the 1115 to town. As a carrier and distributor of mails, the motor van has already established a position. To quote but a couple of instances, there are the services between London and Brighton and Liverpool and Manchester. In the Isle of Wight, motor omnibuses connect all the principal towns and villages. Each bus is a traveling post office in which, by an arrangement with the postmaster general, anybody may post letters at recognized stopping places or wherever the vehicle is halted for any purpose. In Paris, London, Berlin, the motor mail van is a common sight. It has even penetrated the interior of India, where the Maharaja of Gwalior uses a specially fitted steam car for the delivery of his private mails. And, as though to show that man alone shall not profit by the new mode of locomotion, Paris owns a motor car which conveys lost dogs from the different police station to the dog's home. In fact, there seems to be no purpose to which a horse-drawn vehicle can be put which either has not been, or shortly will be, invaded by the motor. Railway Motor Cars In the early days of railway construction, Vehicles were used which combined a steam locomotive with an ordinary passenger carriage. After being abandoned for many years, the steam carriage was revived in 1902 by the London and South Western and Great Western Railways for local service and the handling of passenger traffic on branch lines. Since that year, rail motor cars have multiplied, 
some being run by steam, others by petrol engines, and others, again, by electricity generated by petrol engines. The first class we need not describe in any detail, as it presents no features of peculiar interest. The Northeastern has had in use two rail motors, each 52 feet long, with a compartment at each end for the driver, and a central saloon to carry 52 passengers. An 80-horsepower, four-cylinder, Wolseley petrol motor drives a Westinghouse electric generator, which sends current to a couple of 55-horsepower electric motors geared to the running wheels. An air compressor, fitted to the rear bogey, supplies the Westinghouse air brakes, while in addition a powerful electric brake is fitted, acting on the rails as well as the wheels. The coach scales 35 tons. The chief advantage of this composite system of power transmission is that the engine is kept running at a constant speed, while the power it develops at the electric motors is regulated by switches which control the action of the armature and field magnets. When heavy work must be done, the engine is supplied with more gaseous mixture, and the generators are so operated as to develop full power. In this manner, all the variable speed gears and clutches necessary when the petrol motor is connected to the driving wheels are done away with. The latter system gives, however, greater economy of fuel, and the Great Northern Railway has adopted it in preference to the petrol electric. This railway has many small branch lines running through thinly populated districts, which, though important as feeders of the main tracks, are often worked at a loss. A satisfactory type of automobile carriage would not only avoid this loss, but also largely prevent the competition of road motors. The car should be powerful enough to draw an extra van or two on occasion, since horses and heavy luggage may sometimes accompany the passengers. Messrs. Dick, Care and Company have built a car which, when loaded with its complement of passengers, weighs about 16 tons. The motive power is supplied by two four-cylinder petrol engines of the Daimler type, each giving 36 horsepower. These are suspended on a special frame, independent of that which carries the coach body, so that the passengers are not troubled by the vibration of the engines, even when the vehicle is at rest. The great feature of the car is the lightness of the machinery only two tons in weight, though it develops sufficient power to move the carriage at 50 miles per hour. After traveling 2,000 miles, the machinery showed no appreciable signs of wear, so that the company considers that it has found a reliable type of motor for the working of the short line between Hatfield and Hertford. Since one man can drive a petrol car, while two, a driver and a stoker, are necessary on a steam car, a considerable reduction in wages will result from the employment of these vehicles. Engineers find motor trolleys very convenient for inspecting the lines under their care. On the London and Southwestern Railway, a trolley driven by a six to eight horsepower engine and provided with a change gear giving six, fifteen, and thirty miles per hour in either direction is at work. It seats four persons. In the colonies, notably in South Africa, where coal and wood fuel is scarce or expensive, the motor trolley capable of carrying petrol for 300 miles travel is rapidly gaining ground among railway inspectors. Makers are turning their attention to petrol shunting engines, useful in goods yards, mines, sewerage works. Firms such as Messrs. Maudsley & Company of Coventry, the Woolsey Tool and Motor Car Company, Messrs. Panhard and Levasseur, Messrs. Kerr, Stewart, and Company have brought out locomotives of this kind which will draw loads of up to 60 tons. The fact that a petrol engine is ready for work at a moment's notice, and when idle is not eating its head off, and has no furnace or boiler to require attention, is very much in its favor where comparatively light loads have to be hauled. End of section 8「Section 9 of the Romance of Modern Mechanism」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding The Romance of Modern Mechanism 
by Archibald Williams. Chapter Eight: The Motor Afloat, Part One. Pleasure boats, motor lifeboats, motor fishing boats, a motor fire float, the mechanism of the motor boat, the two-stroke motor, motor boats for the navy. Having made such conquests on land and rendered possible aerial feats, which could scarcely have been performed by steam, the explosion motor further vindicates its versatility by its fine exploits in the water. At the Paris Exhibition of 1889, Gottlieb Daimler, the inventor who made the petrol engine commercially valuable as an aid to locomotion, showed a small gas-driven boat. Which, by most visitors to the exhibition, was mistaken for an ordinary steam launch, and attracted little interest. Not deterred by this want of appreciation, Mr. Daimler continued to perfect the idea, for which, with a prophet's eye, he saw great possibilities. And soon, motor launches became a fairly common sight on German rivers. They were received with some enthusiasm in the United States, as being particularly suitable for the inland lakes and waterways with which that country is so abundantly blessed, but met with small recognition from the English, who might reasonably have been expected to take great interest in any new nautical invention. Now, however, English manufacturers have awaked fully to their error. And on all sides, we see boats built by firms competing for the lead in an industry which, in a few years' time, may reach colossal proportions. Until quite recently, the marine motor was a small affair, developing only a few horsepower. But because the gas engine for automobile work had been so vastly improved in the last decade. It attracted notice as a rival to steam for driving launches and pleasure boats, and soon asserted itself as a reliable mover of vessels of considerable size. To promote the development of the industry, to test the endurance of the machine, and to show the weak spots of mechanical design, trials and races were organized on much the same lines as those. Which have kept the motor car so prominently before the public, races in the Solent, across the Channel, and across the Mediterranean. The speed, as in the case of cars, has risen very rapidly with a motor boat. When, in February 1905, a Napier racer did some trial spins over the Major Mile in the Thames at Long Beach. She attained 28.57 miles per hour on the first run. On turning, the tide was favorable, and the figures rose to 30.93 miles per hour, while the third improved on this by over a mile. Her mean speed was 29.925 miles per hour, or about two thirds miles per hour better than the previous record standing, to the credit of the American challenger. The latter had, however, the still waters of a lake for her venue, so that the Napier's performance was actually even more credible than the mere figures would seem to imply. At the luncheon which concluded the trial, Mr. Yarrow, who had built the steel hull, said, "To give an idea of what an advance the adoption of the internal combustion engine really represents, I shall like to state that." If we were asked to guarantee the best speed we could with a boat of the size of Napier II, fitted with the latest form of steam machinery of as reliable a character as the internal combustion engine in the present boat, we should not like to name more than sixteen knots. So that it may be taken that the adoption of the internal combustion engine in place of the steam engine. For a vessel of this size, really represents an additional speed of ten knots an hour. I should here point out that the speed of a vessel increases rapidly with its size. For example, in what is termed a second-class torpedo boat, 
60 feet in length. The best speed we could obtain would be 20 knots. But for a vessel of, say, 200 feet in length, with similar but proportionately larger machinery, a speed of 30 knots could be obtained. Therefore, the obtaining of a speed of practically 26 knots in the Yarrow Napier boat, only 40 feet in length, points to the possibility in the not far distant future of propelling a vessel 220 feet in length at even 45 knots per hour. All that remains to be done is to perfect the internal combustion engine so as to enable large sizes to be successfully made. Boats of 300 horsepower and upwards are being built, and the project has been mooted of holding a transatlantic race open to motorboats of all sizes, which should be quite self-contained and able to carry sufficient fuel to make the passage without taking in fresh supplies. In view of the perils that would be risked by all but large craft, and in consideration of the prejudice the motorboats might incur in event of any fatalities, the Automobile Club of France set its face against the venture, and it fell through. It is possible, however, that the scheme may be revived as soon as larger motorboats are afloat, since the Atlantic has actually been crossed by a craft of 12 horsepower, measuring only 40 feet at the waterline. This happened in 1902, when Captain Newman and his son, a boy 12 years old, started from New York and made Falmouth Harbor after 30 days of anxious travel over the uncertain and sometimes tempestuous ocean. The boat, named the Abayo Abelo carried auxiliary sails of small size and was not by any means built for such a voyage. The engine, a two-cylinder, burned kerosene. Captain Newman received 1,000 pounds from the New York Kerosene Oil Engine Company for his feat. The money was well earned, though provided with proper navigating instruments, which he knew how to use well. Newman had a hard time of it to keep his craft afloat, his watches sometimes lasting two days on end when the weather was bad. Yet the brave pair won through, and probably even more welcome than the sense of success achieved and the reward gained was the long two days sleep which they were able to get on reaching Falmouth Harbor. Pleasure Boats we may now consider the pleasure and commercial uses of the motorboat and marine motor. As a means of recreation, a small dinghy driven by a low-powered engine offers great possibilities. Its cost is low, its upkeep small, and its handiness very great. Already, a number of such craft are furrowing the surface of the Thames, saying, Rhine, and many other rivers in Europe and America. While racing craft are for the wealthy alone, many individuals of the class known as the men of moderate means do not mind putting down 70 pounds to 100 pounds for a neat boat, the maintenance of which is not nearly so serious a matter as that of a small car. Tire troubles have no counterpart afloat, the marine motor dispenses with change gears, water being a much more yielding medium than Mother Earth. The shocks of starting and stopping are not much as to strain machinery. Then again, the cooling of the cylinders is a simple matter with an unlimited amount of water, almost washing the engine. And as the surface of water does not run uphill, a small motor will show to better advantage on the river than on the road. Thus, a five-horsepower car will not conveniently carry more than two people if it is expected to climb slopes at more than a crawl. A fixed motor of equal power to a boat which accommodates half a dozen persons, and it will move them all along at a smart pace as compared with the rate of travel given by oars. After all, on the river one does not want to travel fast. 
rather to avoid the hard labor which rowing undoubtedly does become with a craft roomy enough to be comfortable for a party. The marine motor also scores under the heading of adaptability. A wagonette could not be converted into a motor car with any success, but a good-sized rowboat may easily blossom out as a useful self-propelled boat. You may buy complete apparatus, motor, tanks, screw, batteries, etc., for clamping direct onto the stern, and there you are, a motor boat while you wait. Even more sudden still is the conversion effected by the motogodi, which may be described as a motor screw and rudder in one. The makers are the Bouchette Company, a well-known French firm. Engine and carburetor, petrol tank, coil, accumulator, lubricating oil reservoir, exhaust box, propeller shaft, and propeller with guard are all provided so that the outfit requires no additional accessories. For mounting in position at the stern of the boat, the complete set is balanced on a standard and carries a steering arm on which the tanks are mounted, and also the stern tube and propeller guard which are in one solid piece in addition to the engine. In order that no balancing feats shall be required of the person in charge, there is on the supporting standard a quadrant in the notches of which a lever on the engine frame engages, thus allowing the rigid framework and therefore the propeller shaft to be maintained at any angle to the vertical without trouble. The two horsepower engine drives a boat 16 feet long by 4 feet 6 inches beam at 6.5 miles per hour through still water. As the motor can be swerved to right or left on its standard, it acts as a very efficient rudder while its action takes no way off the boat. For people who like an easy life on hot summer days, reclining on soft cushions and peeping up through the branches which overhand picturesque streams, there is the motor punt which can move in water so shallow that it would strand even a rowboat. The Oxford undergraduate of tomorrow will explore the leafy recesses of the share, not with a long pole laboriously raised and pushed aft, but by the power of a snug little motor throbbing gently at the stern. And on the open river, we shall see the steam launch replaced by craft having much better accommodation for passengers while free from the dirt and smells which are inseparable from the use of steam power. The petrol launch will rival the electric in spaciousness and the steamer in its speed and power, size for size. Some people have an antipathy to this new form of river locomotion on account of the risks which accompany the presence of petrol. Were a motor launch to ignite in, say, Bolter's Lock on a summer Sunday, or at the Henley Regatta, there might indeed be a catastrophe. The same danger has before now been flaunted in the face of the automobilist on land. Yet cases of the accidental ignition of cars are very, very rare, and on the water would be more rare still, because the tanks can be more easily examined for leaks. Still, it behoves every owner of a launch to keep his eye very widely open for leakage, because any escaping liquid would create a collection of gas in the bottom of the boat from which it could not escape, like the gas forming from drops spilled on the road. The future popularity of the motorboat is assured. The waterside dweller will find it invaluable as a means of carrying him to other parts of the stream. The longshoreman will be able to venture much further out to sea than he could, while he depended on muscles or wind alone, and with much greater certainty of returning up to time. A whole network of waterways intersects civilized countries, often far better kept than the roads, offering fresh fields for the tourists to conquer.
River scenery and beautiful scenery more often than not go together. The car or cycle may be able to follow the course of a stream from source to mouth. Yet, this is the exception rather than the rule. We shoot over the stream in a train or on our machines. Note that it looks picturesque, wonder vaguely whither it flows and whence it comes, and continue our journey, reckoning little of the charming sights to be seen by anyone who would trust himself to the water. Hitherto, the great difficulty has been one of locomotion. In a narrow stream, sailing is generally out of the question. Haulage by men or beast becomes tedious, even if possible. And rowing day after day presupposes a good physical condition. In the motorboat, the holiday maker has an ideal craft. It occupies little room, can carry fuel sufficient for long distances, is unwearying and is economical as regards its running expenses. We ought not to be surprised, therefore, if in a few years the jaded businessman turns as naturally to a spin or trip on the rivers and canals of his country as he now turns to his car and a rush over the dusty highway. Then we'll begin another era for the disused canal the vegetation choked stream, and our maps will pay more attention to the paths which nature has water worn in the course of the ages. To the scientific explorer, also the motor affords valuable help. Many countries in which roads are practically non existent can boast fine rivers fed by innumerable streams. What fields of adventure, sport, and science? would be open to the possessor of a fast launch on the Amazon, the Congo, the Mackenzie, or the Orinoco, provided only that he could occasionally replenish his fuel tanks. Motor lifeboats. Turning to the more serious side of life, we find the marine motor still much in evidence. On account of its comparatively short existence, it is at present only in the experimental stage in many applications, and time must pass before its position is fully established. Take, for instance, the motor lifeboat lately built for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Here are encountered difficulties of a kind very different from those of a racing craft. A lifeboat is most valuable in rough weather which means more or less water often coming aboard. If the water reached the machinery, troubles with the electrical ignition apparatus would result. So the motor must be enclosed in a watertight compartment. And if so enclosed, it must be specially reliable. Also, since a lifeboat sometimes upsets, the machinery needs to be so disposed as not to interfere with her self-writing qualities. The list might easily be extended. An account of the first motor lifesaver will interest breeders. So we once again have recourse to the chief authority on such topics, the motor boat for particulars. The boat selected for experiment was an old one, formerly stationed at Folkestone, measuring 38 feet long by 8 feet beam, pulling 12 oars, double-banked, and of the usual self-riding type, rigged with jib, forelug, and mizzen. After she had been hauled up in Mr. Guy's yard, where some of the air cases under the deck midships were taken out, a strong mahogany case measuring 4 feet long by 3 feet wide and as high as the gunwales, lined with sheet copper so as to be watertight, with a close-fitting lid which could be easily removed on shore, was fitted in place, and the whole of the vital parts of the machinery comprising a two-cylinder motor of 10 horsepower, together with all the necessary pumps, carburetor, electric equipment, etc., were fitted inside this case. The engine drives a three-bladed propeller through a long shaft with a disconnecting clutch between, 
so that for starting and stopping temporarily, the screw can be disconnected from the engine. The petrol, which serves as fuel for the engine, is carried in a metal tank stored away inside the forward end box, where it is beyond any possibility of accidental damage. Sufficient fuel for a continuous run of over 10 hours is carried. The engine is started by a handle fitted on the foreside of the case, which can be worked by two men. The position and size of the engine case is such that only two oars are interfered with, but it does not follow that the propelling power of the two displaced men is entirely lost because they can double bank some of the other oars when necessary. Fitted thus, the lifeboat was tested in all sorts of weather during the month of April, and it was found that she could be driven fairly well against a sea by means of the motor alone, but when it was used to assist the sails, the true use of the motor as an auxiliary became apparent, and the boat would work to windward in a way previously unattainable. Neither the pitching or rolling in the seaway, in any weather then obtainable, interfered at all with the proper working or starting of the motor, which worked steadily and well throughout. Having been through these preliminary tests, she was more severely tried, running over the measured mile with full crew and stores on board. She developed over six knots an hour. The men were then replaced by equivalent weights lashed to the throats, and she was capsized by a crane four times, her sails set and the sheets made fast, yet she righted herself without difficulty. An interesting feature of the capsize was that the motor stopped automatically when the boat had partly turned over. This arrangement prevents her from running away from the crew if they should be pitched out. The motor started again after a few turns of the handle so proving that the protecting compartment had kept the water at bay. From this account, it is obvious that a valuable aid to life-saving at sea has been found. The steam lifeboat propelled by a jet of water squirted out by pumps below the water line is satisfactory so long as the boat keeps upright. But in event of an upset, the fires must necessarily be extinguished no such disability attends the petrol-driven craft, and we shall be glad to think that the brave fellows who risk their lives in the cause of humanity will be spared the intense physical toil which a long roll to windward in the heavy sea entails. The general adoption of this new ally will take time and must depend largely on the liberality of subscribers to the fine institution responsible for lifeboat maintenance. But it is satisfactory to learn that the committee has given the boat in question a practical chance in the open sea by stationing her at New Haven, Sussex as a unit in the lifeboat fleet. End of section nine. Section 10 of the Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 8, The Motor Afloat, Part 2. Motor Fishing Boats. It is a pretty sight to watch a fishing fleet enter the harbor with its catch, taken far away on the waters beyond the horizon while landsmen slept. The sails, some white, some brown, some wondrously patched, and bearing the visible marks of many a hard fight with the wind, bally out in graceful lines as the boats slip past the harbor entrance. No wonder that the painter has so often found subjects for his canvas and brushes among the toilers of the deep. But underlying the romance and picturesqueness of the craft, there is stern business. 
Those boats may be returning with full cargoes, such as will yield good profits to owner and crew, or, on the other hand, the hold may be empty, and many honest hearts be heavy at the thought of wasted days. A few years ago, the Yarmouth Herring Fleet is said to have returned on one occasion with but a single fish to the credit of the whole fleet. This might have been a mere figure of speech. It stands, at any rate, for many thousands of pounds lost by the hardy fishermen. When the boats have been made fast, the fish, if already disentangled from the nets, is usually sold at once by auction. The price depending largely on the individual size and freshness of the catch. Now, with the increase in the number of boats and from other causes, the waters near home have been so well fished over that much longer journeys must be made to the grounds than were formerly necessary. Trawling, that is, dragging a large bag net, its mouth kept open by a beam and weights, along the bottom of the sea for flatfish, has long been performed by powerful steam vessels, which may any day be seen leaving or entering Hull or Grimsby in large numbers. Surface fishing, wherein a long drift net weighted at its lower edge and buoyed at the upper edge to enable it to keep a perpendicular position, is used for herring and mackerel, and in this industry, wind power alone is generally used by British fishermen. The herring boat set sail for the grounds in the morning and at sundown should be at the scene of action. Her nets, aggregating perhaps a mile in length, are then shot, and the boat drifts along, towing the line behind her. If fish appear, the nets are hauled in soon after daybreak by the aid of a capstan. The labor of bringing a mile of nets aboard is very severe. So severe, in fact, that the larger boats in many cases employ the help of a small steam engine. During the return voyage, the fish is freed from the meshes and thrown into the hold ready for sale as soon as land is reached. Fish, whether for salting or immediate consumption, should be fresh. No class of human food seems to deteriorate so quickly when life is extinct as the denizens of the deep, so that it is of primary importance to fishermen that their homeward journey should be performed in the shortest possible time. If winds are contrary or absent, there may be such delay as to need the liberal use of salt, and even that useful commodity will not stave off a fall in value. It therefore often happens that a really fine catch arrives at its market in a condition which spells heavy loss to the catchers. A slow return also means missing a day's fishing, which may represent 200 pounds to 300 pounds. For this reason, the Dogger Bank fishing fleet is served by steam tenders, which carry off the catches as they are made and thus obviate the necessity for a boat's return to port when its hold is full. Such a system will not, however, be profitable to boats owned by individuals and working within a comparatively short distance of land. Each boat must depend on its particular powers, the first to return getting rather better prices than those which come with a crowd. So, steam power is in some cases installed as an auxiliary to the sales, though it may entail the outlay of £2,000 as first cost and a big bill for upkeep and management. Small men cannot afford this expense, and they would be doomed to watch their richer brethren slip into the market before them had not the explosion motor come to their aid. This just meets their case. It is not nearly so expensive to install as steam, occupies much less room, is easier to handle, and therefore saves the expense of trained attendants. Fishermen are notoriously conservative. To them, a change from methods sanctioned by many years of practice is abhorrent. 
What sufficed for their fathers, they say, should suffice for them. Their trade is so uncertain that a bad season would see no return for the cost of the motor, since where no fish are caught, it makes little difference whether the journey to port be quick or slow. However, the motor is bound to come. It has been applied to fishing boats with marked success. While the nets are out, the motor is stopped and costs not a penny more till the time comes for hauling in. Then it is geared up with a capstan and saves the crew much of their hardest work. When all is aboard, the capstan hands over the power to the screw, which, together with the sails, propels the vessel homewards at a smart pace. The skipper is certain of making land in good time for the market, and he will be ready for the out voyage next morning. Another point in favor of the motor is that when storms blow up, the fleet will be able to run for shelter, even if the wind be adverse and we should hear less of the sacrifice of life, which makes sad reading after each severe gale. As to the machinery to be employed, Mr. F. Miller of Olton Broad, who first applied the gas motor to a fishing smack, the Pioneer, considers that a 12-horsepower engine would suffice as an auxiliary for a small craft of the class found in the northern parts of Great Britain. The Norfolk boats would require a 30-horsepower and a full-powered boat, that is one that could depend on the motor entirely, should carry a three-cylinder engine of 80 horsepower. In any case, the machinery must be enclosed and well protected, while the lubrication arrangements should be such as to be understood easily by unskilled persons and absolutely reliable. Owing to the moisture in the atmosphere, the ordinary high-tension coil ignition, such as is used on most motor cars, would not prove efficient and it is therefore replaced by a low-tension type which makes and breaks the primary circuit by means of a rocking arm working through the walls of the cylinder. Lastly, all parts which require occasional examination or adjustment must be easily accessible so that they may receive proper attention at sea and not send the vessel home a lame duck under sail. The advantages of the motor are so great that the Scotch authorities have taken the matter up seriously, appointing an expert to make inquiries. It is therefore quite possible that before many years have elapsed, the motor will play an important part in the task of supplying our breakfast tables with a dainty sole or toothsome herring. A Motor Fire Float as a good instance of this particular adaptation of the explosion engine to fire extension work, we may quote the apparatus now in attendance on the huge factory of Messrs. Huntley and Palmer, the famous reading biscuit makers. The factory lies along the banks of the River Kennet, which are joined by bridges so close to the water that a steamer could not pass under them. Messrs. Merriweather accordingly built the motor float, 32 feet long, 9.5 feet beam, and drawing 27 inches. Two engines, each having four cylinders of a total of 30 horsepower, drive two sets of three-cylinder Hatfield pumps, which give a continuous feed to the hose. Engines and pumps are mounted on a single bed plate, and are worked separately unless it be found advisable to Siamese the hoses to feed a single one and a half inch jet, which can be flung to a great height. One of the most interesting features of the float is the method of propulsion. As its movements are limited to a few hundred yards, the fitting of a screw was considered unnecessary, its place being taken by four jets two at each end, through which water is forced against the outside water by the extinguishing pumps. These will move the float either forward or astern, steer her or turn her around. So here once again, petrol has trotten upon the toes of giant steam, and very effectively too. 
The mechanism of the motor boat. In many points, the marine motor reproduces the machinery built into cars. The valve arrangements, governors, design of cylinders, and water jackets are practically the same. Small boats carry one cylinder or perhaps two, just as a small car is content with the same number. But a racing or heavy boat employs four, six, and in one case, at least 12 cylinders, which abolish all dead points and enable the screw to work very slowly without engine vibration as the drive is continuous. The large marine motor is designed to run at a slower rate than the land motor, and its cylinders are therefore of greater size. Some of the cylinders exhibited in the automobile show at the London Olympia seemed enormous when compared with those doing duty on even high-powered cars, being more suggestive of the parts of an electric lighting plant than of a machine which has to be tucked away in a boat, except for the reversing gear. Gearing is generally absent on the motorboat. The chauffeur has not to keep changing his speed lever from one notch to another according to the nature of the country. On the sea, conditions are more consistently favorable or unfavorable, and as in the steamboat, speed is controlled by opening or closing the throttle. The screw will always be turned by the machinery, but its effect on the boat must depend on its size and the forces acting in opposition to it. Since water is yielding, it does not offer a parallel to the road. Should a car meet a hill too steep for its climbing powers, the engines must come to rest. The wheel does not slip on the road, and so long as there is sufficient power, it will force the car up the severest incline. As soon as the power proves too small for the task in hand, the car lies down. In a motorboat, however, the engine may keep the screw moving without doing more against wind and tide than prevent the boat from advancing backwards. The only way to make the boat efficient to meet all possible conditions will be to increase the size or alter the pitch of the screw and to install more powerful engines. Gearing down, as in the motor car being useless, the only mechanism needed on the motorboat in connection with the transmission of power from cylinders to screw is the reversing gear. Though engines have been designed with devices for reversing by means of the cams operating the valves, the reversal of the screw's movement is generally effected through gears on the transmission apparatus. The simplest arrangement, though not the most perfect mechanically, is a reversible screw, the blades of which can be made to feather this way or that by the movement of a lever. Sometimes two screws are employed with opposite twists, the one doing duty while the other revolves idly. But for fast and heavy boats, a single solid screw with immovable blades is undoubtedly preferable its reversal being effected by means of friction clutches. The inelasticity of the explosion motor renders it necessary that the change be made gradually, or the kick of the screw against the motor might cause breakages. The clutch, gradually engaging with a disc revolved by the propeller shaft, first stops the antagonistic motion and then converts it into similar motion. Many devices have been invented to bring this about, but as a description of them would not be interesting, we pass on to a consideration of the fuel used in the motorboat. Petrol has the upper hand at present, yet heavier oil must eventually prevail on account both of its cheapness and of its greater safety. The only objection to its use is the difficulty attending the starting of the engine with kerosene, and this is met by using petrol till the engine and carburetor are hot, and then switching on the petroleum. 
when once the carburetor has been warmed by exhaust gases to about 270 degrees Fahrenheit, it will work as well with the heavy as with the light fuel. Since any oil or spirit may leak from its tanks and cause danger, an effort has been made to substitute solid for liquid fuel. The substance selected is naphthalene, well known as a protector of clothes against moths. At the Olympia Automotive Exhibition of 1905, the writer saw an engine, the Chenier Leon, which had been run with balls of this chemical fed to the carburetor through a melting pot. For a description of this engine, we must once again have recourse to the motorboat. The inventors had decided to test its performance with petrol, paraffin, and naphthalene, respectively. The motor, screwed to a testing bench, was connected by the usual belt to a dynamo so that the power developed under each variety of fuel might be electrically measured and was then started up on petrol. As soon as the parts were sufficiently warmed up by the exhaust heat, the petrol was turned off and the motor run for some time on paraffin until sufficient naphthalene was thoroughly melted to the consistency of a thick syrup. The naphthalene was then fed to its mixing valve through a small pipe dipping into the bottom of the melting pot and then sprayed into the induction chamber to carburate the air therein. Hitherto, the motor had given an average of 12 electrical horsepower at 1,000 revolutions per minute and it was noticed that as soon as the change was made, this was fully maintained. This test, when continued, bore out others which had previously been made by the firm and showed the consumption of each of the three fuels to be a little over 12 pounds per hour for the 12 electrical horsepower given by the motor. Still, the paraffin and naphthalene worked out about as equal as to cost, and considering that the latter was in its purest form, as sold for a close preservative, we have yet to see how much better its commercial showing will be with lower grades, assuming beforehand that its thermal efficiency and behavior are as good. On the ground of convenience, naphthalene as a solid is a very long way in front of its liquid rival, kerosene. Its exhaust, too, was much freer from odor, and it appears that, unlike paraffin, it forms neither tar, soot, nor sticky matter, but, on the contrary, has a tendency to brighten all valves, cylinders, walls, etc., any little deposit being a light powder, which would be carried into the exhaust. The two-stroke motor in the ordinary auto cycle motor, an explosion occurs once in every two revolutions of the crank. With a single cylinder, the energy of the explosion must be stored up in a heavy flywheel to carry the engine through the three other operations of scavenging, sucking in a fresh charge, and compressing it preparatory to the next explosion. With two cylinders, the flywheel can be made lighter as an explosion occurs every revolution. And in a four-cylinder engine, we might almost dispense with the wheel altogether, since the drive is continuous, just as in the double-cylindered steam engine. The two-stroke motor, that is one which makes an explosion for every revolution, is an attempt to unite the advantages of a two-cylindered engine of the auto type with the lightness of a single-cylindered engine. As it has been largely used for motorboats, especially in America, a short description of its working may be given here. In the first place, all moving cylinder valves are done away with, their functions being performed by openings covered and opened by the movements of the piston. The crank chamber is quite gas tight and has in it a non-return valve through which vapor is drawn from the carburetor every time the piston moves away from the center. 
There is also pipe connecting it with the lower part of the cylinder, but the other end of this is covered by the piston until it has all but finished its stroke. Let us suppose that an explosion has just taken place. The piston rushes downwards, compressing the gas in the crank chamber to some extent. When the stroke is three parts performed, a second hole on the opposite side of the cylinder from the aperture already referred to is uncovered by the piston and the exploded gases partly escape. Immediately afterwards, the second hole is uncovered also, and the fresh charge rushes in from the crankcase, being deflected upwards by a plate on the top of the piston so as to help drive out the exhaust products. The returning piston covers both holes and compresses the charge till the moment of explosion when the process is repeated. It may be said in favor of this type of engine that it is very simple and free from vibration. Against it that, owing to the imperfect scavenging of exploded charges, it does not develop so much power as an auto cycle engine of equal cylinder dimensions. Also that it is apt to overheat while it uses double the amount of electric current. Motor boats for the Navy. A country which, like England, depends on the command of the sea for its very existence, may well keep a sharp eye on any invention that tends to render that command more certain. In recent years, we have heard a lot said, and read a lot written, about the importance of swift boats which in wartime could be launched against a hostile fleet armed with a deadly torpedo. The Russo-Japanese War has given us a fine example of what can be accomplished by daring men and swift torpedo craft. For some reason or other, the British Navy has not kept abreast of friends in the number of her torpedo vessels. Reference to official figures shows that while our neighbors can boast 280 hornets, we have to our credit only 225. In the House of Commons, on August 10, 1904, Mr. Henry Norman, MP, asked the Secretary of the Admiralty whether, in view of the proofs recently afforded of trustworthiness, speed, simplicity, and comparatively low cost of small vessels propelled by petrol motors, he would consider the advisability of testing this class of vessel in His Majesty's Navy. The secretary replied that the Admiralty had kept a watch on the recent trials and meant to make practical tests with motor pinnaces. In view of the danger that would accompany the storage of petrol on board ship, the paraffin motor was preferable for naval purposes, and an 80-horsepower four-cylindered motor of this type has been ordered from Messrs. Vosper of Portsmouth. Mr. Norman, writing in The World's Work on the subject, says, There can be no question that such high speed and cheap construction, 80 horsepower giving in the little boat as much speed, to consider that only, as 8,000 in the big boat, point to the use of motorboats for naval purposes in the near future. A torpedo boat exists only to carry one or two torpedoes within launching distance of the enemy. The smaller and cheaper she can be, and the fewer men she carries, provided always she be able to face a fairly rough sea, the better. Now the ordinary steam torpedo boat carries perhaps 20 men and costs anything from 50,000 to 100,000 pounds. A motorboat of equal or greater speed could probably be built for 15,000 pounds and would carry a crew of two men. Six motorboats, therefore, could be built for the cost of one steamboat, and their total crews would not number so many as the crew of the one. Moreover, they could all be slung on board a single vessel and only set afloat near the scene of action. A prophetic friend of mine declares that 
the most dangerous warship of the future will be a big vessel, unarmored and only lightly armed, but of the utmost possible speed, carrying 20 or more motor torpedo boats slung on davits. She will rely on her greater speed for her own safety, if attacked. She will approach as near the scene of action as possible, and will drop all her little boats into the water, and they will make a simultaneous attack. Their hulls will be clean, their machinery in perfect order, their crews fresh and full of energy, and it would be strange if one of the twenty did not strike home. And the destruction of a battleship or great cruiser at the cost of a score of these little wasps, manned by two score men, would be a very fine naval bargain. Mr. Norman omits one recommendation that must in active service count heavily in favor of the motorboat, and that is its practical invisibility in the day or at night time. The destroyer, when traveling at high speed, betrays its presence by clouds of smoke or red-hot funnels. The motorboat is entirely free from such dangerous accompaniments. The exhaust from the cylinders is invisible in every way. The very absence of funnels must also be in itself a great advantage. The eye roving over the waters might easily pick up a series of stumpy black objects of hard outline. But the motorboat, riding low and flatly on the waves, would probably escape notice, especially when a searchlight alone can detect its approach. It may reasonably be said that the Admiralty knows its own business best, and that the outsider's opinion is not wanted. The man in the street has become notorious for his paper generalship and strategy, and fallen somewhat into disrepute as an advisor on military and naval matters. Yet we must not forget this, that many, we might say most, of the advances in naval mechanisms, armor, and weapons of defense have not been evolved by naval men, but by the highly educated and ingenious civilian who, unblinded by president or professional conservatism, can watch the game even better in some aspects than the players themselves and see what the next move should be. That move may be rather unorthodox, like the application of steam to men of war, but nonetheless the correct one under the circumstances. We allowed other nations to lead us in the matter of breech-loading cannon, armor plate, submarines, the abolition of combustible material on warships? Shall we also allow them to get ahead with motorboats and begin to consider that there may be something in motor auxiliaries for the fleet when they are already well supplied? If there is a country which should, above all others, lose no time in adding the motor to her means of defense, that country is Great Britain. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams Chapter 9 The Motorcycle In 1884, the Count de Dion, working in partnership with Messrs Bouton and Trepardu, produced a practical steam tricycle. Two years later appeared a somewhat similar vehicle by the same makers, which attained the remarkable speed of 40 miles an hour. Monsieur Serpolet, now famous for his steam cars, built at about the same time a three-wheeled steam tricycle, which also proved successful. But the continuous stoking of the miniature boilers and the difficulty of keeping them properly supplied with water prevented the steam-driven cycle from becoming popular. In 
and when the petrol motor had proved its value on heavy vehicles inventors soon saw that the explosion engine was very much better suited for a light automobile than had been the cumbrous fittings inseparable from the employment of steam by eighteen ninety five a neat petrol tricycle was on the market and after the d d on machines had given proof in races of their capabilities they at once sprang into popular favour for the next five years the motor tricycle was a common sight in france where the excellent roads and the freedom from the restrictions prevailing on the other side of the channel recommended it to cyclists who wished for a more speedy method of locomotion than unaided legs could give yet could not afford to purchase a car the motor bicycle soon appeared in the field the earlier types of the two-wheeled motor were naturally clumsy and inefficient the need of a lamp constantly burning to ignite the charges in the cylinder proved a much greater nuisance on the bicycle than on the tricycle which carried its driving gear behind the saddle the writer well remembers trying an early pattern of the Werner motor bicycle in the Champs Elysees in eighteen ninety seven, and his alarm when the owner, while starting the blow lamp on the steering pillar, was suddenly enveloped in flames, which played havoc with his hair and might easily have caused more serious injuries riders were naturally nervous at carrying a flame near the handlebars so close to a tank of inflammable petrol liable to leak and catch fire the advent of electrical ignition for the gaseous charges opened the way for great improvements and the motor bicycle slowly but surely ousted its heavier three-wheeled rival designs were altered the engine was placed in or below the frame instead of over the front wheel and made to drive the back wheel by means of a leather belt in the earliest types the motive force had either been transmitted by belt to the front wheel or directly to the rear wheel by the piston rods working cranks on its spindle the progress of the motor bicycle has since nineteen hundred been rapid and many thousands of machines are now in use the fact that the engines must necessarily be very small compels all possible saving in weight and an ability to run continuously at very high speeds without showing serious wear and tear details have therefore been perfected and though at the present day no motor cyclist of wide experience can claim immunity from trouble with his speedy little mount a really well designed and well built machine proves wonderfully efficient and opens possibilities of locomotion to the man of moderate means which were beyond the reach of the rider of a pedal driven bicycle in its way the motorcycle may claim to be one of the most marvellous products of human mechanical skill weight has been reduced until a power equal to that of three horses can be harnessed to a vehicle which when stored with sufficient petrol and electricity to carry it and rider one hundred and fifty miles scales about a hundred weight it will pursue its even course up and down hill at an average of twenty or more miles an hour the only attention it requires being an occasional charge of oil squirted into the airtight case in which the crank and flywheels revolve the consumption of fuel is ridiculously small since an economical engine will cover fifteen miles on a pint of spirit which costs about three halfpence practically all motorcycle engines work on the auto cycle principle 
motors which give an impulse every revolution by compressing the charge in the crankcase or in a separate cylinder so that it may enter the working cylinder under pressure have been tried but hitherto with but moderate success there is however a growing tendency to compass an explosion every revolution by fitting two cylinders and from time to time four-cylindered cycles have appeared the disadvantages attending the care and adjustment of so many moving parts has been the cause of four-cylindered cycle motors being unsuccessful from a commercial standpoint though riders who are prepared to risk extra trouble and expense may find compensation in the quiet vibrationless drive of a motor which gives two impulses for every turn of the flywheel the acme of lightness in proportion to power developed has been attained by the barry engine in which the cylinders and their attachments are made to revolve about a fixed crank and perform themselves the function of a flywheel so great is the saving of weight that the makers claim a horsepower for every four pounds scaled by their engines thus a three and a half horsepower motor would only just tip the beam against one stone as the writer has personally inspected a barry engine he is able to give a brief account of its action it has two cylinders arranged to face one another on opposite sides of a central airtight crankcase the inner end of each cylinder opening into the case both pistons advance towards and recede from the centre of the case simultaneously the air gas mixture is admitted into the crankcase through a hole in the fixed crank spindle communicating with a pipe leading from the carburettor the inlet is controlled by a valve which opens while the pistons are parting and closes when they approach one another we will suppose that the engine is just starting the pistons are in a position nearest to the crankcase as they separate they draw a charge equal in volume to double the cubical contents of one cylinder into the crankcase through its inlet valve during the return stroke the charge is squeezed and passes through a valve into a chamber which forms as it were the fourth spoke of a four-spoked wheel of which the other three spokes are the cylinders and the silencer this chamber is connected by pipes to the inlet valve of the cylinders which are mechanically opened alternately by the action of special cams on the crankshaft the cylinder which gets the contents of the compression chamber receives considerably more mixture than would flow in under natural suction and the compression is therefore greater than in the ordinary type of cycle motor and the explosion more violent hence it comes about that the cylinders which have a bore of only two inches and a two inch stroke for the piston developed nearly two horsepower each it may at first appear rather mysterious how if the cranks are rigidly attached to the cycle frame any motion can be imparted to the driving wheel the explanation is simple enough a belt pulley is affixed to one side of the crankcase and revolves with the cylinders the silencer and compression chamber the rotation is caused by the effort of the piston to get as far as possible away from the closed end of the cylinder after an explosion where a crank is movable but the cylinder fixed the former would be turned round where the crank is immovable but the cylinder movable the travel of the piston is possible only if the cylinder moves round the crank a series of explosions following one another in rapid succession 
gives the moving parts of the barry engine sufficient momentum to suck in charges compress them and eject the burnt gases the plan is ingenious and as the machine into which this type of engine is built weighs altogether only about seventy pounds the sport of motorcycling is open to those people whose age or want of strength would preclude them from the use of the heavy mounts which are still to be seen about the roads in the future we may expect to find motorcycles approach very closely to a half hundredweight standard without sacrificing the rigidity needful for fast locomotion over second-class roads for pacemaking on racing tracks motorcycles ranging up to 24 horsepower have been used but these are essentially freak machines of no practical value for ordinary purposes even three to four horsepower cycles have set up wonderful records exceeding 50 miles in the hour a speed equal to that of a good express train in comparison with the feats of motor cars their achievements may not appear very startling but when we consider the small size and weight and the simplicity of the mechanisms which propel cycle and rider at nearly a mile a minute the result seems marvellous enough during the last few years the tricycle has again come into favour but with the arrangement of its wheels altered two steering wheels being placed in front and a single driving wheel behind the main advantage of this inversion is that it permits the fixing of a seat in front of the driver in which a passenger can be comfortably accommodated the modern tricar with its high-powered double-cylindered engines its change speed gears its friction clutch for bringing the engines gradually into action its forced water circulation for cooling the cylinders and its spring-hung frame is in reality more a car than a cycle and escapes from the former category only on account of the number of its wheels to the tourist or to the person who does not find pleasure in solitary riding the tricar offers many advantages and though decidedly more expensive to keep up than a motor bicycle entails only very modest bills in comparison with those which affect many owners of cars the development of the motorcycle has been hastened and fostered by frequent speed and reliability contests in which the nimble little motor has acquitted itself wonderfully a hill a mile long with very steep gradients has been ascended in considerably less than two minutes by a three and a quarter horsepower motor we read of motorcycles travelling from land's end to john o'groats from calcutta to bombay from sydney to melbourne from paris to rome all in phenomenal times considering the physical difficulties of the various routes such tests prove the endurance of the motorcycle and pave the way to its use in more profitable employments volunteer cycling corps often include a motor or two which in active service would be most valuable for scouting purposes especially if powerful enough to tow a light machine gun commercial travellers fitting a box to the front of a tricar are able to scour the country quickly and inexpensively in quest of orders for the firms they represent the police find the motor helpful for patrolling the roads on the continent and especially in germany town and country postmen collect and deliver parcels and letters with the aid of the petrol driven tricycle and thereby save much time while improving the service before long hark tis the twanging horn 
will once again herald the postman's approach in a thousand rural districts but the horn will not hang from the belt of a horseman such as the poet cowper describes but will be secured to the handlebars of a neat tricar thus history repeats itself that the motorcycle is still far from perfect almost goes without saying but every year sees a decided advance in its design and efficiency the messy troublesome accumulator will eventually give way to a neat little dynamo which is driven by the engine and creates current for exploding the cylinder charges as the machine travels when the cycle is at rest there would then be no fear of electricity leaking away through some secret short circuit since the current ceases with the need for it but starts again when its presence is required the proper cooling of the cylinders has been made an easier matter than formerly by the introduction of fans which direct a stream of cold air onto the cylinder head Professor H. L. Callender has shown in a series of experiments that a fan, which absorbs only 2 to 3% of an engine's power, will increase the engine's efficiency immensely when a low gear is being used for hill climbing and the rate of motion through the air has fallen below that requisite to carry off the surplus heat of the motor if an engine maintains a good working temperature when it progresses through space two feet for every explosion it would overheat if the amount of progression were through the medium of a change gear attachment reduced to one foot a change which would be advisable on a steep hill the fan then supplies the deficiency by imitating the natural rush of air as Professor Callender says, the most important point for the motorcyclist is to secure the maximum of power with the minimum of weight. With this object, the first essentials are a variable speed gear of wide range and some efficient method of cooling to prevent overheating at low gears. It is unscientific to double the weight and power of the machine in order to climb a few hills when the same result can be secured with a variable gear it is unnecessary to resort to the weight and complication of water cooling when a light fan will do all that is required thus with the aid of a fan and a gear which will give at least two speeds the motorcyclist can with an engine of two horsepower climb almost any hill even without resorting to the help of the pedals his motion is therefore practically continuous to be comfortable he desires immunity from the vibration which quick movement over any but first-class roads sets up in the machine especially in its forward parts several successful spring forks and pneumatic devices have been invented to combat the vibration bogey and these in conjunction with a spring pillar for the saddle which can itself be made most resilient relieve the rider almost entirely of the jolting which at the end of a long day's ride is apt to induce a feeling of exhaustion the motor tricycle which once had a rather bad name for its rough treatment of the nerves is also now furnished with springs to all wheels and approximates to the car in the smoothness of its progression assuming then that we have motor vehicles so light as to be very manageable sufficiently powerful to climb severe gradients reliable comfortable to ride and economical in their consumption of fuel and oil we are able to foresee that they will modify the conditions of social existence the ordinary pedal driven cycle 
has made it possible for the worker to live much further from his work than formerly tomorrow with a motor bicycle his home may be fifteen miles away and those extra miles will make a great difference in rent and in the health of his family in fact it almost promises to reconcile the garden city ideal with the industrial conditions of today by enabling a man to work in the town and have his home in the country this advantage applies of course less to london than to other great cities on account of the seemingly endless miles of streets to be traversed before the country is reached in most manufacturing centres however the motoring workman could get to his cottage home by a journey of a few miles even in london moreover this disadvantage will be overcome to a large extent in the future for it is as certain as anything of the kind can be that we must ultimately have special highways smooth dustless reserved for motor traffic leading out of london in the principal directions my own conviction is that motorcycling the simplest the quickest the cheapest independent locomotion that has ever been known is destined to enjoy enormous development i believe that within a few years the motor bicycle and tricycle will be sold by hundreds of thousands and that many of the social and industrial conditions of our time will be greatly and beneficially affected by them end of section 11section 12 of the romance of modern mechanism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tina ding the romance of modern mechanism by archibald williams chapter 10 fire engines a good model to blazon over the doors of a fire brigade station would be he gives help toys who gives help quickly the spirit of it is certainly shown by the brave men who as soon as the warning signal comes spring to the engines and in a few minutes are careening at full speed to the scene of operations speed and smartness have for many years past been associated with our fire brigades we read how horses are always kept ready to be led to the engines how their harness is dropped on to them and deft fingers set the buckles right in the twinkling so that almost before an onlooker has time to realize what is happening the sturdy animals are beating the ground with flying hoofs and few dollars in large cities have not heard the cry of the firemen as it rises from an indistinct murmur into a loud shout before which the traffic however dense melts away to the side of the road and leaves a clear passage for the engines driven at high speed and yet with such skill that accidents are of rare occurrence the noise the gleam of the polished helmets the efforts of the noble animals which seem as keen as the men themselves to reach the fire combine to paint a scene which lingers long in the memory but efficient as the horse engine is it has its limitations animal strength and endurance are not an indefinite quantity while the fireman grudges even the few short moments which are occupied by the inspanning of the team in many towns therefore we find the mechanically propelled fire engine coming into favor the power for working the pumps is now given a second duty of turning the driving wheels a parallel can be found in the steam engine used for threshing machines which once had to be told by horses but now travels of itself dragging machine and other vehicles behind it the earlier types of automobile fire engines used the boilers steam to move them over the road liverpool a very enterprising city as regards the extinction of fire has for some time past owned a powerful steamer which can be turned out within a minute of the call 
can travel at any speed up to 30 miles an hour, and can pump 500 gallons per minute continuously. Its success has led to the purchase of other motor engines, some fitted with a chemical apparatus, which by the action of acid on the solution of soda in closed cylinders, is enabled to fling water impregnated with carbonic acid gas onto the fire the moment it arrives within working distance of the conflagration and gives very valuable first aid while the pumping apparatus is being got into order. As might reasonably be expected, the petrol motor has found a fine field for its energies in connection with fire extinction. Since it occupies comparatively little space, more accommodation can be allowed for the firemen and gear. Furthermore, a petrol engine can be started in a few seconds by a turn of a handle whereas a steamer is delayed until steam has been generated. Messrs. Merriweather have built a four-cylindered 30-horsepower petrol fire engine capable of a speed of 40 miles an hour. It has two systems of ignition, the magneto or small dynamo, and the ordinary accumulator and coil, so that electrical breakdowns are not likely to occur. A fast motor of this kind, with a pumping capacity of 300 gallons per minute, is peculiarly suited for large country estates where it can be made to perform household or farm duties when not required for its primary purpose. Considering the great number of country mansions historically interesting and full of artistic treasures which England boasts, it is a matter for regret that such an engine is not always included among the appliances with which each such property is furnished. How often we read old mansion totally destroyed by fire, which usually means that in a few short hours, priceless pictures, furniture, and other objects of art have been destroyed because help, when it did come, arrived too late. Owners are, however, more keenly alive to their responsibilities now than formerly. The small hand-worked engine or the hydrant of moderate pressure is not considered a sufficient guard for the house and its contents. In many establishments, the electric lighting engines are designed to work either the dynamo or a set of pumps, as occasion may demand or the motor is mounted on wheels so that it may be easily dragged by hand to any desired spot. The latest thing in motor fire engines is one which carries a fire escape with it, in addition to water flinging machinery. An engine of this type is to be found in some of the London suburbs. A chemical cylinder lies under the driver's seat where it is well out of the way and coiled beside it is its reel of hose. The escape rests on the top of the vehicle, the wheels hanging over the rear end, while the top projects some distance in front of the steering wheels. The ladder of telescopic design can be extended to 50 feet as soon as it has been lowered to the ground, since the saving of life is even more important than the saving of property it is very desirable that a means of escape should be at hand at the earliest possible moment after an outbreak. This combination of apparatus enables the brigade to nip a fire in the bud, if it is still a comparatively small affair, and also to rescue any people whose exit may have been cut off by the fire having started on or near the staircases. The Hosley Motor Car Company has established a type of chemical motor fire engine which promises to be very successful. A 20 horsepower motor is placed forward under the frame to keep the center of gravity low. When fully laden, it carries a crew of eight men, two nine-foot ladders, two portable chemical extinguishers, a 50-gallon chemical cylinder, and a reel on which is wound a hose 53 yards long. The wheels are a combination of the wooden artillery and the wire spider, wires being strung from the outer end of the hub to the outer ends of the wooden spokes 
to give them increased power to resist the strain of sudden turns or collisions. An artillery wheel not thus reinforced is apt to buckle sideways and snap its spokes when twisted at all. England has always led the way in matters relating to fire extinction and to her is due the credit of first harnessing mechanical motive power to the fire engine. Other countries are following her example, and consequently we find fire apparatus moved by the petrol motor in places so far apart as Cape Town, Valparaiso, Mauritius, Sydney, Berlin, New York, Montreal. There can be no doubt but that in a very few years, Horse traction will be abandoned by the brigades of our large towns. It has been suggested that the fire pump of the future will be driven by electricity drawn from switches on the street mains, enough current being stored in accumulators to move the pump from station to fire. In such a case, it would be possible to use very powerful pumps, as an electric motor is extremely vigorous for its size and weight. Even today, steam fire engines can fling 2,000 gallons per minute, and fire floats, for use on the water, considerably more. Possibly, the engine of tomorrow will pour 5,000 gallons a minute on the flames if it can get that amount from water mains, and so render it unnecessary to summon in a large number of engines to quell a big conflagration. 300,000 gallons an hour ought to check a very considerable blaze. The force with which a jet of water leaves the huge nozzle of a powerful engine is so great that it would seriously injure a spectator at a distance of 50 yards. The kickback of the water on the nozzle is sometimes sufficient to overcome the power of one man to hold the nozzle in position with his hands and it becomes needful to provide supports with pointed ends to stick into ground or hooks which can be attached to the runs of a ladder. For an attack on the upper stories of a house, a special water tower is much used in America. It consists of a latticework iron frame about 25 feet long, inside which slides an extensible iron tube 5 inches in diameter. The tower is attached to one end of a wagon of unusual length and breadth and is raised to a vertical position by a rack gearing with the quadrant built into its base below the trunnions or pivots on which it swings. Carbonic acid gas generated in the cylinder carried on the wagon works as piston connected with the racks and on the tap being turned slowly brings the tower to the perpendicular when it is locked. The telescopic tube carrying the holes inside it is then pulled up by windlasses until the two and a half inch nozzle is nearly 50 feet from the ground. The nozzle itself can be rotated from below by rods and gearing and the angle of the stream regulated by a rope. If several engines simultaneously deliver their water to the tower hoses, 1,000 gallons a minute can be concentrated in a continuous two and a half inch jet onto the fire. The ordinary horsed fire engine is simple in its design and parts. The vertical boiler contains a number of nearly horizontal water tubes, which offer a great surface to the furnace gases so that it may raise steam very quickly. The actual water capacity of the boiler is small, and therefore it must be fed continuously by a special pump. The pumps, two or three in number, usually have piston rods working direct from the steam cylinders on the plungers of the pumps. Between cylinders and pumps are slots in the rods in which rotate cranks connected with one another and with a flywheel which helps to keep the running steady. After leaving the pumps, the water enters a large air vessel which reduces the sudden shocks of delivery by the cushioning effect of the air and causes a steady pressure on the water in the hoses. End of section 12.
Section 13 of The Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 11. Fire Alarms and Automatic Fire Extinguishers. Assuming that a town has a well-appointed fire brigade, equipped with the most up-to-date engines, it still cannot be considered efficiently protected against the ravages of the fire fiend unless the outbreak of a fire can be notified immediately to the stations and local mechanical means of suppression come into action almost simultaneously with the commencement of the conflagration. What you do do quickly is the keynote of successful fire suppression, and its importance has been practically recognized in the invention of hundreds of devices, some of which we will glance at in the following pages. The electric circuit is the most valuable servant that we have to warn us of danger. Dotted about the streets are posts carrying at the top a circular box, which contains a knob. As soon as a fire is observed, anyone may run to such a post, smash the glass screening the knob, and pull out the ladder. This action flashes the alarm to the nearest fire station, and a few minutes later an engine is dashing to the rescue. Help may also be summoned by means of the ordinary telephone exchanges or from police stations in direct telephonic communication with the brigade depots. All devices, depending for their ultimate value on human initiative, leave a good deal to be desired. They presuppose conditions which may be absent. For instance, an electric wire in a large factory ignites some combustible material during the night. A passerby may happen to see flames while the fire is in an early stage. On the other hand, it is equally probable that the conflagration may be well established before the alarm is given, with the result that the fire brigade arrives too late to do much good. What we need, therefore, is a mechanical means of calling attention to the danger automatically, with a quickness which will give the brigade or people close at hand a chance of strangling the monster almost as soon as it is born, and with a precision as to locality that will save the precious time wasted in hunting for the exact point to be attacked. Mr. G. H. Oatway, M.I.E.E., -E, in a valuable paper read before the International Congress of Fire Brigades in London in 1903, says that the difference between the damage resulting from a fire signaled in its early stage and the same fire reported when it has spread to two or three floors is often the difference between a nominal loss and a burnout. The reformer, he continues, who aims at reducing fire waste must turn his attention primarily to hastening the alarm. The true cure of the matter is not what quantity of gear it takes to deal with huge conflagrations, but how to concentrate at the earliest stage upon the outbreaks as they occur and to check them before they have grown beyond control. He cites the fire record of Glasgow of 1902, from which it appears that three fires alone accounted for 40% of the year's total loss, 10 fires for 73%, and the other 706 for only 27%, or an average of 72 pounds per fire. Had the first three fires only been notified at an earlier stage, nearly 72,000 pounds would have been saved. Captain Sir E. M. Shaw, late chief of the London Fire Brigade, has put the following on record. Having devoted a very large portion of the active period of my working life in bringing into general use mechanical and hydraulic appliances for dealing with fires after they have been discovered, I nevertheless give and have always given the highest place to the early discovery and indication of fire, 
and not by any means to the steam, the hydraulic, or the numerous other mechanical appliances on which the principal labors of my life have been bestowed. A fire given 15 minutes start is often hard to overtake. Imagine a warehouse alight on three floors before the alarm is raised. Engines may come one after another and pour deluges of water on the flames, yet, as likely as not, we read next morning of total destruction. No stitch in time has saved nine. The sad part about fires is that they represent so much absolute waste. In commercial transactions, if one party loses, the other gains. Wealth is merely transferred and still remains in the community. But in the matter of fire, this is not the case. Supposing that a huge cotton mill is burnt down, the re erection will, it is true, cause a lot of money to change hands. But what has resulted from the money that has already been put into the mill? Nothing. So many hundred thousands of pounds have been dematerialized and left nothing behind to represent them. The Great Ottawa Fire of a few years ago may be remembered as a terrible example of such total loss of human effort. The History of Fire Alarms the first recorded specification for an automatic detecting device bears the date 1763. In that year, a Mr. John Green patented an arrangement of cords, weights, and pulleys, which, when the cord burnt through, caused the movement of an indicating semaphore arm. As this action appealed only to the eye, it might easily pass unnoticed and we can imagine that Mr. Green did not find a gold mine in his invention. Twenty-four years later, an advance was made when William Stedman introduced a philosophical fire alarm. His apparatus consisted of a pivoted bulb having an open neck and containing mercury, spirit, or other fluid. As the heat of the room increased, the expansion of the fluid caused it to spill over, release a trigger, and allow a mechanical gun to run down. This arrangement, whilst an advance upon the first referred to, is quite impracticable. Evaporation of fluid, expansion of mercury, a stiff crank, or other causes which will readily occur to you, and the thing is useless. In 1806, an automatic method for sprinkling water over a fire appeared. The idea was simplicity itself. A network of water mains with taps controlled by cords which burnt through and turned on the water. William Congreve patented, three years later, a sprinkler which was an improvement in that it indicated the position of the fire in a building by dropping one of a number of weights. But string is not to be relied upon. It may perish or break when no fire is about and any system of extinction depending on it might prove a double-edged weapon. The 19th century produced hundreds of devices for alarming and extinguishing automatically. All depended upon the principle of the expansion or melting of metal in the increased temperature arising from a fire. At one time, the circuit closing thermometer was popular on account of its simplicity. Its drawback, says Mr. Oatway, is the smallness of its heat collecting service, its isolation, and last and worst of all, its fixity of operation. In thermometer or fuse alarm practice, it is usual to place the detectors at intervals of about 10 feet or so, so that a room of any size will contain a number. If a fire breaks out, the ceiling is blanketed with heat, and every detector feels its influence. Each is affected, but none can give the alarm until some one of the number absolutely reaches the set point or melts out. Having no means of varying the composition of the solder or shifting the wire, an actuating point must be selected which is high enough to give a good working margin over the maximum industrial or seasonal heat of the year. And thus it comes about that 
if the fire breaks out in winter or when the room is at its lowest temperature, the amount of loss is considerably and quite unnecessarily increased. In a device set to fuse at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, it will be clear to everyone that the measure of the damage will depend upon the normal temperature of the room at that time of the outbreak. If the mercury is in the 90s, there is only some 60 degrees of a rise to wait for, whilst if it happens to be a winter's night, the alarm is held back for a rise of perhaps 120 degrees. What chance is there in this case for a good stop? Mr. Oatway has examined the fuses under different conditions, and his conclusions are drawn from practical tests. Great intelligence will not be required to appreciate the force of his arguments. Inasmuch as the rise of temperature caused by a fire is relative, during the early stages at least, to the general heat of the atmosphere, it becomes obvious that an automatic fire alarm should be one which will keep parallel, as it were, with fluctuations of natural heat. Thus, if the danger rise be fixed at 100 degrees, the alarm should be given on a cold night as certainly as at midday in summer. It was the failure of early patterns in this respect that led to their being discredited by the fire brigade authorities. The writer already quoted has laid down the functions of a perfect alarm. A. To detect the fire at a uniformly early period under all atmospheric and industrial conditions. B. To give the alarm upon the premises and simultaneously to the brigade by a definite and unmistakable message. C. To facilitate the work of extinction by indicating the position of the outbreak in the building attacked. The May Oatway alarm has got round the first difficulty in a most ingenious manner by adapting the principle of the compensation methods already described in connection with watches. The alarm consists of a steel rod of a section found to be most suitable for the purpose. To the side is attached by screws entering the rod near the ends a copper wire which is long enough to sag slightly at its center, from which depends a silver chain carrying a carbon contact piece. A short distance below the carbon are the two terminals of the electric circuit which, when completed by the lowering of the carbon, gives the alarm. Now, if there be a very gradual change of temperature, the steel rod lengthens slowly, and so does the copper wire, so that the amount of sag remains practically what it was before. But, in the event of a fire, the copper expands much more quickly than the steel and sags until the carbon completes the circuit. The whole thing is beautifully simple, very durable, quite consistent and reliable. As soon as the temperature diminishes on the extinction of the fire, the alarm automatically returns to its normal position, ready for further work. Now for the second function, that of giving the alarm in many places at once, the closed circuit does not itself directly cause bells to ring. It works a relay, that is a second and more powerful circuit. In fact, it is the counterpart of the engine driver who does not himself make the locomotive move, but merely turns on the steam. An installation has been introduced in the Poplar Workhouse, to quote an instance. Were a fire to break out, one of the 276 detectors would soon set 25 bells in action, one in each officer's room. Similarly, in the warehouseman's orphanage at Shittlehume, every dormitory would be aroused and every officer, including the principal in his house some distance away. Messrs. Arthur and Company of Glasgow have a warehouse fortified with 600 of these nerve centers, all yoked to four position indicators, three of which actuate a master indicator connected with the central fire station. 
there is no hole or corner in this huge establishment where the fire demon could essay his fell work without being at once spied upon by a detector. We may glance for a moment at the mechanism which sends an unmistakable message for help. At the brigade station, there is a number of small tablets, each protected by a flap, on the outside of which is the word SAVE, on the inside, FIRE. Normally, the flap is closed. As soon as the circuit is completed, a magnet releases the flap and a bell begins to ring. Now, it is possible that the circuit might be closed accidentally by contact somewhere between the premises it serves and the fire station, so that the official on guard seeing J. Brown and company on the uncovered tablet might dispatch the engines to the place indicated on the wild goose chase. To prevent such farce alarms, the transmitter not only rings the station up, but automatically sends an unmistakable message. When a fire occurs, an automatic printing machine is set in motion to dispatch a cipher in the Morse code four times to the station. An accidental circuit could not do this. Therefore, when the officer sees on the receiving tape the well-known cipher, he turns out his men with all speed. On arriving at their destination, the firemen receive valuable help from the position indicator, which guides them to their work. On the special board is seen a row or rows of shutters similar to those already mentioned. Each row belongs to a floor, each unit of the row to a room. A glance suffices to tell that the trouble is, say, in the most southerly room of the second floor. No notice is therefore taken of smoke rolling out of other parts of the building until the danger spot has been attacked. That the firemen appreciate such an ally goes without saying. Every fire extinguished is a point to their credit. Also, the risks they run are greatly diminished while the wear and tear of tackle is proportionately reduced. The fireman is noted for his courage and unflinching performance of duty. The discomforts of his profession are sometimes severe and its dangers as certain as they are at times appalling. Therefore, we welcome any mechanical method which at once shortens his work, lessens his peril, and protects property from damage. Mr. Oatway draws special attention to the need for simultaneous warning on the premises and at the fire station. I remember, he says, many cases, but perhaps no better illustration need to be looked for than the case of a cotton mill in Lancashire about two years ago, 1901. The fire was seen to start at a few minutes past seven. A fuse blew out and sparked some cotton but it looked such a simple job that the operatives elected to deal with it. At 20 minutes to 8, it dawned upon somebody that the brigade had better be sent for because the fire was getting away, and in due course they arrived, but the mill, already doomed, became a total loss. In every center, similar instances can be quoted. There's nothing in any automatic system to discourage individual effort. Inmates can put the fire out if able, but in any case, the brigades gets timely and definite notice, and if on their arrival they find the fire extinguished, as Chief Superintendent Thomas put it when we opened the dingle station after the fatal train burning, so much the better. We shall get to our beds all the quicker. This is the common sense view of it. Helpers work nonetheless intelligently because they know the brigade is coming, and it is necessary to provide some automatic method of calling them because you can never rely upon anybody who is unfamiliar with fire doing the right thing at the proper time. Messrs. May and Oatway, who give their name to the alarm described above, first introduced their apparatus in New Zealand, from which country it has spread over the British Empire. The largest installation is at Messrs. Clark & Company's Anchor Mills, Paisley. The whole of the immense block of buildings, the greater part of which was previously protected by sprinklers only, 
is now electrically protected also and connected up with a fire brigade and through their station with the sleeping quarters of every fireman. Some figures will be interesting here. There are 119 miles of internal alarm circuits, five and a quarter miles of underground cable between buildings, 19 automatic telegraphs, 21 automatic position indicators, 20 alarm guns a foot in diameter. Early in January 1905, a fire broke out in these buildings during the dinner hour when most of the works firemen were at their midday meal. The alarm sounded simultaneously at the works fire station and at the firemen's houses, which are situated on the other side of the street from the mill. The firemen were on the spot immediately and were enabled to subdue the flames, which had broken out in the building occupied as warehouse and office before it had got a firm hold of the inflammable material, although not before one of the large stacks of finished threads was ablaze. The brigade, however, were soon masters of the situation, and the damage done was under 100 pounds. There is little doubt, had the alarm been left to the ordinary course, the building would have been totally destroyed. In those few minutes, the installation saved its entire cost many times over. Truly, a little fire is quickly trotten out, which, being suffered, rivers cannot quench. Here, in a Shakespearean nutshell, is the whole signs of fire protection. Automatic sprinklers. As these have been referred to several times, a short description may appropriately be given. The building which they protect is fitted with a network of mains and branches ramifying into each room. At the end of each branch is a nozzle, the mouth of which is bridged over by a metal arch carrying a small plate. Between the bridge and the glass plug closing the nozzle is a bar of easily fusible solder. When the temperature has risen to danger point, the solder melts and the plug is driven out by the water, which strikes the plate and scatters in all directions. This device has proved very valuable on many occasions. The Encyclopedia Britannica, 10th edition, states that in the record of the American Associated Factory Mutual Companies for the five and a half years ending January 1st, 1900, it appears that out of 563 fires where sprinklers came into play, 129 were extinguished by one jet. 83 by two jets, 61 by three, 44 by four, 40 by five. The fire bucket is the simplest device we have as a first aid, and very effective it often proves. Insurance statistics show that more fires are put out by pails than by all other appliances put together. The important point to be remembered in connection with them is that they should always be kept full, so that at the critical moment there may be no hurried rushing about to find the two gallons of liquid which each is supposed to contain permanently. In Cassier's magazine, volume 20, page 85, is given an account of the manner in which an ingenious mill superintendent ensured the pails on the premises being ready for duty. The hooks carrying the pails were fitted up with pieces of spring steel strong enough to lift the pail when nearly empty, but not sufficiently so to lift a full pail. Just over each spring, in such a position as to be out of the way of the handle of the pail was such a metal point connected with a wire from an open circuit battery. So long as the pails were full, their weight, when hung on their hooks, kept the springs down. But as soon as one was removed or lost considerable part of its content by evaporation or otherwise, the spring on its hook would rise come into contact with a metal point, thus close the battery circuit and ring a bell in the manager's office, at the same time showing which was the bucket at fault. 
the bell continued to ring till the deficiency had been made right, and by this simple contrivance, the buckets were protected from misuse or lack of attention. End of section 13. Section 14 of the Romance of Modern Mechanism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding. The Romance of Modern Mechanism by Archibald Williams. Chapter 12, The Machinery of a Ship, Part 1. The Reversing Engine, Marine Engine Speed Governors, the steering engine, blowing and ventilating apparatus, pumps, feed heaters, feed water filters, distillers. With many travelers by sea, the first impulse after bunks have been visited and baggage has been safely stored away is to saunter off to the hatches over the engine room and peer down into the shining machinery which forms the heart of the vessel. Some engine is sure to be at work to remind them of the great powers stored down there below and to give a foretaste of what to expect when the engine room gone sounds and the man in charge opens the huge throttle controlling some thousands of horsepower. By craning forward over the edge of the ship, a jet of water may be seen spurting from a hole in the side just above the water line, denoting either that a pump is emptying the bilge or that the condensers are being cooled ready for the work before them. Towards the forecastle, a busy little donkey engine is lifting bunches of luggage off the quay by means of a rope passing over a swinging spar attached to the mast and lowering it into the nether regions where stevedores pack it neatly away. In a small compartment on the upper deck is some mysterious and not very important looking gear, yet as it operates the rudder, it claims a place of honor equaling that of the main engines which turn the screw. To the ordinary passenger, the very existence of much other machinery, the reversing engines, the air pumps, the condensers, the feed heaters, the filters, the evaporators and refrigerators, and the ventilators, is most probably unsuspected. The electric light he would, from his experience of things ashore, vaguely connect with an engine somewhere but the apparatus referred to either works so unobtrusively or is so sequestered from the public eye that one might travel for weeks without even hearing mention of it. On the warship, the amount of machinery is vastly increased. In fact, every war vessel from the first-class battleship to the smallest destroyer is practically a congeries of machines accommodation for human beings taking a very secondary place. Big guns must be trained, fed, and cleaned by machinery, and these processes, simple as they may sound, need most elaborate devices. The difference in respect of mechanism between the King Edward VII and Nelson's victory is as great as that between a motor car and a farmer's cart. It would not be too much to say that the mechanical knowledge of any period is very adequately gauged from its fighting vessels. During the last 20 years, marine engines have been enormously improved, but the advance of auxiliary appliances has been even more marked. In earlier times, the matter considered of primary importance was the propulsion of the vessel and engineers turned their attention to the problem of crowding the greatest possible amount of power into the least possible amount of space. This was effected mainly by the compounding of engines, 
using the steam over and over again in cylinders of increasing size and by improving the design of boilers. As soon as this business had been well forwarded, auxiliary machinery, which, though not absolutely necessary for movement, greatly affected the ease, comfort, and economy of working a ship, got its share of notice, with the result that a tour round the works of a modern battleship or liner is a growing wonder and a liberal education in itself. This chapter will deal with the auxiliaries to be found in large vessels designed for peaceful or warlike uses. Many devices are common to ships of both classes, and some are confined to one type only, though the steel wall certainly has the advantage with regard to multiplicity. We may begin with the reversing engine. All marine engines should be fitted with some apparatus which enables the engineer to reverse them from full speed ahead to full speed astern in a few seconds. The effort required to perform the operation of shifting over the valves is such as to necessitate the help of steam. Therefore, you will find a special device in the engine room which, when the engineer moves a small lever either way from the normal position, lets steam into a cylinder and moves rods reversing the main engine. By a link action, which could not be explained without a special diagram, the valves of the auxiliary will close automatically as soon as the task has been performed, so that there is no constant pressure on the one or the other side of its piston. To prevent the reversing being too sudden, the auxiliary's piston rod is prolonged and fitted to a second piston working in a second cylinder full of glycerin or oil. This piston is pierced with a small hole through which the incompressible liquid passes as the piston moves. Since its passage is gradual, the engines are reversed deliberately enough to protect their valves from any severe strains. These reversing engines can, if the steam serving them fails, be worked by hand. Marine Engine Speed Governors When a ship is passing through a strong sea and pitches as she crosses the waves, the screw is from time to time lifted clear of the water, and the engines, which a moment before had been doing their utmost, suddenly find their load taken off them. The result is raising of the machinery, which makes itself very unpleasantly felt from one end of the ship to the other. Then the screw, revolving at a speed much above the normal, suddenly plunges into the water again and encounters great resistance to its revolution. A series of changes from full to no load, as engineers termed it, must be harmful to any engines even though the evil effects are not shown at once. Great strains are set up which shake bolts loose or may crack the heavy standards in which the cranks and shaft work and even seriously tax the shaft itself and the screw. On land, every stationary engine set to do tasks in which the load varies, which practically means all stationary engines, are fitted with a governor. To cut off the steam directly, a certain rate of revolution is exceeded. These engines are the more easily governed because they carry heavy flywheels which pick up or lose their velocity gradually. A marine engine, on the other hand, has only the screw to steady it, and this is extremely light in proportion to the power which drives it in fact, has scarcely any controlling influence at all as soon as it leaves the water. Marine engineers, therefore, need some mechanical means of restraining their engines from running away. The device must be very sensitive and quick-acting, 
since the engines would increase their rate threefold in a second if left ungoverned when running free, while on the other hand, it must not throttle the steam supply a moment after the work has begun again when the screw takes the water. Many mechanisms have been invented to curb the marine engine. Some have proved fairly successful, others practically useless, and the fact remains that, owing to the greater difficulty of the task, marine governing is not so delicate as that of land engines. A great number of steamships are not fitted with governors for the simple reason that the engineers are skeptical about such devices as a class and would rather not be bothered with them. But whatever may have been its record in the past, the marine governor is at the present time sufficiently developed to form an item in the engine rooms of many of our largest ships. We select as one of the best devices yet produced that known as Andrew's Patent Governor and append a short description. It consists of two main parts, the pumps and the ram closing the throttle. The pumps, two in number, are worked alternately by some moving part of the engine, such as the air pump lever. They inject water through a small pipe into a cylinder, the piston rod of which operates a throttle valve in the main steam supply to the engines. At the bottom of this cylinder is a bypass or artificial leak through which the water flows back to the pumps. The size of the flow through the bypass is controlled by a screw adjustment. We will suppose that the governor is set to permit 100 revolutions a minute. As long as that rate is not exceeded, the bypass will let out as much water as the pumps can inject into the cylinder and the piston is not moved. But as soon as the engines begin to race, the pumps send in an excess, and the piston immediately begins to rise, closing the throttle. As the speed falls, the leak gets the upper hand again, and the piston is pushed down by a powerful spring opening the throttle. It might be supposed that when the screw races, the pumps would not only close the throttle, but also press so hard on it as to cause damage to some part of the apparatus before the speed had fallen again. This is prevented by the presence of a second control valve or leak worked by a connecting rod rising along with the piston rod of the ram. The two rods are held in engagement by a powerful spring which presses them together so that a hollow in the first engages with a projection on the second. Immediately, the pressure increases and the piston rises. The second valve is shut by the lifting of its rod, and so farther augments the pressure in the cylinder and quickens the closing of the throttle valve. This pressure increase must, however, be checked or the piston would overrun and stop the engines. So when the piston has nearly finished its stroke, the connecting rod comes into contact with a stop, which disengages it from the piston rod and allows the second control valve to be fully opened by the spring pulling on its rod. The piston at once sinks to such a position as the pressure allows, and the action is repeated time after time. The governing is practically instantaneous, though without shock, and is set to keep the engine within 3% of the normal rate. That is, if 100 be the proper number of revolutions, it would not be allowed to exceed 103 or drop below 97. Such governing is, in technical language, very close. The idea is very ingenious. 
pumps working against a leak, and as soon as they have mastered it, being aided by a secondary valve, which reduces the size of the leak so as to render the effect of the pumps increasingly rapid until the throttle has been closed. Then the secondary valve is suddenly thrown out of action, gives the leak full play, and causes the throttle to open quickly so that the steam may be cut off only for a moment. By the turning of a small milled screw head a couple of inches in diameter, the pace of 5,000 horsepower engines is as fully regulated as if a powerful brake were applied the moment they exceeded the legal limit. Steering engines. The uninitiated may think that the man on the bridge revolving a spoked wheel with apparently small exertion is directly moving the rudder to port or to starboard as he wishes. But the helm of a large vessel traveling at high speed could not be so easily deflected were not some giant at work down below in obedience to the easy motions of the wheel. Sometimes in the special little cabin on deck, but more often in the engine room, where it can be tended by the staff, there is the steering engine, usually worked by steam power. Two little cylinders turn a warm screw which revolves a warm wheel and a train of cocks, the last of which moves to right or left, a quadrant attached to the chains or cables which work the rudder. All that the steersman has to do with his wheel is to put the engine in forward, backward, or middle gear. The steam being emitted to the cylinders quickly moves the helm to the position required. A particularly ingenious steam gear is that made by Messrs. Hartfield and Company of London. Its chief feature is the arrangement whereby the power to move the rudder into any position remains constant. If you have ever steered a boat, you will remember that when a sudden curve must be made, you have to put far more strength into the tiller than would suffice for a slight change of direction. Now, if a steam engine and gear were so built as to give sufficient pressure on the helm in all positions, it would, if powerful enough to put the ship hard a port, evidently be overpowered for the gentler movements and would waste steam. The Hartfield gear has the last of the cock train, the one which engages with the rack operating the tiller, mounted eccentrically. The rack itself is not part of a circle, but almost flat centrally and sharply bent at the ends. In short, the curve is such that the rack teeth engage with the eccentric cog at all points of the latter's revolution. When the helm is normal, the longest radius of the eccentric is turned towards the rack. In this position, it exerts least power, but least power is then needed. As the helm goes over, the radius of the cox gradually decreases and its leverage proportionately increases so that the engine is taxed uniformly all the time. Some war vessels, including the ill-fated Russian cruiser Varyg, have been fitted with electric steering gear operated by a motor in which the direction of the current can be varied at the will of the helmsman. All power gears are so arranged that in case of a breakdown of the power, a hand wheel can be quickly brought into play. Blowing and Ventilating Apparatus A railway locomotive sends the exhaust steam up the funnel with sufficient force to expel all air from the same end to create a vacuum. 
The only passage for the air flying to fill this empty space lies through the firebox and tubes traversing the boiler from end to end. Were it not for the induced drought, the invention of George Stevenson, no locomotive would be able to draw a train at a higher speed than a few miles an hour. On shipboard, the fresh water used in the boilers is far too precious to be wasted by using it as a fire exciter. Salt water to make good the loss would soon corrode the boilers and cause terrible explosions. Therefore, the necessary drought is created by forcing air through the furnaces instead of by drawing it. The stoke hold is entirely separated from the outer air, except for the ventilators, down which air is forced by centrifugal pumps at considerable pressure. This drought serves two purposes. It lowers the temperature of the stoke hold, which otherwise would be unbearable, and also feeds the fires with plenty of oxygen. The air forced in can escape in one way only, viz. by passing through the furnaces. When the ship is slowed down, the forced drought is turned off, and then you see the poor stokers coming up for a breath of fresh air. In the Red Sea or other tropical latitudes, these grimy but useful men have a very hard time of it. While passengers up above are grumbling at the heat, the stoker below is almost fainting, although clad in nothing but the thinnest of trousers. In the engine room also, things at times become uncomfortably warm. Take the case of the United States monitor, Amphitrite, which went into commission in 1895 for a trial run. Both stoke hold and engine room were very insufficiently ventilated. The vessel started from Hampton Roads for Brunswick, Georgia. The trip of about 500 miles occupied five days in the latter part of July, and for sheer suffering has perhaps seldom been equaled in our naval history. The fire room, stoke hold, Temperature was never below 150 degrees and often above 170 degrees, while the engine room ranged closely about 150 degrees. For the first 24 hours, the men stood it well, but on the second day, seven succumbed to the heat and were put on the sick list, one of them nearly dying. Before the voyage was ended, 28 had been driven to seek medical attendance. The gaps thus created were partially filled with inexperienced men from the deck force until there was only a lifeboat's crew left in each watch. On the evening of the fourth day out, our men had literally fought the fire to a finish and had been vanquished. The watch on duty broke down one by one, and the engines after lumbering along slower and slower, actually stopped for want of steam. At daybreak the next morning, we got underway and steamed at a very conservative rate to our destination, fortunately only about 10 miles distant. The scene in the fire room that morning was not of this earth, and far beyond description. The heat was almost destructive to life. Steam was blowing from many defective joints and water columns, tools, ladders, doors, and all fittings were too hot to touch, and the place was dense with smoke escaping from furnace doors, for there was absolutely no drought. The men collected to build up the fires were the best of those remaining fit for duty, but they were worn out physically, were nervous, apprehensive, and dispirited. Rough Irish firemen who would stand in a fair fight till killed in their tracks were crying like children and begging to be allowed to go on deck 
so completely were they amend by the cruel ordeal they had endured so long. Hell afloat is a nautical figure of speech often idly used, but then we saw it. For a month thereafter, the ship was actively employed on the southern coast, drilling militia at different ports and sweltering in the new dock at Port Royal. One trip of 29 hours broke the record for heat, the fire room being frequently above 180 degrees. All fire room temperatures were taken in the actual spaces where the men had to work, and not from hot corners or overhead pockets. The ventilators were subsequently altered, and the men enjoyed comparative comfort. The words quoted will suffice to establish the importance of a proper current of air where men have to work. One of the greatest difficulties encountered in deep mining is that while the temperature approaches, and sometimes passes that of a stokehold, the task of sending down a cool current from above is, with depths of 4,000 feet and over, a very awkward one to carry out. On passenger ships, the fans ventilating the cabins and saloons are constantly at work, either sucking out foul air or driving in fresh. The principle of the fan is very similar to that of the centrifugal water pump, veins rotating in a case open at the center through which the air enters to be flung by the blades against the sides of the case and driven out of an opening in its circumference. Sometimes an ordinary screw-shaped fan, such as we often see in public buildings, is employed. Pumps Every steamship carries several varieties of pump. First, there are the large pumps generally of a simple type for emptying the bilge or any compartment of the ship which may have sprung a leak. All hands to the pumps is now seldom heard on a steamer for the opening of a steam cock sets machinery in motion which will successfully fight any but a very severe breach. It is needless to say that these pumps form a very important part of a ship's equipment, without which many a fine vessel would have sunk, which has struggled to land. The pumps for the condensers form another class. These are centrifugal force pumps. Their duty is to circulate cold seat water round the nests of tubes through which steam flows after passing through the cylinders. It is thus converted once more into water ready for use again in the boiler. Every atom of the water is evaporated, condensed, and pumped back into the boiler once in a period ranging from 15 minutes to an hour according to the type of boiler and the size of the supply tanks. Some condensers have the cooling water passed through the tubes and the steam circulated round these in an airtight chamber. In any case, the condenser should be so designed as to offer a large amount of cold surface to the hot vapor. A breakdown of the condenser pumps is a serious mishap, since steam would then be wasted, which represents so much fresh water, hard to replace in an open sea. It would be comparable to the disarrangement of the circulating pump on the motor car, though the effects are different. We must not forget the feed pumps for the boilers. On their efficient action depends the safety of the ship and her passengers. Water must be maintained at a certain level in the boiler so that all tubes and other services in direct contact with the furnace gases may be covered. The disastrous explosions we sometimes hear of are often caused by the failure of a pump, the burning of a tube or plate, and the inevitable collapse of the same. The firms of Weir and Worthington are among the best-known makers of the special high-pressure pumps 
used for throwing large quantities of water into the boilers of mercantile and war vessels. Feed heaters. As the fuel supply of a vessel cannot easily be replenished on the high seas, economy in coal consumption is very desirable. If you put a cold spoon into a boiling saucepan, ebullition is checked at once, though only for a moment, while the spoon takes in the temperature of the water. Similarly, if cold water be fed into a boiler, the steam pressure at once falls. Therefore, the hotter the feed water is, the better. The feed heater is the reverse of the condenser. In the latter, cold water is used to cool hot steam. In the former, hot steam to heat cold water. There are many patterns of heaters. One type, largely used, sprays the cold water through a valve into a chamber through which steam is passed from the engines. The spray, falling through the hot vapor, partially condenses it and takes up some of its heat. The surplus steam travels onto the condensers. A float in the lower part of the chamber governs a valve admitting steam to the boiler pumps so that as soon as a certain amount of water has accumulated, the pumps are started and the hot liquid is forced into the boiler. Another type, the Hampson feeder, sends steam through pipes of a wavy form surrounded by the feed water, there being no actual contact between liquid and vapor. An ally of the heater is the feed water filter, which removes suspended matter, which if it entered the boiler, would form a deposit around the tubes, and while decreasing their efficiency, make them more liable to burning. The most dangerous element caught by the filters is fatty matter, oil which has entered the cylinders and being carried off by the exhaust steam. The filter is either high pressure, that is situated between the pump and the boiler, or low pressure, that is between the pump and the reservoir from which it draws its water. The second class must have large areas so as not to throttle the supply unduly. Many kinds of filtering media have been tried, fabrics of silk, calico, coconut fiber, toweling, sawdust, cork dust, charcoal, coke, but the ideal substance, at once cheap, easily obtainable, durable, and completely effective, yet remains to be found. A filter should be so constructed that the filtering substance is very accessible for cleansing or renewal. Distillers. We now come to a part of a ship's plant very necessary for both machines and human beings. Many a time have people been in the position of the ancient mariner who exclaimed, Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Water is so weighty that a ship cannot carry more than a very limited quantity, and that for the immediate needs of her passengers. The boilers, in spite of their condensers, waste a good deal of steam at safety valves through leaking joints and packings and in other ways. This loss must be made good for, as already remarked, Salt water spells the speedy ruin of any boiler it enters. The distiller, in its simplest form, combines a boiler for changing water into vapor with a condenser for reconverting it to liquid. Solids in impure water do not pass off with a steam, so that the latter, if condensed in clean vessels, is fit for drinking or for use in the engine boilers. A pound of steam will, under this system, give a pound of water. But as such procedure would be extravagant of fuel, compound condensers are used, which act in the following manner. 
High pressure steam is passed from the engine boilers into the tubes of an evaporator and converts the salt water surrounding it into steam. The boiler steam then travels into its own condenser or into the feed water heater, while the steam it generated passes into the coils of a second evaporator, converts water there into steam, and itself goes to a condenser. The steam generated in the second evaporator does similar duty in a third evaporator, so that one pound of high pressure steam is directly reconverted to water and also indirectly produces between two and three pounds of fresh water. The condensers used are similar to those already described in connection with the engines and need no further comment. About the evaporators, it may be said that they are so constructed that they can be cleaned out easily as soon as the accumulation of salt and other matter renders the operation necessary. Usually one side is hinged and provided with a number of bolts all around the edges, which are quickly removed and replaced. The United States Navy includes a ship the Iris, whose sole duty is to supply the fleet she attends with plenty of fresh water. She was built in 1885 by Messrs. R. and W. Hawthorne of Newcastle-on-Tyne and measures 310 feet in length, 38 and a half feet beam. For her size, she has remarkable bunker capacity and can accommodate nearly 2,500 tons of coal. Fore and aft are huge storage tanks to hold between them about 170,000 gallons of fresh water. Her stills can produce a maximum of 60,000 gallons a day. It has been reckoned that each ton of water distilled costs only 18 cents, or stated otherwise, that 40 gallons cost one penny. At many ports, fresh water costs three or four times this figure, and even when procured, is of doubtful purity. During the Spanish-American War, the Iris and sister ship, the Rainbow, proved most useful. End of section 14.